Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ready to proceed, Commissioners. Mm. Thank you. Commissioners, the theme to be explored today is the impact on the natural environment by the bushfires in 2019 and 2020 and interagency coordination in responding to the bushfires. Commissioners, as you are aware, the terms of reference set the parameters for this inquiry and they require the Commission to look into amongst other things, the responsibilities of and coordination between the Commonwealth and state governments. More specifically, the terms of reference also direct the Commission to have regard to wildlife management and species conservation, including biodiversity, habitat protection and restoration. It may be convenient to mention at this point that the Commission has received a substantial number of submissions from individuals and organisations addressing matters of concern to them relevant to the natural environment. Several themes have emerged from those submissions. The scale of the impact of the last bushfires on ecological communities, on its biodiversity, on Australia's World Heritage listed sites, and not least, of course, its fauna. Time does not permit us to address all of those matters in great detail, but we are aware of the many concerns that have been expressed. Commissioners, you may be aware that in the response of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency tended yesterday, it was estimated that over 8 million hectares of land was burned, of which approximately 3.7 million, or almost 45%, was nature conservation reserve. The Commonwealth of Australia has a shared responsibility for the management of the natural environment with the states and territories. More specifically, the Commonwealth has responsibilities for matters of national environmental significance under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act, which is collo colloquially known as the EPBC Act. As a result of intergovernmental and bilateral agreements, States and territories have the day-to-day -day management for most matters of national environmental significance within a state or territory. There is a vast array of different state and territory legislation which put in place regulatory arrangements for dealing with the natural environment and matters of national environmental significance. The state or territory legislation is not the subject or focus of today's hearing, and it simply provides relevant context. Today, I and other council assisting will be presenting four special focus studies. Before each of those special focus studies, a brief introduction will be made by council assisting of what is to come. For the purpose of today's hearing, I propose to tender documents listed in the tender list provided by council assisting and commissioners you can find that tender list at tab A of your book. The documents in the tender list include for each witness either a witness statement or an institutional response to one or more notices issued by the commission and other materials such as photos and videos. Commissioners we propose tendering all of the documents in the tender list as a bulk tender in order to save time we seek a direction the documents identified on the tender list, together with the document identification number, be recorded on the transcript as the documents tendered today. Now I have that direction from you, Chair. I so direct. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we propose that a tendered document will be referred to by the exhibit number during the hearing. The first witness to be called this morning is Ms. Emma. K Emma Campbell from the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Ms Campbell will give an overview of the Commonwealth's responsibilities under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act for matters of national environmental significance to give context to the more specific evidence that is to follow later today. I now call uh, Emma Campbell, please. Ms. Campbell, thank you for joining us today. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Mr. Hoakley. Thank you. 
Ms. Campbell, will you take an oath or affirmation? An affirmation. Ms. Campbell, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence that you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do so affirm. Thank you. Now, Ms. Campbell, I understand that the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment has provided two responses. The first is dated the 21st of April 2020, and the second the 22nd of May 2020, in response to notices issued by the Commission. That's correct. And you are able to speak to those responses? Mm. Those are institutional responses. I can speak to certain elements of those responses, as mm. you've outlined earlier today. Thank you. Uh, Commissioners, those documents are Exhibit 3.1.1 and 3.1.2, and those documents can be found behind tab B of your bundle. Uh, Ms Campbell, in giving your evidence today, I will identify a topic upon which I wish to seek your response, and I may have other questions in relation to that topic, but there will be three topics covered today. The first of those topics is, can you outline the present matters for which the Commonwealth has responsibilities under the EPBC Act? Yes, I can. So, um, the, as, you've, as you've outlined, the EPBC Act is a, a central piece of Commonwealth legislation that provides for protection of the environment, and it provides a legal framework to protect matters of national environment significance. It does this by identifying things that are that needed to be protected, listing the key threatening processes for species and communities, environmental communities, man developing management plans for these nationally important things, assessing and improving actions that could significantly impact on these matters of national environment significance, and um, having compliance and enforcement activities for these approval decisions. And the, the Act covers nine matters of national environment significance. Those are threatened species in ecological communities, migratory species, Commonwealth Marine Area, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, the Nas National Heritage, World Heritage, Ramsar wetlands, nuclear actions, and water as it relates to coal seam gas in large coal mines. Uh, those are the things I think that will be of most interest to the Commission, but the Act also provides for the control of international movement and trade of wildlife, um, for example, for zoos, importing animals for zoos. Um, it allows us to create and manage Commonwealth reserves, and there's six terrestrial Commonwealth reserves, um, Uluru, Kakadu and Buderi, three reserves on, on islands, Norfolk, Christmas and Cocos Islands, and then um, 58 marine reserves. And it also allows us to make decisions about actions taken by the Commonwealth or on Commonwealth land or in the Commonwealth marine environment that could significantly impact on any part of the environment. Thank you. I just want to ask you a question, please, about national parks and reserves, first of all, yes. because I understand that there are parks in Australia that are called national parks, but in fact, they are not national parks within the meaning of the Act. Yes, that's correct. The, the Act sets up, sets up the Director of National Parks and the terrestrial parks that are covered by the Act are Kakadu, Uluru and Buderi. Range of states have a range of reserves that are what we call part of our National Reserve System, but they're not covered by the EPBC Act or established under the Act. Thank you. And I think you mentioned there were six of those terrestrial parks. Yes. Kakadu, Uluru, Buderi at Jarvis Bay, and then Norfolk Island, Christmas Island, and Cocos Keeling Island also have parks on them. Thank you very much. I will be coming to some of the matters you have outlined, but before I do so, I want to, to go to another topic now, and we'll come back and tie up all the relevant topics. The second topic I wanted to ask you about is what intergovernmental arrangements are presently in place concerning Commonwealth and state responsibilities for the environment? Yep. So, um, under the Constitution, 
it doesn't mention the environment, and so responsibilities fall to the states. You talked about the intergovernmental agreement and the um, heads of agreement on Commonwealth roles and responsibilities for the environment. Those were made in 1992 and 1997, respectively, and those clarify roles and responsibilities. And um, in summary, these agreements, the states and territories have primary responsibility for most land use planning and environmental protection. Um, and you talked about the numerous um, state frameworks and pieces of legislation that allow them and support them to do that. And then the Commonwealth has a, a, a more narrow set of roles um, focusing on those matters that are nationally significant. And, and the EPBC Act is part of the framework that allows us to meet those responsibilities and um, that allows us to regulate matters of national environment significance. Um, often those matters come out of international agreements and it also allows us to regulate actions taken by the Commonwealth or on Commonwealth land. But we work together with the states to, to implement um, processes under the EPBC Act and state legislation. We do that when we're considering what species need to be protected and how, and each each um, state and territory has their own list, as does the Commonwealth, up until 2015. Well, in 2015, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the states and territories to start to bring those lists together. Um, so that we use common methodology, common terminology, and common processes. Um, up to now, and, and still in some cases now, a species can be listed as vulnerable in one state, ex, um, extinct in another, and endangered in another. So it can be very confusing and not in the best interest of the species. So we've agreed to work together with the same criteria and the same processes. And that's a, that'll be a long process, but it's underway. Similarly, on the approvals and assessment provisions of the Act, we have bilaterals in place with many of the jurisdictions um, so that Different states and territories have their own environmental assessment provisions that are that are similar in many ways to the Commonwealth, but slightly different. And so proponents of actions may have to, um, without cooperation, go through a state process and then go through a Commonwealth process that's slightly different. Um, and so we've agreed to work together and effectively accredit a process in, the st in many states and territories. So if a state assessment is undertaken in that way, then we come together. Um, and the Commonwealth can approve that assessment based on the state process. Yes, I will be asking so you some. Oh, pardon. I will be asking you some questions about some of the matters you've just mentioned uh, a little later. Yep. I, I, do I understand that there are intergovernmental agreements, there are bilateral agreements, and there are also uh, intergovernmental memoranda that deal with matters? Yes. So we have um, an intergovernmental agreement is really the, the framework agreement, which was agreed in 1992, and that sets out broad parameters for dealing with the environment, biodiversity that we're talking about today, but also air quality and standard setting for chemicals, for example. Then um, under the EPBC Act, there's a memorandum um, that is agreeing to work together to, to have common listing. details of their processes under the, their relevant environmental assessment acts. We, uh, we might get Ms Campbell just to repeat that answer, please, since she dropped out for about 15 seconds there. Yes, certainly, Chair. Um, Ms. Ms Campbell, would you be so good as to repeat your answer, please, because there was a slight um, delay in, and we lost a little, okay. little bit of your answer. Mm. Okay. So, Yes, there's there's a number. The intergovernmental agreement of the environment is, is sort of a headline agreement. It was agreed in 1992. It covers biodiversity, but it's also the principles for a range of matters, for example, air quality and chemicals management and how states and territories will work together on those. Then under the EPBC Act, we um, have supporting the EPBC Act, we have a memorandum of understanding about how we can streamline our listing processes and um, work together on those. And then formally under the EPBC Act, there's the EPBC Act provides a provision for bilaterals um, on assessment and approvals of um, the, the environmental assessment processes under the Act. And so we have bilaterals with a number of states that allow us effectively to accredit state assessment processes and adopt those when making decisions under the EPBC Act. Is the, is the consequence of the 
uh, intergovernmental agreements, the bilateral agreements, and the memoranda that you have mentioned, that the states have, and territories have primary responsibility for environmental matters within their jurisdiction, that is the state or territory concerned? Yes. Yeah, the states have the primary responsibility. Um, Commonwealth deals with matters of national environmental significance and where those things overlap, um, the, the bilaterals and the memorandum of understanding help us navigate a way through the overlap. And so the the day-to-day -day responsibility for such matters is dealt with by the state or territory. Hmm. That's correct. Can I ask you now, uh, going to another topic, if you could identify and explain the material features of the processes concerning matters of national environmental significance under the Act? Yes. Um, so, uh, as I flagged earlier, the Act really has four key processes to protect matters of national environment significance. It's determining what those matters are, and, and we use the word listing for that. There's pl a planning framework instituted, then there's the approval and assessment decisions, and then there's compliance. So, if, if it suits you, I could talk to each of those in turn. I would be grateful. Uh, so, so if we talk about the listing process, this is really the process to identify matters of national environment um, significant protected by the Act. Um, they're slightly different for um, different matters of national environment significance. For threatened species, um, the process is really based on a scientific assessment of the status of the species using international criteria established by the International Union on the Conservation of Nature and reflected in the APBC Act and the regulations. And it really looks at considering changes to habitat distribution or species numbers. Um, we have over 1,800 listed threatened species, and they're listed as either vulnerable, for example, the koalas in New South Wales and Queensland and ACT, endangered, the eastern bristlebird, or critically endangered, the woolamai pine, or extinct, such as the br bramble K. melamy. So the process um, for threatened species, which is similar for other processes, is a public nomination. So we're, we call for people um, to put forward their suggestions. These nominations are considered and prioritized by the Threatened Species Scientific Committee, and they look at data available, level of imperilment, and capacity within the committee. They provide advice to the minister who ultimately decides on what the priority list for threat assessment is. Then there's a quite a significant process to gather the science, consult with states and territories, but also stakeholders and scientists on, on the level of threat and the threat assessment and how the species meets the criteria. Um, the Threatened Species Scientific Committee um, consolidates that advice and provides that advice to the minister and the minister ultimately makes a decision. It's very similar with ecological communities. There's slight differences, but I don't think they're material. And with national and Commonwealth heritage, the process is broadly the same, except for instead of the Threatened Species Scientific Committee, the Act establishes the, uh, the Australian Heritage Council, which is a group of heritage experts who are the experts advising the minister and the department through that process. And the criteria for heritage listing are natural, historic and indigenous um, outstanding heritage values. In, in the process for listing... I'm sorry, beg your pardon. Sorry, keep going. I interrupted you, I beg pardon. I was going to move on to heritage and Ramsar, which are a bit different as well. Um, and these processes are really for Ramsar, World Heritage and Migratory Species, effectively the EPBC Act adopts international lists. And, and so um, the processes are set by the Ramsar Convention, the World Heritage Convention, or the Convention on Migratory Species, or bilaterals for some of the migratory birds. And those, once those conventions adopt a species that's relevant for Australia, those species are therefore protected under the EPBC Act. Um, and once something becomes on the list, then it becomes a matter of national environment significance and that triggers the planning framework provisions and the approval and assessment provisions under the Act. Thank you, Ms Campbell. Just before we get to the, the planning and assessment provisions, could I ask you whether in um, dealing with the listings, for example, endangered species or ecological communities, 
um, where the regard is had to natural hazards such as bushfires and the like? To a certain extent, um, when we're looking at whether a species, for example, should be listed, we look at the range of threats. So um, fire is listed as a, as a threat on many of the, the species, including um, the Woolamai pine, the eastern bristlebird, and the sphagnum box, bogs and fens ecological community specifically list changed fire regimes and fire as a threat for those species. Um, similarly, uh, in some cases, or at least one case, floods are listed as a, a potential threat for a snail species. So if, if natural disasters are impacting on the, the status and likelihood of that species, they're, they're noted in the do documentation. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Now you're going to go move on to plans, if you could deal with that topic. Yes. Mm. So the EPBC Act provides the planning framework for matters of national environment significance, for, and, and those plans set out the protection, conservation, and management for some of the matters. Um, again, a bit like the listing process, they're, they're slightly different for mas different matters, but I'll talk through, if it's okay with you, the process for threatened species and ecological communities as an example. Um, so the Act requires that for each species, listed species and ecological community, there be uh, what's called a recovery plan or a conservation advice in place. And those documents aim to guide the long-term recovery of the species and provide advice on the research and management actions needed to recover the species. Both of those documents draw on science information and advice from the Threatened, Science, the Threatened Species Scientific Committee. Um, we work with states and territories, including um, to implement the Memorandum of Understanding to have similar listing processes, and we consult with stakeholders in developing these plans, and ultimately the, the minister or his or her delegate make a decision to adopt those plans. Once those plans are adopted, they have regulatory effect and are a formal part of the decision making for assessment approvals under the Act. For example, the Minister must have regard to an approved conservation advice um, when making an approval decision under the Act. Thank you. Similarly, for other species, the planning process is, is similar, relying on experts, um, consultation and ultimately a Minister's decision and ultimately having man um, regulatory effect in the approvals part of the Act. Mm. You, you mentioned what that of the plans, one was the species recovery and conservation, is that correct? There's either a recovery plan or a conservation advice and, and that's based on effectively how complex the species is to, man to manage and, and how much um, consultation and, and rigour is needed in the, in the planning for that species. And are, are there also threat abatement plans? Yes. So in a different part of the Act, um, it does go to threats. So there's a number of threats that, you know, threaten our native plants and animals, and the Act provides to list these as a key threatening process under the Act. Um, things are listed as or could be listed as a key threatening process if they could cause a species or a community to become um, endangered or threatened or to become more threatened or endangered. Examples of key threatening processes that have been adopted under the Act are competition and deg degradation by rabbits and the loss of climatic habitat caused by anthropogenic emissions from greenhouse gases. Fire, there's fire regimes that cause biodiversity decline has been nominated as a key threatening process under the Act and um, following the, the recent fire season, the Minister and the Threatened Species Scientific Committee have agreed to prioritise looking at that and, and seeing if that um, deserves to be uh, a listed uh, key threatening process. Once a, a threatening process is, is made, the Minister must decide whether it needs a uh, what's called a threat abatement plan under the Act. Um, and really the, the decision to make a threat abatement plan is, is such a plan under the Act, does it provide a feasible, effective and efficient method of reducing that threat? Um, if the Minister agrees and a threat is, a threat abatement plan is, is developed, 
it's um, developed a bit like the, the species recovery plan with scientific input, uh, consultation and ultimately a minister's decision. And once a threat abatement plan is made, the minister must consider those when making the assessment and approvals under the Act. Um, rabbits is one of the examples of a key threatening process that has a threat abatement plan in place. Thank you. So I understand that the, in terms of the structure of the matter that we're approaching today, we've dealt with listings and plans. The, there are, yes. the third part is assessments. Yes. So um, the Act provides for the Minister to assess and approve an action that have, will have, or is likely to have a significant impact on one of the protected matters. And those protected matters are the matters of national environment significance, but also those um, actions that relate to the Commonwealth. A person proposing to take an action that they consider must, oh, sorry, has, will have, or is likely to have a significant impact on a matter um, must refer that proposal to the Commonwealth for a decision. Um, the onus is on the person proposing the action, but the minister does have the power to call in an action if someone does not put it forward. The minister considers, um, if the minister considers that the action would have such an impact on a matter of national environment significance, um, they, can they can decide that it goes into the next phase. It's a controlled action and it triggers approval and assessment provisions under the Act. So there's a range of different assessment methods under the Act which go to how complex um, the matter is, the scale and magnitude of the potential impact and, and the pub level of public interest. So the minister decides those and the proponent and the department work through, through that assessment process. Then following that assessment process, the minister must make a decision on whether to approve an action or not. And he or she can approve an action with conditions that require developers, for example, to undertake certain actions, which could include, for example, offsets. Um, and to make a lawful decision, the minister must comply with the, the terms of the Act, which, again, going back to the planning documentation, um, includes having regard to relevant planning documentations. And then following the approval of a project, there's commonly an ongoing role for the Minister and the Department in relation to monitoring and compliance with the com approval conditions set upon that. There are a few exemptions to assessments and approvals. Um, actions that had prior authorization before the EPBC Act came into effect or are continuing, continuing use are, are allowed to continue. Forestry operations undertaken in accordance with a regional forest agreement are exempt from the approval and assessment provisions of the Act. And there is a power to exempt actions for all or some of the EPBC Act assessment and approval processes if it's in the national interest. And um, this is under Section 158. And in January, the Minister gave exemptions to Victoria, South Australia and WA in relation to the taking of firefighting activities, fire prevention activities and fire recovery activities in response to fires in the 1920 season. And the aim of that was to protect life, property or matters of national environment significance. And my understanding is that Victorian government used that um, uh, exemption when they went into East Gippsland to remove some of the surviving eastern bristlebirds in which are endangered and, and brought them into captive breeding until it was safe to re-release them. Thank you. I'd like to ask you please some questions about strategic assessments. Yes. And, and in particular, so, whether you could give us an example of where in a strategic assessment the um, a fire, fire management plan, for example, is taken into account. So, yes, a strategic assessment is another way to provide approvals under the EPBC Act, and it looks at how a group of activities will affect matters of national environment significance on a regional scale. And by looking at cumulative impacts on the environment and the compounding impacts of threats such as climate change um, over the whole landscape before projects begin, we can get some really good outcomes and also give greater certainty for business and developers. So the process really is um, there's a strategic assessment of the impacts of actions under uh, a policy plan or program. And normally state governments are the, are the proponent, so it's their policy plan or program. The minister considers and, if appropriate, endorses that policy plan or program. Then the minister can approve actions undertaken in accordance um, with 
the plan or program. And then once a strategic assessment is complete, project by project approval is not required if actions are consistent with the, with the processes I've just outlined. Um, so they're really useful for complex, large scale or ongoing activities, for example, major ur urban growth and development. South Australia um, did apply and, and does have a strategic assessment of its regional fire management policy, which effectively allows the South Australian government to um, have confidence that they, when they're doing their fire management activities, um, they have EPPC Act approval and any significant impacts that might occur on matters of national environment significance are avoided and, and allowed under the Act. And is, is South Australia the only example, or is that just one example? Hmm. South Australia is the only example, okay. to my knowledge, with a with a fire management um, activity. One of the reasons that may be is, is some of the fire management activities, if they were ongoing and, and nothing effectively has changed in the way a state does it, it may be exempt because it's a pre-existing approval or some of the fire management activities might be in a regional forest agreement area and so might be exempt. So South Australia, um, I think, looked, my understanding, and again, it was before my time, um, wanted to just have that legal certainty on, on their new fire management um, regime that they were implementing across the state. So, Mr Tokley, can we just explore that, and Ms Campbell, just a little bit more? How, with South Australia, since that's the only state you just mentioned there, how does that actually translate into action there, just for the, the lay, lay person, that exemption? So, um, my understanding, and, it, and it's not my direct area of expertise um, is that South Australia put forward its fire management plan, it went through the process, and as long as, and, and the minister at the time um, agreed that if action was undertaken in the way that was approved, there wouldn't um, be a need for further assessment or project by project approval. And so South Australia is doing its fire management, as far as I know, in accordance with that plan, and so it's effectively exempt under the Act or exempt from further assessment under the Act. Okay, thanks. What, what we will do like, as a part of the ongoing hearings when we talk with South Australia, we'll try and get a little bit more around that and how that helps them uh, in uh, their actions for, for natural disaster, in particular the bushfires that, that we're looking at. But please continue. I've got a couple other questions, but I'll wait, <laughs> wait till the end. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms Campbell, the, the, the matters that the Chair raised with you really illustrate the way in which the primary responsibility for matters of national environmental significance with the Commonwealth, those, the primary responsibility and the day-to-day -day responsibility uh, lies with the states and territories that, are, that have those matters of national significance within their jurisdiction. That's correct. And, and again, when um, organisations or people or states are proposing an action, the onus is on them to consider what whether it would trigger the Act and, and should be referred and to the EPPC Act. Thank you. So now in dealing with assessments, have you covered then both strategic and environmental assessments? Yes. Thank you. And the fourth topic you were going to mention was compliance. Mm. Which, I, which I've covered in a, at a high level. The Act provides for the Minister ongoing compliance and enforcement on the condition or any conditions or, or how actions are being undertaken in accordance with the Act, well, in accordance with the decisions made under the Act. Thank you, Ms Kimball. And one final question, if I may. Um, do you know when the um, impact from bushfires was nominated in relation to th uh, this this? Sorry, the threatening process, the listing threatening process? Yeah, it, it, it was changed fire regimes, which includes um, changes to traditional, eco, traditional burning, for example, not just natural hazards. And that was first nominated in 2007. So it was nominated quite some time ago. Thank you very much, Ms Campbell. And Commissioners, I have no further questions for this witness. Um, so if, what I'd um, like to do is highlight um, as we work with uh, the states and uh, other agencies uh, and look further into the hearings, we do need to look a bit at how the intergovernmental agreements, framework strategies, MOUs, acts and all that translate uh, into action and associated funding. Uh, we won't go into that today because we're looking at an overview 
to, today, but we will need to, to do that and work how that then coordinates across the states. We will look at a little bit more about the the current actions to go towards common classifications and the and the like to, to look to simplify that. One question I do have, if you, we just went back just a little bit, you were talking about bushfire being recognised as a threat and that isn't currently the case in a particular or a specific uh, area that you were, were talking about. Um, are we looking at that or uh, or not? So I think your question is about whether fire is a key threatening process That's and right. how yeah. it impacts. So fire isn't listed as a key threatening process under the Act and, and, and the Threatened Species Scientific Committee and the Minister have agreed to look at that and see if it should be and, and the Threatened Species Scientific Committee is meeting about um, is meeting this week um, and, and next week and we'll, we'll specifically consider that um, process. However, fire is listed as a, as a threat or, or noted as a threat, listed probably has a different meaning, um, in a number of specific species um, nominations on the list and in their conservation advices and recovery plans. So Willamite Pine, for example, notes the risk of fire um, for that individual species. Oh, thank and you similarly, that. World, yeah. Yeah, similarly uh, World Heritage. Yeah. yeah, no, because we noted in uh, some of the evidence that was provided there were specific areas that, that had been factored in, so I was just trying to clarify uh, okay. that. Yep. Thank you for that. Commissioner Bennett? Um, yes, I, I'd just like to get an idea of some of the matters in a broader context that you've listed, and if you, if you can help me here. I mean, um, first, just picking up on the thing, I mean, the, the, in the notice, you know, and you mentioned the listing of World Heritage properties. Okay, so you've got World Heritage listings, that's Commonwealth, primary Commonwealth responsibility. Uh, but my understanding is that you were saying that, it's the, that if there is a, it's like a fire management plan, it's up to the states to um, manage the protection of that World Heritage space. Is that right? Would we put forward a World Heritage nomination? We do so in conjunction with the states. Yeah, but once it's, and, once, and it's got, state, once it's got World Heritage the listed. State, yes, Sorry. It, it, the state is still the primary land manager, but again, we work with the states um, and do that cooperatively, but they're the ones doing the fire management, doing the weed management day to day. And the, um, and do what do they report to the report to to your department about what they're doing and what plans they have in place? We we work with them on on reports and on risk management, and often um, many of those go to the World Heritage Committee. For example, um, the World Heritage Committee asked for a state of the conservation report on both the Gondwana and um, the Greater Blue Mountains after the fires, and we worked very closely with the relevant states to pull that information together and submit that to the committee, the World Heritage Committee. Okay, I think I understand that. You also made a comment about how the states, back on the question, the states have primary responsibility, um, and, and so as I understand it, even for matters that have been listed as being of national significance. What happens, do you know what happens if there's something that has national significance? That, and it crosses borders, state borders. What happens in that situation? The different states take so responsibility again, for the bits in their state, or does the Commonwealth come in at that point? The different states take responsibility, and, and when I talked about the common assessment method for the listing, that's part of the reason we have really just some, some disjointed listing processes. Um, so the, com the states take individual responsibility, but we work cooperatively with the states on planning frameworks, and so that's a really helpful way to bring it together. For example, we've been doing a lot of work with New South Wales and Queensland recently on, on a on a recovery plan for koalas that meets the needs of both states and brings it together into a coherent whole. So is it that the Commonwealth can get involved in a planning process or, the, or setting up a framework that it's up to the states to implement that within their own jurisdictions? Is that the case? Yes. Okay. One yes, more. That's the case. Just to try and understand some of the status of characterisations and information and listings. Um, uh, I think you mentioned at one stage a 1992 agreement. You've mentioned at another point a 2015, um, uh, whatever it was. But um, Memorandum. Memorandum, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm just trying to have an understanding of just immediately, let's say, prior to the bushfires and any learnings that you've had on characterisations and information, um, uh, the need for sta more standardisation since the bushfires and then what's happening uh, with regard to that. 
So, in other words, where the information was just prior to the bushfires, did you see any um, any particular issues arising in this question of, of common description, common listings, and what's happening now, if anything? So, yes, uh, we've known that um, inconsistent data, taxonomy, descriptions, um, haven't been helpful, and that's part of the reason why there's an MOU. Uh, and so we've been working on that for some time. Uh, the bushfires, because of the um, the urgency of some of the action, I think there were some real strengths in that we had good relations with the relationships with states and territories and could work together, but the frameworks underpinning some of that work weren't in place. For example, um, it was harder than it should have been to, to actually get a map of where the fire fire scar was because everyone was working on different systems, for example. Um, and when we're work looking at where species are, um, it worked well, I think, because we worked with states and territories. This is what we understand. No, this is what we understand. And there was conversation. But again, that probably was more based on um, knowledge and workshops rather than systematic information. So has uh, is there now a, a um, more, a more intense or active process in place with regard to attempts to standardise things a bit more? Or is, it just, or is it just con it, continuous? I think it's probably continuous with different areas of focus. For example, the fire, the fire scar mapping wasn't necessarily, I think it's, as far as I know, wasn't necessarily high on the radar and, and now it is and, and that's appropriate. But in terms of species mapping and bringing species together, that's uh, a continuum uh, which continues actively yes yes very actively um, there's there's a funding going into it um, there's working with states and territories and some of those are outlined in our notice um, to give thank you very much thanks for that just before I hand to Commissioner McIntosh just to, to, to take that you know, talk about going on for some time so what have been the barriers to date that have caused this to go on for some some time? Uh, and are you seeing those changing as a result of what happened in the 2019-2020 bushfire season? So in terms of some of the barriers, if we think about the listing process as an example, different legislation with different rules and different processes was was a significant barrier. There's a long there's a long legacy. So while the MOU was signed in 2015, um, it can often take a year or so to get the scientific evidence together to 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 change a species listing or to make decisions under the Act. We have 2,000 species, well 1,800 listed threatened species at the Commonwealth. Victoria has 2,000 species listed under its legislation. Um, they're probably different 2,000 species in many instances, so that's just a long legacy to get that back on track. Um, so that's one of the barriers. And then um, investment in data, and that's certainly um, been expedited probably over the last two years, data and systems. Um, the, the bushfires, I think, for me, has been um, a huge amount of goodwill and support with the states and territories, but also with um, non-government organisations. And um, it's um, I'm hopeful that that will continue, although it's early days. So, um, But it certainly has been great cooperation in getting that data together. Thank you. Appreciate that. Commissioner McIntosh. Uh, morning, Ms Campbell. Thanks for joining us and thanks for your evidence. Um, I just want to take you to your statement of, or the department's statement of 21 April, that is uh, AWE 5010010016. Hopefully you see yes. what I see. I've got that one. Fantastic. Um, there you, you describe some of the, uh, the initiatives that the department is taking in the wake of the event, particularly around improving the collection of fire extent data and uh, the improvement of your processes around fire severity. Uh, I wondered whether you could just give a bit more colour. I know you've been talking to it now about the, the, the nature of the difficulties you encountered, and I'm particularly interested in um, whether Department of Ag is taking the lead on this or whether it's Geoscience or CSIRO or any other body. 
This isn't my specific area of expertise, but the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment is taking the, taking the lead and has produced the fire, um, the fire maps for the Commonwealth. Okay, thank you. I think we might come back to that a bit later, but that's useful information. Yep. Thank yep. you. Sorry, I just have one more, if I may. Back on the um, the concept of the World Heritage Properties. Um, at, in the initial one, which is AWE 501-001-003, um, uh, there was a listing, for example, of um, World Heritage Properties and National Heritage Places and, you know, a very broad summary of what happened, uh, what percentages of them were affected by the recent bushfires. You know, you've got um, yep. the Bujbim Cultural Landscape, Fraser Island, Gondwana, Greater Blue Mountains, etc. I guess I just yep. wanted to have an understanding of whether or not you're aware of whether there were any specific um, fire management plans in place or arrangements in place with regard to those specific World Heritage, World Heritage properties um, as a general proposition um, uh, prior to the 2019-20 bushfires. As a, as a general proposition, um, my understanding is yes, but I, but I don't have that level of detail. To the individual. That's fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And Commissioner McIntosh has one more question on the broader environment. Sorry, Sorry Ms Campbell. I just wondered, um, were recovery plans a useful source of information in, uh, in preparing your response to the disasters and trying to assess the impacts on threatened species and, and threatened ecological communities? Yes, in many instances. So when we were working to look at um, the impacts of species, we looked at the species that were overlapped with the fire scar and then the characteristics. And those those recovery plans and conservation advices are, are part of that key key document, especially for the ones that are, are more recent. Um, some of them are, are, are relatively out of date. And so um, those ones, we draw more on experts, but, but many, especially of the newer ones, are, are very useful. And is it similar in relation to conservation advices? Yes, yep, um, similar. Nothing more from me, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Mr Tokley, do we have any more for Ms Campbell? No, no, no Commissioners, no okay. Chair. Um, if Ms Campbell could be excused from attendance. Yes, Ms Campbell, we, we have a lot more questions out of all this uh, in, a, in a more detailed sense for the, the next block of hearings, but the overview provided was has given us a very good understanding uh, of where the Commonwealth sits and the, and the issues, I think, uh, of enacting uh, those acts, memorandums, agreements, framework strategies and down and sort of flowing it across the, uh, the, the, the various states. I thought military operations were complex, but uh, thank, thank you very much for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Our next witness is the Threatened Species Commissioner, and Ms Ampercathy of Council will be examining the next witness. Mm. Thank you. I call Dr Sally Box. There might be a short pause. Dr Box, thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate it very much. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Dr Box, will you take an oath or an affirmation? An affirmation. <clears throat> Dr Box, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do so affirm. Thank you. Dr Brooks, you provided a witness statement dated 22 May 2020 under a notice issued by the Commission. I did. Commissioners, this document is Exhibit 3.2.1 and it's behind tab C1 of your bundle. We have it, thank you. Dr Box, do you adopt this statement as true and correct? I do. Dr Box, I will start with a little bit of your background and your qualifications. You have a PhD in plant sciences from the ANU. That's correct. And you are currently the Commonwealth Threatened Species Commissioner. That's right. And you were appointed in 2018. That's right. I commenced in the role in January 2018. And that role sits within the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. 
That's right. It's a senior executive officer band one role within that department. And you report to Ms Emma Campbell, the first assistant secretary of the Biodiversity Conservation Group. I do. Thank you. Dr Box, are you able to give the commissioners an overview of Australia's natural environment in terms of species distribution and share of global biodiversity? Australia is uh, one of 17 mega diverse countries with globally distinct levels of biodiversity and, and significantly more unique species than most other countries. Uh, we possess more than 80 globally unique families of plants and animals, and these species have a very high degree of endemism, so they're only found in Australia. Uh, there's still much basic biodiversity discovery work to be undertaken in Australia. Only around 30% uh, of Australia's approximately 620,000 species that are estimated to occur in Australia have been discovered and named. So we are a country that's very rich in biodiversity and we have a lot of unique plants and animals. And so prior to the 2019 and the 2020 bushfire season, were there any trends in relation to species numbers in Australia? Yes, well, I'll refer to the um, 2016 State of the Environment Report, which stated that based on the information available about vegetation extent and condition, and the small number of species for which there's some understanding of trends in distribution and abundance, the status of biodiversity in Australia is generally considered poor and worsening. Are you able to just provide a little bit more detail when you say poor and worsening? What and just explain that to the commissioners. So we, are, we have um, approximately 1,800 uh, species that are at risk of extinction that are listed nationally as threatened under the EPBC Act. Um, that list does, does continue to grow. So we are seeing um, an increasing number of species on our threatened species list and um, you know, declining trends for many of our threatened species. Our threatened species are I guess subject to a range of pressures. Um, the main threats to biodiversity are uh, clearing, fragmentation and degradation of habitat, uh, the impact of invasive species, uh, climate change, uh, changes in fire regimes, uh, grazing pressure and, and changes in hydrology. And, and many of our species, I guess, suffer from the cumulative impacts of, of multiple threats and pressures. Can I just ask one question here? Because I just want to put that in perspective. How does that compare globally out of interest, uh, rather than just on it specifically on its own in Australia. I just want to get a perspective of it, please. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have details of, of different countries in, in front of me, but I guess as an example, um, according to the IUCN, um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, um, Australia has the fourth highest rate of animal extinction globally. Thank you for that. Sorry, just one. Um, uh, just to understand that in perspective, um, I'm just trying, I don't know if you take it the fourth highest rate of extinction, is that also, though, when you look at it mathematically or something, relative to the very diversity that we have? I mean, if you have a country that does not have the similar sort of diversity, then they won't have the same percentages or num absolute numbers um, tending to go to extinction. Can you put that in perspective for me? Yes, I, I mean, I think that that probably depends on a number of factors. It, it, it would, obviously, it's related to our species richness. We have a, a huge diversity in Australia. Um, it also, uh, I guess, factors in, um, you know, the time frame over which we've been collecting this sort of information and probably the fact that Australia's also experienced a high degree of change in the last 200 years since European settlement. So I imagine there are a number of confounding factors that contribute to that. Um, but there is biodiversity decline globally. Australia is not unique in that sense. Thank you very much. So, Dr Box, I might, if the commissioners have no further question, I might turn to the next topic. Dr Box, I, if we could move to your involvement in the 2019-2020 uh, bushfires. As threatened species commissioners, Commissioner, did you have any role in either mitigation response or recovery? So, uh, 
As Threatened Species Commissioner, I've really had two roles in relation to the 2019-20 bushfires. Firstly, as Chair of the Wildlife and Threatened Species Bushfire Recovery Expert Panel, which was established in January 2020 to provide advice to the Australian Government on the impacts of the bushfires on animals and plants and ecological communities and other natural assets, and also to provide advice on the species requiring intervention and the recovery actions needed. My second role has been as a member of the department's senior leadership team, providing advice to government on the bushfire impacts and response. In both my roles, in both of those roles, my involvement's been in the response and recovery phase post bushfires, particularly as it relates to the assessment of impacts on it and recovery of species and ecological communities following the fires. We will expand on that particular topic uh, later in your evidence. Or but if I could now just turn to the topic of the impact of the 2019 and 2020 bushfires, could you tell the commissioners, give them a sense of what the impact was on the wildlife in Australia? Certainly. So, so my assessment of the extent of impacts of the 2019-20 bushfires on flora and fauna and, and including threatened species is really informed by the assessments undertaken by that expert panel um, and the department in collaboration with a range of species experts and, and state and territory government agencies. So the impact of the 2019-20 bushfires on threatened species and other flora and fauna has been severe. Uh, the expert panel in their communique of 15th of January, which is at Annexure A to my witness statement, described the bushfires as a, an ecological disaster. The fires covered an unusually large area and in many places they burnt with an unusually high intensity. As I mentioned earlier, there are currently approximately 1,800 species listed as threatened under the EPBC Act and more than 300 of these nationally listed threatened species were in the path of the fire. So they had more than 10% of their known or likely distribution within the fire extent. The entire known range of some species was burnt. Of the 327 species in the path of the fire, 49 threatened species had more than 80% of their known or likely range within the fire extent. And a further 65 threatened species had more than 50% of their known or likely range within the fire extent. And this includes plants and mammals and birds and frogs and reptiles and, and fish and invertebrates. So for some species that were considered threatened before the fires, the fires have now likely increased their risk of extinction. But there are also many other fire affected species that were considered secure before the fires, but who've now lost much of their habitat and might be imperiled. Um, there's an illustrative example um, at Dr. a map that Annex should do. Dr. Box, yes. if I could, I apologise for interrupting. If I could just ask one follow on question, and that is do you have any indication of how many additional species may now be threatened or endangered in that category that you said that they were secure, but now as a result of the bushfires, they may be, their status may change? Uh, I don't have a number. That's something that the Threatened Species Scientific Committee is looking at at the moment. They're taking the assessments that the experts panel has done on these um, species that aren't currently listed as threatened and looking at whether they are a candidates for assessment for uh, listing under the EPBC Act. So I can't put a number in that at the moment. But if you um, consider the expert panel's assessment, which considered both threatened species and non-threatened species across a range of taxa, so far, they've identified more than 750 taxa that are in need of urgent management intervention. Now, some of those are already listed as, as threatened, but some aren't. So I anticipate that there are a, a large number of species that will be considered for assess for listing under the EPBC Act, but, but I don't have a, an exact number to put on that right now. I, I think by the numbers you just gave us, we're, are you, we're talking in the scale of hundreds? Quite possibly. Again, um, there are quite specific criteria that the Threatened Species Scientific Committee look at when they're making a decision about whether a species um, is eligible for listing. So they'd really need to look against those criteria. But there certainly are hundreds that have been impacted by the fires and need, need help. And I think before I interrupted you, Dr Box, you were intending to provide an illustrative example of um, some of the destruction that was um, that occurred during the 2019 and 2020 bushfires. 
Uh, so there's a, a map at uh, Annex D to my witness statement, which so is at Kangaroo Island. If Dr. Box, if I can just give a that is Exhibit 3.2.1.4. That's at Tab 4 of the document bundle, and that is Document ID DSB 5010010085 at 86. Please That's go one. Ahead. So um, you can see on Kangaroo Island there um, the dark pink. Um, Sorry, I beg your pardon, Dr. Fox. No, that's uh, not in the tab. No, it's got, tab oh, it's five. up here. Okay, I'll just look at it on the screen. Thanks. Yeah. So this is a map of Kangaroo Island. On the west of the island, there you can see a dark pink patch, and that's the known or likely distribution of the Kangaroo Island dunart. This is a native marsupial. It's endemic to Kangaroo Island. It's listed as endangered under the EPBC Act. Um, so that, that dark pink area shows where it's known or likely to occur, and that black hatched area shows um, the fire extent based on the National Indicative Aggregated Fire Extent data set. So you can see that more than 90% of the known or likely range of that Kangaroo Island Dunart was estimated to be within the fire extent. Uh, this species shelters in the skirts of, of grass trees. It's got a poor ability to flee fire, so likely suffered from high fire mortality. And it's now subject to post-fire predation from feral cats having lost that protective vegetation cover. So this is an example of a species that was already listed as endangered and is now that much closer to extinction as a result of these extensive fires on Kangaroo Island. And in following the assessment and prioritisation, are you aware of what action is now being taken in relation to this particular species? Yeah, there's a range of action being undertaken um, on Kangaroo Island for this species. One of the key actions is, is feral cat control. Having lost their shelter, um, their vegetation shelter following the fires, these um, sort of ground-dwelling mammals are now really susceptible to predation by feral cats. So there's a range of um, feral cat control happening on the island. There's also been a predator um, exclusion fence erected on, on part of the island where they've they found surviving dunarts to, they've got, gotten rid of the cats out of there and so they're now protected from feral cats. There's been some um, sort of small shelters put up so that, they, so that um, the dunarts can hide in these shelters and move around the landscape. Um, so there's some artificial shelters that have been put up as well. So there's a, a range of activity happening to protect that species. Okay. Ms. Ambic Pathy, can I just ask a question of Dr. Box? Uh, Dr. Box, I read in the newspaper recently that there is a, a, a citizen science project going on to identify and trying to measure the, the number of dunarts that are left. Do you have any information on, on the status of that project? No, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, I know that they have. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of the uh, details of the citizen science project. There's definitely um, been dunarts seen on camera traps on Kangaroo Island. So we know that some have survived the fires, but I'm not, not up, up with the latest on that citizen science project. Thanks. I, uh, sorry, sorry, Dr Box, I've got one quick question on the dunarts as well. Just as an example of that, is that when you say that's what's being done and we're doing it, is that being done by Commonwealth or state bodies, the actions that um, so are being taken to protect the dunarts? So there are, I guess, a range of contributors um, to work on, on Kangaroo Island. So as part of the $50 million wildlife and habitat recovery package, um, the Australian government provided support to the South Australian government for uh, recovery work on Kangaroo Island. So the Australian government supporting the South Australian government there. Um, South Australia, the Australian government's also supporting Kangaroo Island NRM, which is the regional natural resource management body that manages the island. Um, with that money, they're, they're doing things like feral pig control on the island, but there are others involved as well. So um, Australian Wildlife Conservancy um, was supported the erection of that predator proof fence. Um, Kangaroo Island uh, Land for Wildlife um, is a local land for wildlife organisation and they've been actively involved in, in the work on Kangaroo Island. So there are a range of um, contributors to general recovery actions. I understand that. I'm just trying to work out exactly who's um, who's doing the work on the ground. So you say that there's been a lot of Commonwealth support, and by that I'm assuming mm. you mean both financial and advisory support. Um, mm. but, uh, who's actually going, who's responsible for actually going in and implementing the, uh, the actions that need to be taken? So um, 
I probably don't have a full list in front of me, but I don't South need a full Australian list. I want to get the idea of, no, of the of a bit of a sense. Yeah. So South Australian government park staff that's Flinders Chase National Park on the western end of the island. There, they would be very involved. Um, Kangaroo Island Land for Wildlife is private landholders, so there'll be private landholders who are actively working on their properties. And then Australian Wildlife Conservancy have definitely been on the ground erecting that fence and supporting supporting cats. Um, in the advisory capacity, you mentioned there was a workshop on Kangaroo Island um, to um, talk about um, threatened species recovery and map threatened species recovery on the island, and a range of organisations were involved. I, I was there along with staff from my department. Um, scientists from the National Environmental Science Program came to support that assessment. And then, of course, state government staff, local community members from the island, members of the Kangaroo Island um, natural resource management body. So uh, there really are a, a wide range of, of players doing the work on the ground and providing advice. Thank you very much. Dr Box, who initiated that workshop that took place on Kangaroo Island? Um, that was initiated by, um, if my memory serves me correctly, it was initiated by the South Australian Government. They were very keen to under do a workshop on Kangaroo Island. Uh, they were very keen to have the support of the National Environmental Science Program's Threatened Species Recovery Hub. There are many scientists from that hub who have done work on the island and have relevant expertise. So the South Australian Government approached the Australian Government for support for a workshop um, for us to be able to financially support um, the National Environmental Science Program to, to essentially facilitate and support that workshop and have experts come. And do you have uh, a recollection of actually when that occurred, how, how soon after the bushfires? Um, I can find that date out for you. It was, um, it was certainly before um, COVID restricted our movement. So I think it was um, either late February or early March, but I can check on the date. So I'm, I will be now moving to another topic if the commissioners have any further questions. No, I just, in case it doesn't get covered in the other topics, I'm just interested from Dr. Box, in an overall sense, how do, you, how do you, how does your input translate to state preparedness activities such as hazard reduction and uh, that, and how how does that advice provide the balance between maintaining the habitat and and preparing for disasters like uh, a bushfire? So, in terms of preparedness. Um, I think that the main advice for species um, in terms of what are the threats and what are the um, activities that are required to manage those threats, that advice is really uh, sits in recovery plans and conservation advices, those formal, formal documents. So the advisory role of the expert panel was a very specific advisory role post bushfires focused on recovery. But in terms of thinking about general threats to species and how that informs land management, um, that advice is what's set out in the recovery plans and conservation advices that are um, either developed by the state governments or jointly made between the Commonwealth and the state governments. And there, um, that, that's part of the role of the Threatened Species Scientific Committee in providing advice on those plans and advices. So there is there is advice provided in those for those preparedness activities, but your current activities are really more in a recovery sense rather than a preparedness sense. Do you see that what's learned out of this recovery actions that are going on now, do you see that translating into more input into preparedness? So I certainly think that we've learned a lot about um, the impacts of fire, well we are learning and we will continue to learn a lot about the impacts of fire on different species through this process, um, partly because that we're seeing some areas burn that don't traditionally burn, um, areas like rainforest ecosystems. And so we will learn from this about the types of impacts that fire can have on those on those ecosystems and those, on those species. And this is the sort of these are the sort of learnings that can then be incorporated into recovery plans and conservation advices. They can be updated so that we they can reflect our better understanding of the potential impacts of fire and the types of recovery actions that can potentially help following, you know, help in terms of building resilience and or recovery from fire. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Bennett, do you have a... No, I've got a... I'm, I'm assuming, um, Ms Abbott Pathy, you're going to go to some of these issues because um, I have a few questions in that, but I won't do it now. 
if um, you're going to be dealing with that, because Dr Box deals with a lot of these issues broadly in her very helpful um, statement, which is quite detailed in terms of uh, past, present and future, if I can call it that, um, with regard to this. But I'll, I'll go now if, if you're not going to be covering it. My, my plan is to run through the expert panellists at process that Dr Box um, was chairing during assessment, prioritisation and recovery um, that will throw up some of these issues um, and then go through the next steps um, following the expert panel and what, what, what is proposed to be done. But I'm No, no, that's fine because I, I just, I'm just picking up on a couple of matters. One is that Dr Box made it clear that her involvement in all of this has been since the bushfires, that she didn't have a role there was no role for her as the Commonwealth Threatened Species Commissioner prior to that in the planning for it. And I, know, and I understand the expert panel was set up in January, I think, January of um, 2020. Um, and I think Dr Box just said there are a lot of steps taken, um, you know, that, that the focus, that she, because she's come in at that time, it's been on um, recovery and resilience. But um, I think in her statement, she's also identified... Um, uh, I can call it that, missing information um, that's been identified and um, very, very, a very helpful series of suggestions um, uh, going forward, which I found very interesting. So um, I'm only saying that now so that when you ask the questions and Dr Box gives the answers, I, for one, speaking for myself, would be very uh, assisted if uh, there could be a little bit of uh, discussion about some of those matters. Yes. Thank you. Dr Box, just as a matter of clarification, do you sit on the Threatened Species Expert Panel that advises in relation to EPBC listings? No, I don't. That's the Threatened Species Scientific Committee. No, I don't sit on that. Um, when they meet, I usually have a meeting with them to update them on my activities and vice versa. So we do communicate with each other, but I, I'm not a member of that committee and I don't have a formal role in that statutory process. So the next topic that I'm going to move to is the expert panel. Now, you were appointed as chair of that panel in January 2020. That's correct. And that panel first met on, the, was it the 15th of January 2020? That's correct. What is the membership of that panel? So the members... Um, include experts in conservation biology, biology, fire ecology, environmental decision making, captive breeding, as well as Indigenous cultural knowledge. The members include Professor uh, John Wanowski, Professor Sarah Legg, Dr Stephen Van Leeuwen, uh, Dr Libby Rumpf, uh, Associate Professor Dale Nimmo, Dr Jenny Gray, Dr Dan Metcalf and Dr Dick Williams. Are the states and territories represented on that expert panel? Yes, yeah, so in addition to those members that I just mentioned, um, representatives of all bushfire-affected state and territory governments participate in the expert panel as advisors. Um, and this was established right at the beginning to ensure that we had state advisors who could provide local knowledge and so that we could promote collaboration and coordination of our assessment of the impacts of fires, but also fire recovery activities across the country. So yes, state and territory government representatives participate in expert panel meetings. And so if you could identify for the commissioners which particular states and territories were represented and were acting as advisors to the expert panel. So um, all states and territories, with the exception of the Northern Territory, um, which wasn't affected by the fires in southern and eastern Australia in 1920, uh, are represented on the, on the panel. Um, different, different representatives from the agencies come um, to, to the meetings, depending on the topics to be discussed, um, but we regularly have representation from those states and territories at expert panel meetings. And what was the role or what is the role of the expert panel? So the expert panel really has three, three roles. Um, it's to advise on the spatial and ecological information to assess the bushfire impacts on animals, plants, ecological communities and other natural assets and their cultural values for Indigenous Australians. Uh, the second is to assist the minister and the government to prioritise species and locations requiring intervention and to inform the delivery of the government's response to the fires. And thirdly, to advise on the recovery actions needed to support the immediate survival and the medium and long-term 
recovery and resilience of fire affected animals, plants and, and communities. And that's outlined in the expert panel's terms of reference and that's also included um, as annexed at Annex A to my witness statement. So if I could ask you to elaborate on the spatial analysis that you identified as the first role of the expert panel. So the, um, the expert panel in collaboration with the department and a, and a range of species experts has um, worked on identifying um, the species and the ecological communities um, that were are within the path of the fire. So one of the first um, uh, exercises that, that was undertaken was to ass assess the nature and extent of the impact of the 2019 bushfires um, on threatened and migratory species listed under the EPBC Act, um, essentially by assessing the spatial overlap between the fire extent, which was compiled um, from state fire agencies, which was later published as that National Indicative Aggregated Fire Extent data set, set and then the modelled and known modelled known and likely distributions of listed threatened species and migratory species under the Act. So there was that spatial overlay between the fire extent and the uh, modelled known and likely distribution of threatened and migratory species under the Act. And, and as I noted earlier, that identified that around 330 listed threatened and migratory species had more than 10% of their distribution within the fire extent. That similar spatial overlay was also undertaken for threatened ecological communities listed under the EPBC Act as well. It might help, Commissioners, if we take you to an example um, of that overlay and mapping. Uh, if you go to tab six in your bundle, and that's exhibit 3.2.15, and evidence operator, that's DSB 5010010088. And Dr Box, are you able to explain to the commissioners the process that you've just talked about in terms of the fire extent mapping and the overlay of species distribution? So, um, yes, this is a, a map of the um, bushfire impacts on the EPBC listed um, ecological community, the upland basalt eucalypt forests of the Sydney Basin bioregion. Um, you can see that, um, that, that that pink area is the area where the threatened ecological, the spatial distribution of the threatened ecological community. And you can see from that that I think the estimate was at around more than 50% of the distribution of that threatened ecological community was in the fire extent. And so the grey shading is a fire extent and the pink shading is the known distribution of that particular species? Yes, it's the estimated spatial distribution of that threatened ecological community. And so once that overlay was done, what was the next step in the analysis? So for threatened ecological communities? Yes. So for, for threatened ecological communities, um, so essentially they did an, an overlay of of the fire extent with with the range of threatened ecological communities listed under the EPBC Act. And I think they identified, um, this, this is the department's analysis, um, I think uh, 20 threatened ec ecological communities that had more than 10% of their estimated distribution within the fire extent. Um, and this is, this is one of them that had more than 50% of its distribution within the extent. And then from that initial sort of fire lap overlap assessment, um, the department identified seven, I guess, fire affected threatened ecological communities of, of greatest initial concern and, and highest um, priority for detailed impact assessment. And these threatened ecological communities were um, based, on, were identified on the basis that they're likely to be more fire sensitive because they typically experience infrequent fire or no fire at all. Or, and they're consequently poorly adapted to fire. And this includes um, ec ecological communities like peatlands and rainforests and wet sclerophyll forests, um, and also a highly he uh, threatened heathland that's uh, burnt too frequently in, in, re in, frequent e in recent years to maintain its characteristic traits. Dr. So Box, that's I one of the threats. Mm, sorry. Apologise. I just have a few questions to take you back. In terms of that assess that analysis, was that a desktop analysis or was there, um, it, or was it a boots on the ground analysis? 
No, this is a desktop analysis based on firstly that spatial overlap and secondly on what we understand to be the characteristics of those ecological communities and whether or not they're, fire they're likely to be fire sensitive or they're likely to be adapted to fire. So that was an assessment based on this desktop fire extent analysis, but also based on uh, the department's understanding of the characteristics of those threatened ecological communities. The next step is obviously boots on the ground um, to I, do those on ground assessments. So in terms of that desktop analysis, the the in terms of the fire extent information, where did that information come from? Just refer to my witness statement if you just give me one one moment. So this national indicative aggregated fire extent was was developed sort of quite rapidly by the department. Um, the department wanted to develop, to develop a sort of a, a reliable and agreed sort of fit for purpose and repeatable national data set of burnt areas um, across Australia. So that national data set sort of presents a cumulative national view of fire extent. There wasn't a pre-existing national source of information on fire extent, which was available to the Australian government to do this analysis. So colleagues um, in the department uh, drew da data together from multiple different sources, including from state and territory agencies responsible for emergency and natural resource management and from the Northern Australia Fire Information website. So they needed to source that data and put agreements in place um, and develop up a process for aggregating that, that data and, and for understanding its limitations. So this was a, a, a fire extent data set that was developed um, by, by the department with, with source multiple data sources from different state agencies. And do you have a sense of how long it took to gather all that information together and then validate it and put it in a that fire extent map that could be used for this process? Um, sorry, I, I don't. I don't have a good sense of exactly how long that took, but I could find out from colleagues exactly how long that took. And in terms of um, limitations, you you mentioned that there were some limitations. What were the limitations of that that data set? So um, I'm advised by, by colleagues who are in that geospatial area, mapping area of the department, that the data set has, has a few known issues, um, which are described at its place of publication on the website. Firstly, um, some data in the data set is known to be of low accuracy. Um, the data draws on a variety of mapping methods, so uh, because of that, it sort of lacks national coherency. Um, one of the limitations I, that I, I, I beg your pardon, Dr. Box, just in terms of uh, different mapping methods, is that because there are different mapping methods used in different states or is that because in different types of terrains a different type of mapping method needs to be used and that can vary within a state and between states? My understanding that there are different mapping methods between states, again, it's not my area of expertise, but I, I do understand there are different mapping methods between states. It's also quite possible that there's different mapping, mapping methods within a jurisdiction, but I, I just don't know. So I guess another limitation is that it only shows the outline of burnt areas, so it doesn't have information on fire severity in those areas. Um, so it could include areas within it that are completely unburnt. Um, and also it's, a, it's an intentionally precautionary map, so it could overestimate the size of the burnt area. So there's some of the limitations, but I'm still advised by my colleagues that it's the best, best national data set currently available for this purpose. Um, but those limitations would have affected the accuracy of the derived analysis. And then the other input into the assessment process I think you identified was the species or known or um, estimated species distribution. Uh, which was used to overlay with the um, fire extent maps. Where did that information come from? So for listed threatens, um, for listed threatened species and listed migratory species, if you just give me one moment. The uh, species distribution data for listed threatened species and migratory species um, comes from the Species of National Environmental Significance spatial data set, which is maintained by the department. So that was the primary source of spatial information used for EPBC Act listed threatened species and migratory species. 
And was there any limitation with those data sets in the context of the assessment that was being done by the expert panel? So, I guess um, our species distribution, um, all of our assessments require uh, species distribu distribution data to be able to do this sort of assessment. Um, uh, for many species, there's insufficient um, available observation data, both historic and current, to inform the species distribution models, which inform that assessment of overlay. Um, it varies between species. Um, the availability of species observation data is particularly acute for invertebrates, for example, um, and it's much better for, say, birds. So it does vary between taxa. Um, but yes, those distribution models are, are only as good as the observation uh, data that feeds into it, and that does vary um, in availability between taxa. And where does that observation, where is that sourced from, that observation data that is held by the department? Um, you're probably getting a little bit beyond my area of expertise here, um, but I, I think that species observation data is comes from a, um, a range of sources through um, agreements with the states and territories, um, to, from the Atlas of Living Australia. So that that data comes from for, from a range of sources. Uh, I, I think that um, more detail on on how where that data comes from is in uh, the department's response to its second notice to give. So if we can now move move through the process of the expert panel, unless the commissioners have any... So once the uh, fire extent map um, and species distribution overlay analysis was done, I think Dr Box, you mentioned then there was a prioritisation process in relation to particular taxes and... Could you please run us through that process? Absolutely. So, as I mentioned, that assessment, that spatial overlay, was really just the first step in analysing the potential impacts of bushfires. It was based on fire extent only, and it only examined listed threatened and migratory species and listed threatened ecological communities. So then the expert panel coordinated some further analysis for different groups of, of species or taxa. So uh, the first um, group was, was animals, mo mostly vertebrates. So the expert panel coordinated further assessments um, by extending that analysis to species not already listed as threatened under the Act. And that was considered important because some species not considered threatened before the fire have now lost a lot of their habitat and so may now be imperiled. And the second thing that was taken into account was to incorporate variation in species responses to fire. So species have different characteristics and that makes them more or less vulnerable to fire and not all species react in the same way. So this work on animals was led by Professor Sarah Legg, who's an expert panel member with input from species experts, expert panel members, um, departmental officers and also state government representatives. Um, the assessment considered mammals and birds and frogs and reptiles, a selection of fish species, some terrestrial invertebrates um, and some spiny crayfish. Then priority species for urgent management intervention were then identified based on three factors. So the first factor was the extent of fire overlap, so how much of its range had potentially been burnt. So the higher the fire overlap, the higher the risk. The second factor that was considered was the species pre-fire imperilment. Was it already listed as threatened and in what category? So for example, a species that was already listed as critically endangered is at higher risk than a species that's, that wasn't currently listed as threatened. And then the third factor that was taken into account was the species traits or characteristics that make them more or less vulnerable to fire. So that could include uh, physical attributes like their ability to flee a fire. Do they Can they fly away or are they pretty sedentary? That's going to affect mortality during the fire. Or it could also can, um, take into account behavioural and ecological attributes. So its ability to find food post-fire. Is it a specialist that requires just one particular plant that's that's been burnt? or is it susceptible to predators? And, and those sort of factors affect post-fire mortality. So um, the, the group of experts considered a range of, of animals against those three criteria, and then they, and out of that they identified 
119 animal species in need of urgent management intervention. This included a number of species already listed as threatened, like the Kangaroo Island Dunnart and the Eastern Bristlebird, but it also included species not previously considered threatened, such as the Albert's Lyrebird and the yellow belly Glider. And that report was released um, on the 11th of February and then updated on the 20th of March with some new information. And the summary report from that assessment is at Annexure F1 and the technical report is at, is at Annexure F2. And as part of that assessment of um, what are the priority species that need urgent management intervention, that technical report also provides some guidance on considering what actions um, are likely to benefit a particular species. So that was the assessment for animals. Um, there's also an assessment for plants and an assessment for invertebrates. Would you, would you like me to briefly describe those? Not, not at this stage, unless the commissioners are... No, no, thank you. And so there were... Those assessments were done for different taxa. Is mm -hmm. that correct? And then... That's right. So, so if you could just run through the different categories of assessment that were done for each taxa. Sorry, as in so that was the animal invertebrates, if you could just list those. So there was that work that was done for animals, which was mostly vertebrates, but it included a few invertebrates. Then there was an assessment done of about 19,000 plant species, um, and that assessment um, considered fire extent and traits and then a number of other factors, um, like other stresses, like drought and things like that. Um, that identified 709 plant species at high risk from the fires. And within that um, 709, um, there was identified a subset of 471 plant species that are in urgent need of management intervention, um, including the, the Wallamai pine and um, the Forester's bottle brush and the Betka bottle brush. For the invertebrates, um, the expert panel also coordinated an assessment of fire affected invertebrates. Um, Many of Australia's invertebrates are likely to have been severely impacted by the fires, but assessing the impact was quite challenging um, because for most of Australia's about 320,000 invertebrate species, there really is limited available information on their distribution or susceptibility to fire. So, um, but, but the, the initial assessment, which was um, released in late April at the same time as the plant assessment, identified 191 priority invertebrates for urgent management intervention and a further 147 invertebrate species um, that they thought were likely to meet those fire overlap thresholds, um, but for which there wasn't enough information, so they were prioritised for on-ground assessment. So that's sort of the, the high-level um, summary. Commissioners, I have one more topic that I wish to um, address with Dr Box, but I do notice the time. No, we'll continue with Dr Box and we'll finish this uh, as, a, as a block before we take a break. So, Dr Box, if the, the process that you've described, what were the outcomes of that, that process? What, what was produced? So there are a range of um, publicly available reports on the department's website, which I which describe um, identify all those species that have been identified as high priority for management intervention across the animals, plants, and invertebrates. And also, there's associated technical reports to um, describe, um, you know, why they were considered as priorities. And within those reports, there's some um, guidance there on the types of management actions that are required as well. So they've been identified as priorities, um, and then those priorities are now informing on-ground action. So the work that the panel has done in, co in collaboration with the states to identify protected species in the path of the fire and to identify those priority species and ecological communities for urgent management intervention, they're really informing the Australian government's investment in, in on-ground surveys and management actions to support recovery. For example, um, there's an open, uh, recently an opened competitive grants round um, called the Wildlife and Habitat Bushfire Recovery Program. Uh, the priority uh, animals and threatened ecological communities were, formed the priority matters for the first tranche of that grants round and the priority plants and invertebrates uh, have now been added to that priority list and informing the priorities for that grants round for, for the second tranche, which, um, which is open at the moment. So, um, and those priority lists have also um, informed 
um, the activities undertaken by state governments um, with Australian government funding and also the activities um, that are being undertaken by the natural resource management regional bodies. So these have informed those priorities for on-ground investment by the Australian government, but of course that information is also available as a public resource. So for others who are involved in um, on-ground recovery, they can use that information to guide their efforts as well if they choose to do so. Do you have an example of how the prioritisation and technical information that sits with the prioritisation has been used to inform a government decision about funding? So, for example, um, the state governments are receiving funding um, under the uh, Wildlife and Habitat Bushfire Recovery Package, that $50 million package. Um, those state governments were invited to submit proposals um, to the department um, and the um, expert panel provided in advice and, in, and endorsement of those proposals. And in doing so, they had um, reference to the priority that, that the EPBC Act listed species that were in the path of the fire and also the work that it was being undertaken at the time to identify those priority animal species, which the state governments were aware of as well because they participate in the expert panel. So they're there as a, a way of providing they, they provide guidance. Of course, the state governments and other, other experts bring their own local knowledge and may have identified species through their own assessments that they think are of, in need as well. And, and obviously, the government's very receptive to that on-ground local knowledge. But these, this is an example of, of how, how we're using these lists to, to look at whether or not the proposals coming forward make sense and are being targeted at the highest priorities. So you mentioned that the states may have been doing their own assessments and then the expert panel was also engaging in an assessment. How did those assessments fit together? So the expert panel and the department were really leading um, a national assessment, uh, looking at the impact of the fires nationally on, on matters. Uh, the state government experts were involved at different stages of that process. So for each of those processes, the animals and the plants and the invertebrates, um, that was, there was a lot of consultation with experts as, the, as those lists were being developed. So many of the lead authors on, on those proposals were consulting with state governments as they developed that work. But then those, those um, technical reports and the assessments came to the expert panel for review uh, on more than one occasion for, for review and endorsement. And as, um, as advisors to the expert panel, the state government um, representatives were there as well um, to be able to provide advice on does this, does this align with our assessment? Actually, no, we've got more information from on the ground here. We know that that ecological community actually hasn't been impacted. That one can come off the list, for example. So some of their own local knowledge contributed to adding or removing matters from those national priority lists. And now that these lists have been published and are now available, is further work being done on those lists or do they now just stand as a moment in time? Uh, no, there's further work being done on all of them. So, for example, um, there's further assessment happening on the vertebrate species. This is now being, this new research project is being led by Professor Sarah Legbutt through the National Environmental Science Program's Threatened Species Recovery Hub. And that initial assessment of prioritisation of animals is now being revised to consider fire severity information, uh, to improve the information on species traits, um, and to gather more comprehensive information on the sort of actions that are likely to support recovery. So that work is continuing to be refined um, with new information as it comes on board. And there's similarly, um, there's further assessment happening of the plant species. Um, for example, Rachel Gallagher, she's already assessed 19,000 plant species, but she is um, revising her assessment to include an additional approximately 2,000 plant species. Um, and she's getting additional data on species occurrence from, from state agencies um, and, and revising the trait data as well. So there is um, an ongoing refinement process happening. Um, also with invertebrates um, and threatened ecological communities too. And do, does this, uh, this assessment and prioritisation process that has taken place, does that inform any of the advice on listing applications under the EPBC Act? 
so certainly the assessment work that the expert panel has has done will, um, I think, be very informative for the Threatened Species Scientific Committee, which has that statutory role in advising the Minister on threatened species listings and, and conservation advices. So the Threatened Species Com uh, Scientific Committee is now accelerating the process for assessment of unlisted species and ecological communities, um, reassessing species that are already listed or ecological communities that are already listed that may now require a conservation status update and also revising conservation advices and, and recovery plans. And I think the work that the expert panel has done um, is providing, I guess, a foundation of information to support the threatened species scientific committee in deciding which species it needs to look at um, and to help inform that assessment. And when you say that process has been accelerated, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, uh, I think that the Threatened Species Scientific um, Committee has um, identified that because of the large impacts of the of the fire, they've got, I guess, quite a job to do. That there are a number of a much larger number of species that now need to be looked at, um, and so they're really giving um, additional. Um, they're, they're doing some additional work really over the next couple of years to do that assessment um, and they're being supported to do that through um, this new $150 million funding package announced by the government. I have no further questions, Commissioners. No, that was a very good summary. I think Commissioner Bennett has a question? I do have a question, Dr Box. Um, just going back, some of the things you've mentioned here today and um, also highlighted in your statement were some of the um, missing information and the inconsistencies of information um, around the country with respect to information held by the different states and the way measurements and characterisations were uh, done. And I think you've explained um, some of that with the map that's still, with the map that's still on the, the screen. Um, and how the Commonwealth has, you know, tried to bring together some information. I'd also, for my own part, like to congratulate the expert um, panel because although, it, you know, it wasn't in existence prior to the fires, it seems to have hit the deck running. And um, I, I think it would seem to me, and I'd like you to comment on it, that a number of the matters that you've identified as problems before may have been, are either have been um, dealt with by the panel or um, the panel is planning to deal with those. Um, but in that context, um, in, your, in your statement in particular around paragraphs 148 and 151, you've identified um, ongoing matters as to which you say there is still scope for improvement. Um, you've identified a number of matters earlier, you know, in paragraphs 123, 131, and matters such as that of things that are missing. But then you turn in 148 and 151 to looking at matters that are still perhaps outstanding. I suppose what I'd like to know, if, if you could just identify perhaps very shortly, just in point form, two things for me. One is um, what is still missing? You know, what, what is there that is still missing? And are there barriers that you see in implementing what you, what you have identified or do identify as um, areas that need to be um, uh, fixed, if I can use a, a general word, that is not currently being um, affected, and I mean affected, I don't just mean thought of, but actually being actioned by the expert panel? Um, Commissioner, sorry, are you referring to this, the, my comments here on the wildlife care sector or...? No, it's just um, generally you sort of, you say to the fact there's scope to improve okay. coordination and operational cap capability. Yeah. Um, you talk about the fact that preliminary discussions with state governments and wild, wildlife care organisations on how we can work together to look at pathways for improvement. I mean, bearing in mind mm. that we're here now and a lot of the work of the expert panel has has been done and hopefully even though it wasn't there for preparation for the last bushfires, the work that you're doing now constitutes not only recovery work but preparation for, and we're not that we want to have one, but preparation for any future um, uh, problem, that, that, that the work you're doing and the identification is actually also preparation for another event. But you've identified particular areas where you still see um, improvement and I would like to have a better understanding from you as to what um, what is still outstanding that the if I, that the expert panel does not quote have in hand unquote, um, and uh, any barriers that you can identify in the context of um, the Commonwealth and the states in particular um, in in. Uh, 
making making a better system, I suppose, as you've identified, you know, the sort of system that you've you've foreshadowed. Yeah. So I think we've certainly, I guess I would I'd say that I think the response to the fires has been characterised by a high high degree of collaboration between the Commonwealth and the state governments in um, assessing the impacts and um, undertaking sort of a coordinated recovery effort. So I think that. Um, the lessons out of what's um, what's worked, I think, from the fire in terms of working together on assessing impacts and supporting recovery, I think um, it would be, you know, I see there's a real opportunity to continue that good coordination and collaboration between between governments and a lot of what we've learned in terms of the impacts of fire on species, as I mentioned earlier, will uh, I anticipate be captured in those recovery plans and conservation advices so that all jurisdictions have that up-to-date knowledge about fire risk um, and how we manage um, that, the threats to those those species. I think I mentioned a number of challenges around, um, around map data, mapping and species observation data and species distribution modelling data. Uh, I, I'm not a data expert, but I'm, I'm aware that there are a number of um, projects underway to um, improve species observation data and to improve our, our modelling data. Um, and we've certainly learnt um, about the benefits from having a national fire extent data. So um, I, I would, um, I think there's, there'll be huge benefit in, in making sure that that sort of resource, um, you know, in a standardised way is available to jurisdictions for, for future, future events. Um, I think one of the, um, one of the opportunities I, I raised was um, for the jurisdictions to potentially work together to um, identify critical biodiversity assets and prioritise critical biodiversity assets um, and incorporate those into our fire planning and, and, and response. Um, we did see um, um, some good examples of the Wollamai Pine and of the Eastern Bris Bristlebird where those assets were identified and, and factored into the planning and response. And I think there's an opportunity for the Commonwealth and states to work together to identify those critical assets and build them into the fire response planning in the same way we build um, built infrastructure and community infrastructure into those plans. Obviously, those, those plans and responses are, um, are, the, are the responsibility of the states and territories, but I think there's an opportunity for us to all work together to identify those critical assets and, and build them into those systems. Any barriers that you can see at the moment? I think um, there's, there's a, I guess, a degree of work involved in doing that, agreeing on uh, on those criteria for what constitutes a, a critical asset, um, and and working together to identify those, those assets based on the information we have. But I, I think it would be possible to to do that. Um, and then I think um, the, uh, in terms of understanding the barriers into how that's integrated into those emergency systems, um, I don't really have a good sense of that because that's really not my area of expertise. Thank you very much, Dr Box. That was extremely helpful. Thank you, Dr Box. Appreciate that. Ms Amber Kapathy, any further questions? I don't have any further questions, Commissioner. Uh, Dr Box, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, providing that detail. It's been a huge task since you uh, and the panel started in, the, in January, and uh, we appreciate you giving the summary of that today. Thank you very much. May the witness please be excused. Thanks for the opportunity. Witness may be excused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Tuckley. If that is a convenient time to take a mid-morning break, Your Honour. I think it's very convenient time to take a mid-morning break. We'll take a break until 12 o'clock. Thank you. Local. We'll take an adjournment. Thank you. All rise.
the Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr. Tokley. Uh, commissioners, um, this afternoon we will have a special focus on particular interagency operations and activities to protect particular matters of national and environmental significance. And these will ex be explored by me and other members of the Council assisting. Um, the first of those matters concerns the alpine sphagnum bogs and fens, and Ms. Amica Capathy of Council will take conduct to the next stage of evidence, which focuses on matters in the ACT. Thank you. Ms. Amber Capathy. <laughs> Commissioners, this session will, um, the focus of this session will be the conservation activities undertaken by the ACT during the 2019-2020 bushfires, and in particular in relation to the fire in the Aurora Valley and the activities that were undertaken in respect to the alpine sphagnum bogs and fens. Evidence will be given by three individuals. Mr Ian Walker, who's the Executive Director of the Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Director, Directorate. Mr Julian Seddon, who's a Senior Ecologist in the same Directorate. And Dr Margaret Kitchen, who's a Director of Strategic Coordination and Planning with the Transport, Canberra and City Services Directorate. Their evidence will be given concurrently as a panel. I now call Mr Ian Walker, Mr. Julian Seddon and Dr. Margaret Kitchen. Mr. Walker, Mr. Seddon, Dr. Kitchen, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time this afternoon to be with the Commission. Good afternoon. Hi. Mr. Walker, will you take an oath or an affirmation? Affirmation, thank you. Mr. Walker. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr Seddon, will you take an oath or an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Mr Seddon, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Dr Kitchen, will you take an oath or an affirmation? Uh, affirmation, please. Dr Kitchen, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Mr Walker, the environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate has provided a response dated 24 May 2020 to a notice issued by the Commissioner. Correct, yes. Commissioners, that document is Exhibit 3.3.1 and is behind tab D1 of your bundle. Mr Walker, you were involved in the preparation of that response? Yes, I was. Mr Seddon, you were involved in the preparation of that response? Yes, I was. Dr Kitchen, you were also responsible or involved in the preparation of that response? Yes, I was. Mr Walker, if I may start with you. You're the Executive Director of the Environment in the Environmental Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate. I'm the Executive Group Manager Environment within Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate, yes. Thank you. And you're also the Conservator of Flora and Fauna under the Nature Conservation Act. I am, yes. And Mr Seddon, you are a Senior Ecologist? That's correct. And you work within the Conservation Research Branch of the Environment Division of the Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate in the ACT? Yes, that's correct. And you were also a Values Officer in the Incident Management Team during the 2019 and 2020 bushfires? Yes, correct. Dr Kitchen, you have a PhD in Fire Ecology? 
Yes, that's correct. And from 2012 to 2019, you were the director of the Conservation Research Branch of the Environment Division in the Environment Planning and Sustainable Development Directorate. Yes. And you were the leader of the Rapid Risk Assessment Team in the Incident Management Team during the 2019-2020 bushfires. Yes. And you led the preparation of the Rapid Risk Assessment Report on the Aurora Valley fire in the Magi National Park. Yes. Commissioners, that document is Exhibit 3.3.2 and is behind tab D2 of your bundle. Thank you. Mr Seddon, could you please explain to the Commissioners what the Alpine Sphagnum bogs and fens actually are? Of course. Um, so alpine sphagnum bogs and fens are a type of uh, wetland that occurs in higher elevations throughout the Australian Alps, um, including in the ACT. And they are characterised by uh, a peat, what's called a peat soil, which is a soil high in carbon and that is waterlogged, um, that is, occurs in permanently moist environments in these higher altitude areas. Um, and these peat soils, because of their acidic nature and their high carbon content and the water logging, support a unique collection of plant and animal species, an ecosystem which is different to the other ecosystems in the region. Um, typically, the, the treeless areas in low-lying parts of the mountains and the nature of those peat soils supports particularly uh, heath-like shrubs throughout the, the bog and also uh, characteristic of alpine sphagnum bogs is the sphagnum moss itself, which is an underlying layer on the top of the surface of the soil, which is a, basically a sponge-like, um, cushion-like layer of moss that can be up to, um, or even more than one and a half, or a metre and a half in some places, but a half a metre in others. So it's quite a large spongy layer which retains water. But these, um, Alpine sphagnum bog environments are unusual and because of the circumstances where they occur, which is waterlogged low-lying areas in the mountains, they're quite fragmented across the Australian Alps and occur in isolated patches. Um, they also support a range of unique fauna or animal species, um, most notable, notice, notable of which is the uh, northern corroboree frog in the ACT, which is a critically endangered frog species that we um, we have in our area. Uh, and the sphagnum bogs, um, because of their isolated small extent and clear threats to their persistence in the future posed by climate change and by fire, they are considered to be uh, vulnerable to um, loss over time. And they've, for that reason, they've been listed under various legislation as endangered ecological communities. Okay, so uh, can I just add one other addition comment? So the nature of the sphagnum bogs is that they retain water because of their, the, the boss and the soils, and that, that means they have play a, quite an important hydrological function within our catchments within the ACT. And could you explain a little bit to the commissioners what the importance is of that role that they play in relation to the water catchment for the ACT? Yes, yeah, so they sit high up in the mountains around the ACT and uh, because of the nature of the soils and the mosses and the way they are in the landscape, they actually retain water that falls as either rainfall or snow melt throughout the year and they hold that water, filter it and then release that water slowly back into the catchment. Um, and the analogy that's often used is like a sponge. They soak up the water and then release it slowly back out and that re slow release means that the water is highly filtered of various impurities and sediment. And also it means that the water's released at a lower energy than if it was falling from rainfall. And that allows the water to uh, maintain its clarity and its clean condition. And that, that leads to um, a significant improvement in the water quality in the Cotter catchment, particularly the west of Canberra. And, as, and the sphagnum bogs play a significant role in the high quality water that comes from that catchment and provides Canberra with a lot of its high quality water source. And you briefly touched on this earlier, but can you explain the conservation status of the alpines, sphagnum bogs and fens in the ACT? 
So our alpine sphagnum bogs and fens, I should say that fens uh, is an associated vegetation community around the edge of bogs. So the sphagnum bogs are the woody ones with shrubs and sphagnum moss. Fens are basically uh, sedge lands around the edge. So the, collectively, they are a unique environment. Those alpine sphagnum um, bogs and fens are listed as endangered ecological communities under the Commonwealth EPBC Act and also in the ACT as endangered community uh, under the Nature Conservation Act. And the reason for this is, as I said earlier, is that they're a rare um, environment across the, uh, the Australian Alps and they are threatened by climate change and fire. And is there a particular patch of the uh, sphagnum bogs and fens that are also part of a wetland? Yeah, so they uh, they all form a type of wetland, but there's a particular um, sphagnum bog wetland complex in the ACT, which is the Janini Flats wetland complex, um, that is of highest conservation significance in our region. Um, and this is because it's the largest intact sphagnum bog in the Australian Alps, and it occurs on the ACT within the ACT but near the border on the western side of the ACT. Uh, and this particular wetland, the Genetti Flats uh, wetland, is listed um, as a wetland of international significance under the Ramsar Convention, which is an intergovernmental um, agreement around protecting wetlands of significance across the world. And in terms of the Commonwealth EPBC listing and the ACT conservation listing, are they aligned? Yes, the ACT listing has come in fairly recently, but um, Ian, well, Mr Walker might like to comment here, but the, the alignment of ACT or state and Commonwealth listing processes is a, pro, is a matter that's um, underway at the moment, but essentially in the case of Alpine Sphagnum Box, they are aligned. Mr Walker, did, would you like to make any um, comments? Thank you. Mr Seddon's correct. Um, in recent times, the Commonwealth and state and territory jurisdictions have gone through a process to harmonise the legislation and listings across um, all threatened species in the country, so that if your species, threatened species is listed nationally as endangered, uh, as in the case here, likewise in a territory or state jurisdiction it is also listed as endangered, so that um, people are very clear that it is an endangered community or an endangered species. So uh, that's an ongoing process that states and territories uh, and the Commonwealth have agreed, and we're continually uh, updating those listings on that basis. It actually doesn't change the status in any context. It's just making sure that they're consistent with, uh, with each other. And so are the same ecological communities identified and protected under the Commonwealth regime as the, um, and the same ecological communities are identified and protected under the ACT legislation? That is correct. So both both communities or both ecological threatened species are protected both under Commonwealth, where they are listed as Commonwealth uh, listed species, and in the ACT. So can I just clarify of course. that? And, and we were just discussing side so here. So if it's in if it's classified as endangered at the Commonwealth level, in the, in the Act, it goes down to the territory or the state question is, is it a bottom up or top down? And so if it's endangered in the ACT, does that feed the Commonwealth? Uh, and the reason we're asking this is, you know, if it's, does Victoria doesn't see is it endangered, right, then how, who has the, which state or territory has the primacy in, it, in, in it coming up to the Commonwealth level? So that was not an easy question, no, sorry about that. Yeah. No, that's right. Historically, that's been the, um, disconnection between the two listings. At a Commonwealth level, the Commonwealth may list it at a state or territory jurisdictional level, the state or territory will list it under their relevant legislation. Um, so historically there's been variation because um, you may have a high presence of some species in a state territory jurisdiction compared to what might be occurring nationally. So you might have the stronghold for, let's say, corroboree frogs in the ACT, and therefore see it as a, a significant species that is of um, conservation significance, but 
has good numbers compared to the rest of the country. So there has historically been that variation and both the states and territories and the Commonwealth have been working over the last couple of years to, as I say, to harmonise those two pieces of listings. Um, and there is a discussion, there are discussions that occur that rationalise those depending on where the Commonwealth and or the state or territory sit. So it's a negotiated space. Oh, we appreciate that. Thank you. It, as you say, it might not be endangered in one state, but when you take a national view, actually it is totally endangered. And so I understand from the previous so, witnesses we're working to to, uh, to align that. Correct. And in the ACT, we've taken significant steps and I'm uh, comfortable that we've actually progressed and have alignment with, and I won't say all, but most of the threatened species at the, at the um, territory and Commonwealth level. Okay, thank you. I might ask a follow-up question to that. Where there is a um, species that's listed as threatened or endangered under the EPBC Act, but it is not listed under the territory legislation, is there a different... How, what's the impact operationally from your perspective and your so department's perspective? Yeah. So irrespective of the Commonwealth and or territory listing, the on-ground action remains the same. There is no variation between a, what would occur under a Commonwealth listing or under a territory listing. We both recognise that there's a threat status and the emphasis is then how do we mitigate or uh, reduce the threats to those threatened species? And that's a really important point because the actions are fundamentally the same. So you need to prevent fire coming into these in the case of bogs and fens fires coming in. You need to reduce grazing pressure from um, hard hooved animals. You need to protect them from weeds and from other invasive species. So they're the sorts of actions that irrespective of a Commonwealth or a jurisdictional listing would be undertaken. Can I just clarify one thing? I think you said initially that um, there was very good alignment between the ACT and the Commonwealth in this regard, um, both to attempt to align it in theory but also operationally. To your knowledge, is that uniform across the country with regard to um, the difference? There is, there is variation and it depends on how quickly each of the other jurisdictions pick up and run with that, um, that process that is currently ongoing. Thank you. So, Mr Seddon, I might come back to you um, and just finish off that um, description that you were giving of the alpine sphagnum bogs and fens in the ACT. Uh, and I might refer to a map. Uh, this map is EPA.500.001.1096. It's Exhibit 3.3.2 behind tab D.3. Mr Seddon, you'll see this coming up on the screen. Yes, I can see that. that. Is that 1139? Sorry, it's 1139. So, Mr Seddon, are you able to, with reference to that map, just describe for the commissioners, if you can see it, um, where the Alpine <coughs> bog locations are? Yes, it is difficult to see it in this format, but um, because this is this map is showing a number of ecological values uh, from the uh, Rapid Risk Assessment Report. But the Alpine sphagnum bogs, which are referred to in this map as high country sphagnum bogs, are the uh, lighter blue coloured um, areas and they're, they're distributed throughout the burnt area of the map, which is the coloured area, primarily along the western border amongst that pink colour, which is uh, snow gum woodlands. And also in the central area, there's a number of um, sphagnum bogs. So it, it's not possible for me to point to anywhere in particular on the screen, I don't think. But if you can see those pale blue coloured areas, you can I'm, see that I'm, they're I'm quite happy small. I'm see, see those, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so you can see they're distributed throughout 
uh, the what is the burnt area of Namaji National Park, um, and that they're in sort of small fragments throughout the landscape. Thank you. Now I might turn to Mr. Walker, and if you could please explain to the commissioners what hazard plans and strategies were in place from a strategic perspective and at a strategic level leading into the 2019 and 2020 bushfires in the respect of Namaji National Park. I certainly, thank you. Um, and I'll take it from two different uh, perspectives, one being the perspective of the Nature Conservation Act and outline the plans and strategies that are um, significant in that context because that uh, act and the purpose of that act is to conserve and protect biodiversity. So that's one of the primary pieces of legislation that we have and I'll talk to that in one second. The Emergency Act is the other act that has uh, relevance here and its uh, primary object of its act is in relation to emergency management and to protect and preserve life and property. And I stress that those two acts are, I guess, the drivers behind what we do in the ACT and how we then protect and um, manage both the environment and also ensure protection of life and property. So in terms of the Nature Conservation Act, and I'll start there, the Nature Conservation Act describes the um, need to conserve and enhance biodiversity in the ACT. We do that through a number of plans and strategies. The Nature Conservation Strategy outlines across the ACT where particular actions are required to conserve species, communities that are listed under ACT legislation. Um, those strategies and actions will cover all communities, all threatened species and all environmental aspects in the ACT. You step down through that hierarchy to uh, geographic park management plans and in this case the Namaji Park Management Plan specifies specific geographic information of where those values, natural, cultural um, and also recreational or visitor values are and outlines objectives to manage and uh, support the conservation of species within that geographic patch. So each park and reserve across the ACT has a plan of management. I'll also highlight that plans of management sit within the jurisdiction of territories so or state jurisdictions. So Despite being called a national park, there is no national park context for that at the Commonwealth level. Commonwealth recognises them as national parks, but there is no hierarchy. It stays within each state and territory jurisdiction. jurisdiction. And Mr Walker, just to clarify, when you say uh, that it stays within state and territory jurisdiction, you mean it remain, it is the responsibility of the ACT? Correct. So there is no, so under the Nature Conservation Act, the Act describes the need to develop a management plan and the establishment of a national park. So the Namaji National Park is sitting within that frame and is the responsibility of each jurisdiction, e.g. the ACT. Um, how the national park came into being comes back to the point that Mr Seddon made earlier around the importance of water. The Namaji National Park provides and is the key source for 80% of the ACT's water supply and fundamentally that was one of the reasons the area was set aside and protected under the Nature Conservation Act and uh, listed as a national park. If I cascade further down, sorry, uh, you were going to ask another question. Oh, yes, I was going to direct you to two particular plans, um, so I may be pre-empting where you were going. but. If you could please tell the commissioners about the regional fire management plan and where that fits into that hierarchy you just described. Okay, I'll um, provide one more example just to cascade down in the, under the Nature Conservation Act and that relates to species and or communities. So under the Nature Conservation Act, we produce species conservation plans or conservation action plans. So our bogs and fens, our corroboree frogs, 
uh, species listed under the legislation would have action plans specific to that species and we have particular implementation aspects in that space. So, as I was explaining, that all sits with under the Nature Conservation Act and I can talk about other areas but that's, that's the primary relationship there. Under the Emergencies Act, um, we also have a hierarchy of plans. So the Emergency Act, as I said, is about um, how we protect life, property and the environment in that order and that's what um, in our jurisdiction the Emergency Services Agency leads and responds to through an incident management team. In terms of preparing the environment, and I use that as a generic term, for um, potential threat from fire or other areas, it is an ongoing 12 months of the year process and EPSDD implement a range of actions to mitigate the threat of fire by reducing fuel loads. That's described in three plans. Um, it's described at the strategic bushfire management plan level, which is a longer term strategic plan across the territory. Uh, and that's really, I guess, describing the principles of what we want to achieve, the key areas where we need to focus our energy and the energy of all agencies in the government to mitigate and reduce the risk of wildfire. At a operational level, we have a long-term operational plan called the Regional Fire Management Plan. And in this plan, it describes the key areas and maps those areas where we would reduce fuel loads. And that plan is prepared um, by Environment Planning Sustainable Development Directorate because it's about particular patches of land and reducing fuel at that over a five year horizon. That plan is guided by the work of um, our residual risk process, which for the commissioners, that's a process developed out of Melbourne Uni, um, adopted in Victoria, and we've picked that up and started to use that in the Territory. That residual risk um, modelling is exactly that. It's a modelled process by which we can assess where a fire is likely to have the greatest risk to life and property and therefore put in actions to mitigate that. The final plan um, is an annual plan and that's what we refer to as the bushfire operations plan and that describes the year in activity to reduce fuel in uh, parks and reserves across the ACT and each land manager, landowner is required under the Emergencies Act to have a bushfire operations plan. EPSDD as the manager of approximately 80% of the ACT has a fair stake in making sure that that operation plan is implemented on this annual basis. It outlines um, the areas to be burnt, the training requirements of our staff, the preparedness around reducing things like um, reducing fuel loads by grazing, by slashing, by other means. It also identifies access and um, the sorts of things that we would need to do to manage fuel across land in the ACT. And that was, I'm happy to take questions of clarification. Council? And Mr Walker, a couple of the commissioners had a chance to, uh, to see this firsthand on one of our visits uh, with, with a couple of you. I think you've talked about the plans. It would be worthwhile, I think, talking about the practical, a practical example of how that's, how that's enacted. And so with the map that's up there at the moment, with that exhibit 1139, either with the Janini wetlands or that part of the southern part of Namadji National Park, could you give us an example, either you or maybe Dr Kitchen, how um, you balance the need to protect the environment, the habitat, with active measure, measures that you use to manage the risk so that you could manage against those three priorities that you were, were talking about? Yeah, so um, part of our process 
associated with the regional fire management plan is that we step through with our ecologists, so uh, Dr Kitchen, Mr Seddon and others, to best understand the use of fire in the landscape. Um, we do that in conjunction with our Parks and Conservation Service team, who are the implementers of our prescribed burning program and other fuel reduction measures. They outline uh, the areas from a uh, life and property perspective that they think should be burnt, and together it's work through um, what that would look like on the ground and any um, impacts associated with the environment are considered and adjustments made to try and get the best result we can both from a life and property perspective but also from a ecological perspective. Um, acknowledging also that during all of those discussions Ultimately, if we're talking about prescribed burning, the window of opportunity to do that will ultimately dictate the, the level of uh, area burnt and the reduction in residual risk. Um, you would appreciate that under the climate scenarios that we're dealing with at the moment, our window of prescribed burning has reduced and therefore our ability to I could collectively balance these outcomes is also diminishing and hence why our residual risk process is, significant, is highly important to us going forward. Um, I might ask uh, Dr Kitchen to give, a, I guess, a first-hand practical example of what that looks like uh, on the ground. That would be great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, what I can add to, to that outline is in the development of the recent regional fire management plan, we ran a number of scenarios which was measuring the risk firstly for life and property, but then looking at the risk to the catchment and some of the other ecological values. So as you can imagine with land managers, there's a number of objectives that are needing to be uh, understood and supported in management. And so the idea of running those scenarios and those models was initially to uh, come up with some landscape mosaic burning frameworks. So our initial um, cut at our regional plan is to look at across the landscape, what are the areas that can be burnt and then a logical time frame over, we take a 10 year time frame to look at planning and identify how a mosaic of fuel patterns can be uh, determined for each of those risks. So um, obviously life and property are the, are the first ones, but then the second cut is really looking at where burn can be implemented over the landscape that protect our water catchment and our biodiversity values. And that's how our regional fire plan uh, was developed. Okay, if I can bring you down a level then and use it in some examples, whether the southern part of Namadji that, that has not been burnt, why that was important and what actions you actually took to protect that. And then Janini, the wetlands, a similar thing. Uh, we know the importance of it, but you took some specific actions in preparedness and then during the response to the fires to try and balance the the, the need to, to maintain them, but there was a use of uh, techniques and uh, and technology to, to try and protect protect them. Yeah, look, I'll very briefly um, just touch on the long unburnt down in southern uh, Namadji, which, um, which we've done a number of planning actions around that. Um, but then I might hand to Julian because on the day um, where there was quite a significant threat to Janini wetlands, we actually put into in some very significant, like you know, the fire retardant line and we can move to that. Um, but I'll just touch briefly on the long unburnt. So um, as you know, ACT was impacted by significant fires in 2003. There was 90% of Namaji burnt at that in that time, and there was only 10% that was unburnt after that fire. So while uh, long unburnt is not a technical term, for us it was one of the 10% of the park that represented a long unburnt time period after that 2003 period. So in our um, fire plan, 
2008, 2009, we identified that this was a patch that we needed to preserve, particularly in the short term, while we got a variation in the regrowth of the vegetation in the park from 2003. So this has followed through right through from 2003 right into our, our recent fire plan. And we've done a number of actions. So um, there was a patch, it's called Potter's Hill. So there was a patch in the middle that there was a decision to burn that to actually break up the fuel load. So that was identified on the first by regional fire management plan. There was a fire trail also along the western edge that was upgraded. So there were some very specific actions that were implemented in that regional fire plan and they were carried over into the next plan uh, and they were then the focus of protecting some of the long unburnt in the Aurora Valley, Valley fire in February. And it was just recognising the biodiversity value of this area. So um, I might go to uh, Janini Wetlands because it was uh, an area that was of particular interest in the Aurora Valley fire in February but I guess it was based on a lot of planning that had gone and years before that and expert opinion that we had actually received on how to manage that, that wetland. And Commissioners... So and perhaps, Julian, do you want um, to... Sorry? I, I beg your pardon, Dr Kitchen. Um, Commissioners, yep. the plan is to come come to that and, and, and that the planning process okay. that, that, yeah. that um, preceded the operations during the bushfires. All right, well, I'll hand back to you and you can bring us up to, to that, but the practical demonstration, I think, will be a good uh, good yes. thing for the commission. And just finally, Mr. Walker, with you, can you please explain to the commissioners um, what the pre-suppression atlas is? <laughs> yes. So the pre-suppression atlas is a collection of maps. Fundamentally, um, it highlights all of the known values across the ACT and it provides a way of um, informing incident management teams of where those values are in the landscape. So it's a, uh, I guess in two forms, a hard copy map, but also a GIS layer of information that can be interrogated um, in real time during a fire event. So it's both, as I say, a hard copy map, but also a GIS layer that is fundamentally what the incident management team and the planning team used to determine the strategies and actions through the incident plan when they're putting out, trying to put out a wildfire. And, and in terms of the pre-suppression atlas, when is this put together? Um, we update the information in that annually and we have that available as a product annually across the territory. Um, and it is updated in that context because we might undertake a survey for a particular species or um, cultural values that will update the particular layer that that relates to. So you will see this constant building of information and essentially that atlas represents that build of information over time. And if you could please explain to the commissioners, you talked about that atlas identifying the values within the ACT. If you could please explain to the commissioners what you mean by that term. So I mean values including ecological values, so things like um, bogs, fens, um, corroboree frogs, other values of threatened ecological significance. It will identify areas of long unburnt, it will identify areas of high catchment value areas or and or catchments. It will identify cultural heritage sites, um, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal sites. So it becomes the, the foundation information that supports decision making through the incident management team. Um, and it's a very good piece of information for planning in any context outside of the fire environment as well. And so if I might now, Mr Walker, take you more specifically to the 2019-2020 bushfire season. When did you realise it was going to be a dangerous fire season? Um, so uh, like most jurisdictions, we do receive bomb advice and other advice routinely through their quarterly updates. 
Um, we are also heavily involved with the Australasian Fire Emergency Ser uh, Services Authorities Council. So we're receiving that information you know, quarterly. And in the context of this season, we were already starting to brief um, in the middle of winter that we were looking like having a particularly significant fire season. And we briefed certainly our executive and others that uh, in September, that this was an important year in a fire context. The reason um, I guess we're quite in front of that, being a small jurisdiction, we do sit on a range of different bodies and are able to integrate information relatively easily. For example, um, New South Wales were in drought uh, during the course of 2019. We had extremely dry conditions as well. We were very conscious of that environment and our own information collection through those, those bodies that I mentioned just reinforced that message that we were coming into a particularly uh, significant fire season. Uh, I guess when it started to become very real was in our first deployment of Parks and Conservation Service staff and others to Queensland. Um, and that, uh, that occurred in September, uh, which was quite early. And what that means, we have that uh, relationship and agreement that where we have fires in other jurisdictions, we will support each other and deploy staff and resources to do that. So we were doing that from September through October, November um, into, as I say, Queensland, South East, Eastern Queensland, but also into uh, New South Wales. So we were very aware of the, of the context uh, around us at that point in time. So if I could take you back to something you mentioned um, in the beginning of your um, answer, and that was you were aware of the conditions in New South Wales um, and that they had particularly dry um, uh, weather conditions leading up to the bushfire season. I think we might have some technical issues, so just bear with us for a moment. Mr. Walker, can you can you hear us? I I can now. I, I just we disappeared for a second. I think we're back. Thank you. So I, I was taking you back to an earlier answer where you said you were aware of the dry conditions in New South Wales leading up to the 2019-2020 bushfire season. That was informing your uh, assessment of risk. How were you made aware of that information? Can you just repeat the last part of that question? The the awareness that it was a dry season in New South Wales and there were risks because of the, the, the drought that was um, in New South Wales at that time, how were you... That information about the conditions in New South Wales, how was that made available to you? Where, where did that information come from? Um, it comes from multiple sources. So, um, so I, for example, I sit on the uh, senior officials for agriculture ministers. Uh, there were briefings going to ministers in the agricultural space. So minister, in the ACT, minister gentleman is both the minister for the environment and heritage, which also includes the agricultural area. So through those processes at the very highest level of government, um, we were receiving information around drought, how various jurisdictions were responding to drought and how we were supporting rural landholders. So that's how at a, I guess, a high level across government and all jurisdictions and the Commonwealth participate in those, that information sharing is occurring at that level. At a more officer level, um, AFAC, uh, and we have a representation at AFAC from our Parks and Conservation Service. So that body um, was also sharing information uh, during during 2019 and very early on in the piece. And so, how did December and December 2019 uh, unfold? Um, yes, that's a very good question. Um, for the ACT, we were. Um, uh, I guess um, significantly aware of the fires going on around us. 
So uh, there are a number of fires that kicked off uh, in late November through December and particularly fires like the Duns Road fire, the Marys Hill fire were quite significant for us and what later became known as the Adaminaby complex. And if you refer to your map, they were the fires that were on the um, western edge of the ACT uh, and southern edge of the ACT. The reason that they were quite significant is that that's where um, we first established an incident management team in the ACT when those fires um, were, uh, were going and became very significant. We were concerned of the risk of those fires travelling east into the Territory and impacting on Namadji National Park and in particular our high value cotter catchment area. So that's when the ACT government um, first put in place an incident management team and that was operating uh, through our emergency services agency and we put that in place at about the 2nd of January. And if I understand it correctly, at that stage you said you were planning um, and all activities were focused on a fire coming from the west? Correct. Uh, so they were on the western, bo western border of the ACT. Right. And I might... So our, our, yeah, sorry. Our cons so we established an incident management team uh, a state of emergency was called in the Territory. At that point, we did not have any fires in the ACT. So the threat was coming from the Adaminami, Marys Hill, Duns Road fire uh, to the west of the ACT. Okay, now I might turn to you, Mr Seddon, and uh, if you could please um, explain to the commissioners your role, um, both when the incident management team was set up in relation to uh, the fires that were threatening to come from the west um, and then um, moving into the uh, Aurora Valley fire. Council, could I just uh, have make one comment just to kick off before Mr Seddon uh, moves in. One of the steps we took um, during December and then subsequently through January was to close particular areas of Namadji National Park, including Bembury Wilderness. Um, and that's a quite a significant, uh, I guess, point to make. By closing the park and Bembury Wilderness within the park, it meant that we greatly reduced the risk of accidental ignition by people. Um, so the park, um, so one of the functions of the conservator, my role is the ability to open and close parks. Um, so we closed Bimbury Wilderness on the 12th of December because of the perceived risk of fire in that area. We then closed Namadji in totality on the 19th of December and there were a range of progressive openings and closings but ultimately during that period of time Namadji National Park was closed and remains closed until actually remains closed as of today. And, and that's a very important, I guess, risk mitigation tool to reduce potential fire in the landscape. Thank you, Council. Mr Seddon, you were going to explain your role as a values officer in the incident management team. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I should probably clarify what's referred, what is meant by the term values officer, what that role involves. Um, it's actually not a formal role within the Australian Integrated um, Incident Management Framework, but it's a it's a role that we've been using for a number of years in the ACT in the context of prescribed burning and smaller wildfires, and it's about providing subject matter ex subject matter expertise into the incident management team. Uh, around the area of ecological values and cultural heritage values. So uh, there's a small number of individuals in the ACT who have 
performed this function over the years. Margaret, uh, Dr. Kitchen is one of those people as well. Um, and basically we're drawing on our existing expertise and knowledge of ecological values and cultural heritage values across the uh, territory to provide that input into decision making, which is um, the responsibility of the IMT. In the context of the 2019-20 fire season, this was the first time that we actually had a values officer embedded into an incident management team run by the ESA uh, for a large emergency fire. As I mentioned, we'd previously had that role in prescribed burning operations to provide ecological input, but this was the first time it was done in the context of an emergency and a large IMT. So the role essentially is around providing subject matter expertise uh, into the IMT decision making, providing, um, and the important thing is there is existing knowledge or knowing who to contact to find that knowledge in the real time situation of, a, of an IMT, being familiar with the data layers that provide that spatial reference to where those values are and having an awareness of the sensitivities of those different cultural and ecological values to both fire, but also the fire suppression options that are available to the IMT. Um, so the, the critical thing here is that the, by having a values officer embedded in the IMT, there's a, there's a resource available to focus on the cultural and ecological values and maintain them on the radar of the IMT. Once, the, once these operations start getting big and complicated, it's um, the IC, the incident controller, and the other key IMT officers, such as the planning officer and operations officer, are very focused on a complex environment, um, and naturally life and property becomes the highest priority. And some of the cultural and ecological values can start to, um, start to be lost in the complexity. So having a values officer available can keep that on the radar and raise the profile of high priority values. Okay, and if you could explain, Mr. Walker talked about the regional fire management plan and the pre-suppression atlas. How did you use that resource when you were embedded in the um, IMT team? Okay, thanks for that. That's. Um, so the pre-suppression atlas's primary purpose is to provide uh, maps of where values and other important considerations are across the landscape to assist firefighters in the first, you know, 12 to 24 hours after an incident kicks off, uh, before other expertise can be brought in. So the pre-suppression atlas is quite complicated. It's got a lot of de detail on it. Not all of that detail is relevant as we go forward into managing an incident or as relevant. So the values officer can actually access all the separate layers that are used to build up that atlas and compile them or interrogate those spatial layers in a way that's sensitive to the exact situation that's pan is panning out. So to give you an example, um, as the Duns Road and Mary's Hills fires was threatening the western side of the ACT, values officers in the IMT in the ACT would um, access the, the underlying layers that provide the basis of the, of the pre-suppression atlas, in particular the Alpine sphagnum bogs layer, as well as cultural layers such as scar trees, European cultural sites such as the border markers along the ACT New South Wales border, um, the location of threatened plant species that might be fire sensitive. There's a whole lot of different values that can be interrogated as separate layers and then recompiled to provide a simpler picture to the decision makers focusing on the, the values that are currently highest priority for uh, and under threat. So in the context of the Marys Hill and Duns Road fire west of the ACT, the Janini wetlands complex and other sphagnum bogs along the Brindabella range on the, on the western border became um, a very high priority and they that was through existing knowledge of existing listing levels and uh, policy and um, conservation documents so we knew that those were high priority conservation assets to to consider in operational planning so we produced maps which would highlight those values to the IMT okay and so then uh, so an IMT was established in response to the risk coming, potential risk or threat from the fires in the New South Wales. But ultimately there was the, the fire in the ACT in the rural valley. 
and um, was that did that was the threat coming from the same direction? Uh, no, that's there was a change in the direction of threat as a result of the weather where previous weather slowing down the Duns Road and Marys Hills fires to the west, but then the ignition of a fire in the rural valley within the ACT, uh, which on the map that's on the screen is that lime green section sort of roughly in the centre uh, of the map. That's the rural valley. So the fire started at the very top end of that rural valley and then proceeded to the west and southwest and then over a period of time expanded out from there. But the essentially from the point of view of conserving alpine box and spens and in, in particular the Janeni uh, Flats wetland complex, uh, the, the threat was now from the east rather than from the west. And then can you run us through what the decision making process was in relation to what action would be taken or not in relation to the alpine spags and alpine bogs and fens? Yes, yeah, so it's um, Doc, Dr. Kitchen referred to this earlier, not so did Mr. Walker, that um, some of the, these priority actions have already been thought through and are a part of the action plans to address those various conservation values. But also in considering the regional fire management plan, um, the sensitivity of different ecological values to fire, but also to fire mitigation actions has already been worked through and discussed within the agency. So we had sort of a fairly good understanding of um, the hierarchy of options to protect particularly the Junini wetlands complex. So I've already mentioned that it's an internationally recognised wetland. It's listed at the Commonwealth and the ACT level as well. So it was already at the top of our list of ecological values to, uh, as in terms of priority for protection from fire. The reason that protection from fire is um, important in this case is that the Janini wetlands were burnt in 2003 and fire is a threat to sphagnum bogs because they are very slow to recover being in high altitude waterlogged environments, they grow slowly and recover slowly. But also there's a threat that fire can get into the peat soil that underlies the bog. And if that happens, you have a subterranean fire which can burn for weeks or even months and essentially destroy that peat soil which takes thousands of years to form. So fire is considered a very high threat for bogs. It had previously been burnt in 2003, just 17 years before. And we had technical advice from a published report from a bog specialist um, at hand, which suggested that, or said, said that use of uh, firefighting retardant would be preferable in the case of Janini wetlands instead of allowing it to burn again in such a short interval. The other option that might have been available to fire managers in the IMT was potentially putting a bulldozer fire break around the bog. But the disruption of the hydrology of the bog is actually probably the highest threat to their long-term persistence. So to put a bulldozer line around the bog under an emergency situation where it would be um, potentially difficult to supervise that work adequately could potentially destroy the hydrology and cause that bog to, to be ruined or lost forever. So the advice from the technical report which we had access to was that under limited circumstances, the use of fire retardant was probably the best option. Uh, and we, the values officers compiled that information and presented it to the planning cell within the IMT uh, as an option to, to have aerial retardant laid down on the south, east and north sides of Janini wetland complex, which was the side which was becoming threatened by the Royal Valley fire. So in terms of that plan that was put to the um, incident management team. Who was involved in putting that plan together? Uh, well, values officers um, compiled it. That was myself and another individual. And uh, based on that technical advice that I referred to, scientific advice, we, we proposed that as an option to the planning cell, which then would was then agreed to and was presented to the incident controller, whose decision it is to make that, to make that call. Um, and the incident could, controller... Sorry, if I could just take sorry. you back and you can just explain the different um, 
agencies involved in that process from an ACT perspective. So the, the values officers yep. that were involved in initially developing the plan, are they from the Environment Directive? In this case, they were, but there's no there's no requirement for that to be the case. But naturally, that's where the expertise would normally lie. And then you mentioned a planning uh, unit or a planning group, and which agencies are represented in that particular group? So, so the composition of the IMT is not um, is is based on expertise and availability of suitably trained or expertise staff. Um, it's not related to a specific agency. Mm -hmm. the, the actual running of the IMT is underneath the, the emergency controller, who is the commissioner, uh, ESA commissioner in the ACT, and is the responsibility of ESA. But the component staff who make up those different roles is based on availability and expertise. As it turns out that in the ACT, um, because a large amount of the fire management, on-ground fire man management activities are conducted on conservation estate, there's a large body of expertise within the Parks and Conservation Service. Um, on the day, I can't tell you, I was not the values officer on the day that that proposal was put to the incident controller, although I was in contact with the values officer to make to collaboratively make that decision. So I can't say off the top of my head who the incident controller was and which agency they represented. But in um, terms of... The key thing... Sorry, sorry go no, ahead. No, no, please, go ahead. Mr. Seddon. Uh, so, the the key thing is that the functional roles with the IMT, um, what the, what their purpose is, rather than which agency they came came from, um, the 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 way it generally works is the planning cell is headed up by a planning officer, and they look at the bigger picture around where the threats are what resources available, what what tactics might be appropriate and effective at addressing the threat. They then propose that to the incident controller and if the incident controller um, then makes a decision around priorities and directs the operations officer to make that happen on the ground. So the inst my role or our role as values officers is to provide expertise and suggestions around cult cultural and ecological values to the planning officer who would then present that a set of options to the incident controller. And in terms of those sets of options, um, how, to the extent that you're aware, how are those options then considered by the incident controller? I think the incident controller was well aware at this stage that the, wet, the sphagnum bogs were a high value um, conservation asset and that in particular Janani wetlands was a high was the highest value conservation asset um, and they were keen to, where possible, to, uh, to utilise resources to protect those assets but in consideration of what other priorities existed across the fire and in the region and the availability of appropriate assets, in this case um, a very large air tanker retardant dropping aircraft. And so if, if I understand what you're saying is that when a request is made, there are a number of considerations that are taken into account. Um, one is the resources that are available to implement that request. One are the, res the other one is the resource priorities as to what other needs are required. And I think we've heard evidence earlier that there is a hierarchy in the ACT in terms of um, w which assets get priority over others and then whether the conditions themselves may be conducive to that particular um, operational request. Is that a fair summary? In general terms, I think that's a fair summary. If you wanted to um, understand the nuances of that, then it would be best to talk to incident controllers and ESA around how they make those judgments. Uh, but you, the last comment you made there around the conditions being appropriate is important. I hadn't mentioned that. That um, it, to to a, use a, an asset like a very large air tanker requires certain weather conditions. So even once the decision was made to um, support that operation to pro provide a retardant break around the edge of Janini wetlands, then it needed to be a case of those assets being available and the weather conditions being suitable. And from your your knowledge um, of being in the incident management team area, 
how are those resources actually uh, engaged and sourced by the ACT? So in the case of the uh, aircraft required for the retardant um, deployment, how are those resources obtained by the ACT? Well, in this, this particular case, the very large air tanker is not um, something that the ACT has as its own asset. So it needs to request access to that asset for operational uses from my understanding as the New South Wales Air Desk, uh, but that's that's something that the ICs or the operations officers would be best to answer. But my understanding is that it goes outside of the immediate ACT context to get access to those resources. And then in terms of, so that request was approved? Yes, that's correct. And then how did that actually unfold and what was your involvement in that operation when it in, un, as it unfolded? Uh, so the request was approved um, when a different values officer was uh, in the IMT and then we shift, we changed shifts and I was available and in the IMT when the weather conditions became appropriate and uh, to support that operation. So there's a few days where there was low cloud base and wasn't possible to get the DC-10 to fly over the area and drop the retardant. Weather improved and there was a small window of opportunity in which um, the aircraft was available and the weather conditions were suitable. So the aircraft, the mission was um, was conducted and during the mission, um, I was able to have direct contact with the air attack supervisor who is in an aircraft in, in the same airspace as the DC-10 very large air tanker and was able to have a uh, conversation with them about ensuring the retardant was dropped according to the map we'd provided but as close to the edge of the bog as possible to, um, to maximise the likelihood of that retardant line actually stopping the fire if it came to the bog. The important thing there was if, if, if the retardant was dropped too far away from the bog in the woodlands that surround it, there's a pretty good chance that the fire would then jump across the retardant line into the tree canopies on the inside of the retardant. On the other hand, we didn't really want retardant being dropped onto the bog if we could avoid it. So my conversation with the forward air controller or the um, air attack supervisor was to bring it in as close to the edge of the bog as possible and, it, and that was exactly what was achieved. The very large air tanker has a lead-in aircraft, a small aircraft which guides it in and they were able to pr put a line in pr very precisely on the edge of the bog. And at a later stage, sorry, just uh, one moment, um, Mr Walker. At a later stage, we had the opportunity, I think Dr Kitchen will speak to this, um, to go and observe the outcome of that operation from the air. And it was apparent that the retardant lines were laid down in a fairly precise manner right on the edge of the bog. Okay, uh, Mr Walker. Um, Council, I'd just highlight um, the point Julian uh, made before. Um, the role of the incident management team is drawn up from people across the ACT government and they are individuals that are trained in fire management, trained in fire behaviour, trained in a whole range of um, skills to support fire management. Because the Parks and Conservation Service in particular manages 80% of the ACT land, we have a large number of people who are um, experienced in fire management and have particular skill sets. So an IMT, depending on its location where the fire is, may be made up uh, predominantly of particular skill sets coming from the Parks and Conservation Service within the Environment Planning Sustainable Development Directorate. So that would include um, some of our incident controllers, some of our fire behaviour analysis, through to situations officers, planning officers. And as I say, because we're in this space year in, year out, we do perform that function of providing that resource to support ESA. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that the operational staff who are out on the ground putting the fire out are also predominantly in the context of this fire um, Parks and Conservation Service staff, both rangers and field officers. Commissioners, I'm conscious of the time. There's still one portion and one topic that I'd like to address, particularly with Dr Kitchen but I'm in your hands as to whether you'd like to continue or whether you'd like to have an adjournment.
I think if we can finish this by 1.30, we'll keep keep going, then we can control the, the, the time a bit better. Yeah. So just finishing out, um, Mr Seddon, what actually, what course did the fire ultimately take? Yeah, so um, the, as it turned out, there was rainfall uh, from around the 7th to the 9th of um, February, but then heavy rainfall from the 10th and 11th of February, which effectively halted the fire in its tracks, at least on that western and northwestern area. And the fire never made it, never made it to the retardant lines that were laid down in the Janini wetlands area. Um, so we didn't get to find out whether it would have worked or not. But on the positive side, you know, the, the wetland was not impacted by fire this season. Okay. And so, Dr Kitchen, thank you very much for patiently waiting. Um, now, in terms of your... You, you led the um, what is called the Rapid Risk Assessment Team. Could you please explain um, what the purpose of that team is? Sure. Um, so the Rapid Risk Assessment Team is a multidisciplinary team and its primary purpose is to come in at the end of an incident to work in the IMT and very rapidly the risks in the fire zone that have been caused by the fire but also by the changes that have occurred due to the fire like the loss of the topsoil, loss of grass, ground cover which increases the risk for soil erosion, debris movement. So you can imagine in the ACT with this very large scale fire, we had impacts on threatened species, assets, the water catchment. Um, and those are the kind of risks that the rapid risk assessment team looks at. They look at impacts and risks to life and property, to the assets, but as well as biodiversity. Um, they don't look at the built infrastructure such as houses. And so, so when, we did come in oh. and, and do that risk assessment. So when, when was the um, that team first uh, initiated, and when was when did it actually come together? Okay, um, so in the middle of January, we actually had some early discussions about deploying assessment team, recognising the high risk to Namaji National Park. There were fires on the western side and we'd already had this summer of fires moving through New South Wales. So there were some early discussions, but really on the 3rd of February, there was a meeting with Ian Walker, myself and the head of the park service. It was after the Aurora Valley fire had taken off and there so was... Uh, major impacts. Oh, your pardon, sorry. And that was when it, if I can just sorry. So if I can just ask, so the initial discussions about setting up the team actually started before the Rural Valley fire started. Is that correct? That's correct. So the initial discussions about deploying a rapid risk assessment team were when the perceived threat was on the western edge and recognising that many of the biodiversity assets in the National Park are on the western edge. However, the actual um, risk then came from the east, but then they were still impacted. Yep. And so when was the uh, rapid risk assessment team stood up? Um, so we had um, an initial debrief, but we got the team to formally start on the 12th of February. So we had a 13-person team, which is slightly larger than some of these, uh, some of the teams that I've worked with in the past. I should just put the context that the rapid risk assessment process came to Australia in 2009 and is based on a US model of the burnt area emergency response. They're called the Bear Teams, and they actually came to Australia from the Victorian Fire Deployment. And there's been a small program to try and develop these across the country. However, Victoria and we've partnered with New South Wales are the main states that are doing it. So I've worked with Victoria and New South Wales. Um, I knew the process and how this team would be deployed over five days. However, um, we had to pull the staff in, which we did on the 12th of February, get the team
think we've lost Dr Kitchen. Uh, I think Mr Seddon, you, did you have some involvement in the rapid risk assessment team? Yes, I was a member of the team. And so, um, in terms of if, um, wh how did that that team actually operate? So the team operates. There's a number of specialists who focus on different areas, different areas of risk. Um, there's a biodiversity, flora and fauna specialist. There's a erosion specialist, a cultural heritage specialist, and also a infrastructure specialist around park infrastructure. And Margaret Kitchen is the team leader, and there was a deputy team leader from New South Wales Parks as well. Um, so, and that was in recognition that uh, some of these uh, issues were shared across the border and that the, that member could take back that learning back across the border to their park areas as well. So the, the, essentially the specialists, well the first day or two is about compiling data to inform the process. So the fire severity mapping is a key, key data set. Another key data set is the terrain and landscape. And so that, sorry, just the, um, so in yep. the middle of February that fire severity data set was, was already available. Uh, well, we had a spatial analyst specialist in our team who was able to rapidly produce a severity map from satellite imagery. So it basically compares vegetation signatures from pre-fire and post-fire and then makes an estimate of severity. Sorry, that's a really critical data set. Yeah. Yep. So that's that's overlaid with other data layers like the, like the one we have on the screen, which is sensitive plants uh, and ecosystems to fire. Uh, also terrain to feed into erosion modelling, uh, which one of the specialists would produce. So that the first few days is pulling those data together, making those initial analyses of where the high risk areas in the landscape are. And then by the sort of middle of the deployment, um, there's some validation of those models through both on ground inspections where it's possible, and as well as uh, aerial inspections using helicopter resources provided by the IMT. So this is why it's important the rapid risk assessment team is deployed while there's still an IMT stood up because there's a whole range of resources available which are being used for suppression that we can draw on to facilitate um, investigating the risks and the impacts. So that there's a period there where there's uh, validation of the assumptions and the, the predictions of the results of the different specialist areas. Um, and then the last day is pulling together those analyses, writing the report, and then it was presented to uh, the Conservator of Flora and Fauna and the SA Commissioner, the, on, I think on the fifth day from memory. So it's a five-day implementation plan. That's correct. And the whole purpose of that is that it's, a, it's rapid because what you want to be able to do is identify the really high priority risks which need immediate attention to avoid further damage. And they may be around putting erosion controls in around sensitive areas to avoid water quality impacts on important rivers. It could be around um, biodiversity values that need to be uh, addressed straight away, such as you know impacted threatened species that might need to be recovered and taken to other unburnt areas or even looked after in um, captive breeding areas until the environment recovers. Um, it could be around risks of infrastructure such as walking trails that pose a risk to the public. Uh, so so the idea is, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead, Mr. Seddon. Well, I just wanted to reinforce, so the idea is it's rapid so that, that that information is available to the land managers as soon as possible so they can start addressing the highest priority risks, the extreme risks. And does that information in terms of the highest priority risk, does that only um, get acted upon once the report is compiled or is there a process for that information during the rapid assessment process to be made available and actioned? Uh, where there's high priority risks that need urgent attention, the, the liaison with the plan manager is ongoing during the, during the rap, rapid risk assessment process and also the um, availability of some of the IMT resources um, allows for some actions to be taken during the process. And in this case, there, were, there may have been uh, Australian Defence Force um, equipment and personnel available to get in and actually start dealing with things like erosion risk. Um, so ideally, the high priority risks that have been identified in the initial processes of the deployment 
can be fed to the land manager uh, straight away. Once the report's complete, there's a whole series of other risks that the land manager then develops a, a strategy for addressing. Um, and, and that is the case. The, the Parks and Conservation Service and our directorate is um, implementing a, a number of actions, all the actions out of the rapid risk assessment report um, in a prioritised strategic way, looking at what needs to happen straight away and what's a longer term recovery actions that might take three to five years. And and so just one final question. Um, so this is a new process that was put in place and it was the first time that the rapid risk assessment was done um, after a bushfire in the ACT. Um, in the 2003 bushfires, um, just by way of comparison, how long would it have taken you to get to the position you were at after five days from the rapid risk assessment? So I wasn't directly involved after 2003, but my understanding is that some of those processes took a number of months to uh, provide findings and prioritised um, recommendations. Some of them may have been quicker than that, but there were certainly elements around the recovery of alpine bogs, sphagnum bogs, and what actions need to occur in those environments after fire that took a number of months to, to uh, come to light. Uh, so the advantage of the rapid risk assessment team is that it, it is supported by the IMT to get in there and make those um, assessments as soon as possible. And that, that creates a great advantage in terms of uh, avoiding further damage, particularly in the early post-fire recovery period when erosion um, is, a very, is, a, is another source of environmental damage. Sometimes the, the effects of post-fire erosion are, are more severe than the actual fire itself. One, one moment, please, Mr Walker. I, I have no further questions, Commissioners. Do you have any further I've questions? I've got uh, just a couple, and I'll ask Mr... Uh, Mr Seddon, that was a great summary. I appreciate uh, jumping in there uh, as Margaret went Thank offline. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> um, for Mr Walker... Uh, you, you can add a little bit to Mr Seddon in a second, but the question I've got for you is the ACT obviously doesn't own a lot of the risk uh, which sits to the west of, uh, of Namadji and the, in New South Wales. Just sort of stepping back in a preparedness sense, how do you coordinate with New South Wales to manage the, uh, the fuel loads and the hazards that are, that are there? If you could just briefly give us a, a, what the coordination yep. uh, process is. Uh, yeah. Certainly. So, Commissioner, I think uh, that's a really good uh, question. Um, in considering fuel in New South Wales, we work closely with our colleagues in New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service. So there's a collaboration that occurs there. Uh, at a high level in government, we have a, uh, an MOU between ACT and New South Wales that also articulates the need for fuel management uh, on the, you know, if you like, on the border. Um, in our residual risk uh, modelling and assessment, we don't stop at the border. We do that um, into New South Wales, but we recognise the threat coming from New South Wales to our west as an impact on the ACT, but we also recognise the risk from ACT going into New South Wales on the east. So um, in considering all of those elements, I guess that's how we've uh, prepared and engage with our colleagues in New South Wales. Thanks for that. And I should acknowledge, I should have added to that, that uh, this fire did burn out to the east uh, and affected New South Wales, so it's a vice versa process. Um, and our IMTs are often also both, we, we populate IMTs within New South Wales, so the Tumut IMT had mm. um, uh, ACT staff on that fire. And likewise, New South Wales will have um, members of you know, New South Wales um, staff on the IMT in the ACT uh, incident management team. No, I appreciate that. Mr Seddon? I'd just like to, Commissioner, I'd just like to add an example of um, how, a, a real example of how what Mr Walker has discussed around the fire planning uh, pans out. So, for example, in the southern part of the ACT, um, the, that's not considered a, a normal, normally considered a high risk direction for risk to Canberra suburbs because most of our most severe fire weather comes in the north or northwest. But we do conduct fuel reduction activities and 
fire trail maintenance in the southern part of the ACT around the, the bottom of Namadji National Park, specifically the purposes of reducing risk to neighbouring New South Wales areas, including Michelago and that and Breadbow area. So it, as Mr Walker said, the regional fire management planning process extends beyond the ACT borders, both in terms of looking at fire history and fire risk, but also in terms of ecological, the significance of ecological assets within our park in the broader context of the, of the region. And thanks a lot. And that, that's a good context of how Territory and Estate are working together to manage each other's risks. So I appreciate that, that summary. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a quick question on, on just that issue about your modelling around residual risk. When you're, oh, I'll just state my understanding of it, you run a series of simulations in order to identify where's the best place to locate your fuel management activities in order to reduce risk to life and property, to the water catchment and then to ecological assets and obviously also to neighbouring assets as well. Um, when you're doing that, do you evaluate the extent to which fuel management activities can reduce the severity of impacts on environmental values when wildfires do actually go through areas? Or is it just about identifying where fuel management activities can be used to exclude fire out of activity, out of areas? Do you understand what I'm saying? So if I'm understanding your question, the, um, the modelling does consider fuel reduced areas. So it builds into the model the areas that have been fuel reduced and therefore how the 3,000 odd simulations across the area would vary depending on um, those areas that have been uh, prescribed reduced in fuel load. Um, likewise, if there's a wildfire event, that modelling will also pick up that and will change that risk profile, recognising that so I was just going to say, and does, do you consider the extent to which that reduced severity can uh, help in conserving environmental values? Oh, can I um, jump in here, here, Mr Walker? Uh, the level of uh, interrogation of the modelling depends on the quality of data that goes into it and the number of resources that are available to do that modelling. So in, in theory, modelling could be used to look at the change in severity of any potential wildfires as a result of the way fuels have been treated across the landscape. Um, in reality, the complexity of the modelling um, is limited by the capacity of the and the timeframes to do it. And, it, it, and in the weather conditions under which those modellings are simulating. So we've started this process in the ACT for our for our current draft 10-year regional fire management plan, and there's room for uh, improving and making those models more uh, detailed, if you like. And in, in the context of the 2019-2020 fires, now the regional context is quite different in terms of its fire history after this last summer. So we actually need to go back and rerun those models and considering the effects of fuel management on fire severity would be certainly one aspect we'd like to look at. I think well from me. Thanks to you both. Thank, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Mr Walker, one final comment? One final word. I'd just like to close out the conversation from Mr Seddon about the rapid risk assessment work. Um, mm -hmm. So that work, um, while it's been the first use of it in the ACT, Victoria also uses that approach and has done so on a number of occasions following um, fires. Um, importantly, the rapid risk assessment transitions from an incident management team into ongoing land management delivery through a recovery program. And as Mr Seddon highlighted, that's the space we're now operating in. So if in, in, in this case, the incident management team hands over the rat rapid risk assessment to the parks agency who then go about mitigating those risks in a recovery context. Thank you for Thank that. You, Commissioner. And, no, that's good because the one, one question Commissioner Bennett had was how does this go on a bigger uh, context like a bigger state and so you've answered that question for us. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Ms Amber Kapathy. I have no further questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, commissioners, if it's convenient to the Commissioners, what I'd like to do is to introduce the lunchtime video that we have. Okay. Um, and, the, and may, may the witnesses please be excused. I apologise. Sorry. My fault. Sorry.
Um, so, Mr Walker, Mr Seddon, and if you can also thank Dr Kitchen for us as well. We went well over time, but, but you gave us some very good information that we can, uh, we can use now as we uh, progress through the, the Commission. So we appreciate you spending the time with us this afternoon very much. Thank you. Chief. Thank you for the opportunity. Yep, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks. Chair, if you wouldn't mind just if right. it's possible for a formal, um, uh, for Dr Kitchen to also to be formally excused, even though she's not present. Oh, yes, formally excuse her as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So, Mr Tokley. Chair, uh, we, we normally have a lunchtime video. We can still do that and yeah. resume it at 2.30. Uh, there's some time um, available this afternoon so we can, so we can make up time. Uh, and that would enable us to complete today's evidence by the end of today as well of all the matters we've got listed for today. Um, so based on uh, the timing I think we've got for the, the coming events, we will complete today. It might be late, but we'll complete. Yes. Um, so if you'd like to um, introduce the uh, the next uh, evidence. Yeah, I'm just going to find out how long is it. It's, yeah. it's 59 minutes. So it'll be an hour. Yeah. And, so if you do that, we will, uh, if you introduce that evidence, and then I will give you a time once we've gone through that whole process. Or is, we've done that as a part of the bundle, and you're happy with that? Uh, we're just, um, it'll take me less than one minute, Chair. Go for it. Thank you. Uh, Chair, next we're going to hear from Ms Caroline Patterson. Ms Patterson was the ranger in charge of the Kangaroo Island Parks prior to 2019, and she's now an environmental consultant working on Kangaroo Island. She and her family lost their rental home in the fires on Kangaroo Island. Her evidence was taken by video link from Kangaroo Island on the 8th of May this year by council assisting Ms. Kez Dovey. The video of Ms. Patterson's evidence is Exhibit 3.4.1. The transcript of her evidence is Exhibit 3.4.2. Her evidence has been edited to include several photographs and a video referred to by her, and the original footage of her evidence, along with the separate documents referred to, are also available. We can now play the video, which lasts for approximately one hour. Okay, so we've already tendered that evidence, and we will play the video, and then we will re-adjourn at 14... Sorry, reassume, reassume, not re-adjourn. Reassume at uh, 14.35. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Mm. Can you please tell us your name, your occupation and your address? Um, my name's Caroline Jane Patterson. Uh, currently I'm an environmental consultant. I would like to acknowledge the First Nations peoples of Kangaroo Island, which include the Nurunjeri, Rumanjeri, Narunga and Ghana people, and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. Can you please tell us your background and how you came to live at Kangaroo Island? Yeah, sure. Um, I have been a park ranger with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, um, working for state government since early 2000s. Um, a park ranger in three regions, being York Peninsula, Flurio Peninsula, and most recently Kangaroo Island. Um, I came here in 2011 in a leadership role. Um, and uh, accepted a redundancy package uh, in February 2019 because my values no longer aligned with the department um, and I was having mental health issues and, and stress issues relating to that. And when I left, I was the ranger in charge of Kangaroo Island Parks. Thank so, you. <clears throat> Prior to the recent fire season, where were you living on Kangaroo Island? Uh, we were renting a large house from the forestry industry, um, Kangaroo Island Plantation Timbers, uh, west of Kangaroo Island, um, which was in amongst a blue gum plantation. Uh, but we also own a acreage of about 320 acres out on the northwest coast of the island. Thank you. Can you describe the roles that you and your family have and have had in the community over the time that you've been in Kangaroo Island? 
Yeah, I guess um, more so before I was uh, on Kangaroo Island, I was an active member of the uh, Department of Environment's uh, Country Fire Service Brigade for about 16 years. Um, and I have also been involved in emergency response planning and management as part of my role as ranger in charge. Um, in the community, uh, my daughter attends the Pandana uh, campus of the Kangaroo Island Community Education, which is our local school. Um, she also plays netball for the Western Districts um, uh, Community Sports Club. My partner is a um, plumber and gas fitter, so he has his own small business. Um, and I'm a member of the Kangaroo Island Friends of Parks volunteers for the Kangaroo Island Western Districts group. I'm also in um, Kangaroo Island Eco Action and I volunteer for BirdLife Australia as well. That's You're a very active community member. <laughs> I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe the natural environment of Kangaroo Island as it was before the recent fire season? Yeah, sure. Um, can I just turn pages? My notes? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, Kangaroo Island is one of Australia's 15 biological hotspots. Um, it's been separated from the mainland for probably, you know, 7,000 years approximately, uh, which has meant that it's been kept free of a lot of diseases and also some feral animals like foxes and rabbits. Um, Aboriginal occupation for some reason ceased for a long time and it's not really clearly known why but the island wasn't therefore subjected to the same um, fire regimes that Aboriginal people did on the mainland. Um, but what it's ended up with is an environment that has a large, around about a third of the island, which is old growth, intact um, native vegetation and really critical habitats. Um, the biodiversity hotspots are places with a huge amount of different species. And so we've got 900 plant species, 400 that are endemic or only found here. We have 25 land mammals, seven microbats, around about 270 birds, 500 different fungi species and 18 reptiles and we also have two of only three of the world's monotremes being the Kangaroo Island echidna uh, and the platypus. Platypus was introduced um, but the value of the wilderness landscape on Kangaroo Island was recognised um, by conservation visionaries in the late 1800s when they saw the value of these wild places as a place to conserve species that were declining on the mainland and they fought for 30 years to have the West End set aside um, and a hundred years ago um, last October uh, was the anniversary of the Flinders Chase Fauna and Flora Reserve being established and so there's a I have got a photo of what it looks like now, um, which is unfortunately quite different than it did a few months back. Um, because of the absence of, of foxes and um, also rabbits, we still have a lot of small mammal species left and they include a lot of um, threatened species. So uh, the critically endangered Kangaroo Island Dunnart, um, the southern brown bandicoot. We have so many woodland birds that are threatened on the mainland and also glossy black cockatoos, bushstone curlews, uh, bassian thrush, um, southern emu wrens, and they're all here because there's this diversity of habitats and, and lots of different um, stories of vegetation from leaf litter and fungi through to old growth fallen logs and stags and um, hollow Thank you. Turning now to um, the ways in which the community prepares for the bushfires, um, can you describe your knowledge of community bushfire education? Not specific to this, but sort of over the years running up to what, what people are told about bushfires? 
Yeah, I guess um, <clears throat> there are people who have been living on the island for generations who are, who are quite familiar with fires. Um, you know, every 10 or 12 years, they usually have a big one, is what I've been told. Um, but there is a little bit of complacency, I think, um, in the preparedness and I know that the Country Fire Service have tried to engage with community and also tourism industries in trying to um, educate people to have you know response plans for their family and also to spread the word to tourists and visitors to the island about their need to have their own uh, bushfire survival plan but I'm not sure how much engagement there's really been. I think, you know, the, the community meetings have been quite small. They do the fiery women workshop, which is, you know, preparing, I guess, you know, not just women, but often the person at home for how to plan to stay and defend and how to pre prepare properties. Some people are very prepared. Um, I know of one particular property who, uh, his house was saved a couple of years back, well actually just over 12 months ago, by the fact he had planted kaikuya on the north side of his property and that acted as just a, a break and saved, saved the house. So um, there are different levels, you, you can't brand the whole community um, with the same brush, but I would say that because we have a third of our visitation to the island being internationals, there needs to probably be a much better focus on pre-visit awareness of the danger of visiting bushfire prone areas. And also, I guess the planning of both tourism and accommodation developments needs to really think very long and hard about the design of facilities and the location of facilities because there are a couple of examples like Hanson Bay and Vivon Bay which are one way in, one way out and we were very lucky not to lose Vivon Bay um, in the recent fires and of course over in Victoria there were entrapments um, in those areas where lots of visitors, the, the visitation season aligns with the fire season making it very very dangerous um, and it was really, really concerning to hear, um, you know, the, the marketing that Kangaroo Island was open for business even when the fires were going because that is high risk. It's attracting more people to the island, putting them in danger, putting pressure on the resources and putting pressure on the emergency services who then have to manage them. So that was very concerning. Thank you. Um, on, on the education front, specifically with children, with your daughter at the local school, do you know if there's any education programs around bushfires that are run through the school? Um, they do have drills. Um, the Pandana campus is one of very few last resort refuges because they've got the great big, big oval there. Um, so I know that they do drills. On days of catastrophic fire danger, the schools close in South Australia because the buses are having to travel through um, dangerous areas. Um, but I'm, I can't tell you if there's any specific uh, programs by CFS directed at the school, I'm sorry. When, when it was in the lead up to this particular bushfire season, were there particular planning or organisation or preparations that were done in, in advance of potential for fires? Well, I guess every year um, landowners are sent notices to reduce their fuel loads. Um, and that's not just, you know, vegetation, native vegetation, that's also grasses and fine fuels and, and weeds, which carry uh, fire very quickly. Um, having said that, 
there's still um, some very, very long grass and weeds um, along the roadsides, which up until the break in the season, every time I drove through, I was starting to sweat. <laughs> so all I could see was a wick. Um, but then there are people who see the same when they see the corridors of native vegetation. Um, so with regard to uh, council, I guess council has limited resources on the island to um, do all of the deliverables that are required for roads and, and fire prevention. Um, and so I guess they're limited as to how much they can achieve. Um, but the same goes for the Department for Environment and Water. Um, and following the 2007 fires, there was a huge amount of um, resources thrown into the state government's uh, fire management branch within the Department for Environment, Water and Natural Resources, or one of its, one of its uh, many names. Um, and they did fire management plans, one of which um, I've attached um, if you want to have a look at, at the degree of planning that goes into the department's management plans. They also um, employed a lot of staff, um, bought plant and equipment and started implementing a lot of fire prevention measures and that includes prescribed burning and also includes physical removal of fuel loads. However, each year the budgets get cut. Each year, where the department expects that you do more with less, uh, work more efficiently, you lose staff, um, and you just cannot deliver everything. At the same time, the climate's changing. So we're getting longer, drier summers, and there's less of a window of opportunity to do a prescribed burn, which is called a prescribed burn because there are very strict prescriptions to enable it to be lit, which is about relative humidity, temperature, wind speeds, wind changes, soil moisture, vegetation moisture, all those types of things. So you've got longer bushfire seasons, shorter periods in which to actually um, do any sort of uh, fire prevention methods. Then you also have quite a high rainfall, which means trying to do works on tracks results in bogged vehicles, very difficult to traverse some of the West End parks even in the fire season because there are some very swampy areas there that make access quite difficult. Um, yeah, so you do what you can with the resources that you have. Um, and I know that there has been a number of prescribed burns in the West End over the last recent years. And one of those burns did protect will help to protect a rather large strip of native vegetation which will be very critical habitat on the northwest. Um, but then there's also large tracts of hard and softwood forestry which have been um, planted more than 20 years ago. Uh, currently there's no way to get them off the island and so they haven't been as well maintained over the years as they would be if they were actually being sold and replanted, I guess. Um, and they don't have very good resources either in which to maintain and also suppress fires when they start. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you. In respect of your property and your home at that time, were there any preparations that you and your family specifically took? Uh, in the home that we were renting, it was not defendable. So every year we did a bushfire survival plan, regardless of where we were living. Previously it had been in Kelly Hill Conservation Park. Our plan was to evacuate and that house burnt down. Um, after that, we were in the Karata uh, Parks residence. Um, our plan was to evacuate, that house burnt down. <laughs> um, and now more recently in the Blue Gums house, we didn't have any outside water. So 
that we had no way of defending that house. It was in the middle of a blue gum plantation. It had timber decking. Um, there was no way we could we could actually defend it. Um, and so we planned to evacuate. Because the Duncan fire started on the 20th of December and the fires actually started much earlier this year. So as we know, the rainforests were burning in September. Now, you, you know there's climate change when rainforests burn because they're a closed system. So something's going on. But we also had fires on the island before the fire danger season. Um, then in December the 20th, the Duncan fire started. Ignition was by a lightning strike. Now, historically, um, in my experience, the lightning strikes um, do start fires. It's a natural way of igniting um, native vegetation. And usually there is enough um, moisture in the soil and vegetation to allow a fire to trickle around and burn a patch and then leave other areas unburnt, go out, and that provides a natural break for next year, but it also provides a range of different habitat types and age classes, which provides for the needs of a whole heap of diverse species. So from, you know, little seedlings right through to old growth hollows. Now, those lightning storms, since I've been on the island, we've expected them around about October, November. Um, and, you know, these ones were December, January. It'd be interesting to see what the patterns have been over time. Um, however, uh, that lightning strike lit up very close to um, my own or our own property. Um, and we had very little uh, fuel in the form of grass on our property because we haven't never improved the pastures. We just have eight fairly happy cows out there um, but it did take out our fences three patches of native vegetation and some um, creosote posts that we had laying on the ground which was only minor damage we were very very lucky um, before we before we go on I'll, I'll move on to the fires but just so that we don't lose track of it you referred to an about the the fire management plan yep the fire management plan for this chase that you're looking at. Can you please describe that document for me? Yeah, so um, this is the management plan that was um, updated in 2009 um, and I think was due to expire in 2019. Um, it, it sets up the Department for Environment's planning for suppression, prevention um, and also uh, management of fires and also it zones the park um, and identifies areas of high asset value um, for the pr protection of human life and property and also high conservation value for the protection of habitats and threatened species. Um, this document has to be a, a has to go out to public consultation. So there's a you know there's a team of people involved in writing it. Um, so that that's what the Department for Environment work under. Thank you very much. Now, if you're comfortable doing so, um, I'm going to turn to the period of time when the fires came over. Mm -hmm. How many people do you normally have on Kangaroo Island in, in an off season? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so we've got a, a resident base of about four and a half thousand, that's four and a half thousand people. We, then you have your off-island rate-paying people who have holiday homes um, and either utilise them throughout the year or, or rent them out. We get, I think, around about 250,000 visitors a year, but I couldn't tell you, I mean, most of the visitation, the peak period coincides with fire danger season. So it's really Christmas, September school holidays, Easter, but the Christmas period is the kicker, like Christmas, New Year's, and that's the, the big school holiday break. Um, and that's when the place is quite manic for at least a couple of weeks. Okay, 
So this this year in that early January period, can you describe what kind of numbers of tourists you had? Well, after the up until the third of January, which is when the ravine fire actually yeah. took out everything. The island was marketing that it was still open for business. So there were still people coming to the island. After the ravine fire took out 89 homes and about 40,000 head of livestock and assets and, and fence lines, thousands of kilometer of fence lines and livelihoods and pastures and native species and habitats, um, they finally put the brakes on, we're open for business. Um, but yeah, usually it would be our busiest time, yeah. There were enough people, let's just say on the 3rd of January, there were enough people to make it really difficult to manage them on a catastrophic day when the parks and the um, council campgrounds are closed because there's no, um, well, to my knowledge, the commercial tour operators and accommodation providers don't have a consistent approach to managing visitors. I was driving for a, for a commercial tour, tourism operator on the day, um, the catastrophic day. I had a family from America, they were from California, who were very, very aware because of what they'd been through with the increased amount of fire activity. They'd been evacuated themselves, they were so understanding. Um, and I ended up dropping them off at their hotel early. Um, but the, the whole day we were just avoiding smoke and on the phone to, to base to find out what the latest was. And it was really scary. But I know that at that time there were still people who were had left people in accommodation in areas with high fire danger, um, with a going fire. And there were also some tour operators going into areas which potentially were putting people at risk. So I, I, I'm not, I just think that there needs to be consistency between all level of governments into how we manage it and also between tourism and accommodation providers into, into how we manage it. We know that tourism and agriculture are our most important economies on the island, um, but we need to put public safety above the dollar at this time. If you're comfortable doing so, I'd like you to describe what your personal experience was through that couple of days. You can yep. do it at a high level if you prefer, or with detail if, if you feel comfortable yep. doing so. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. So. Good to go. So then when um, my friend in who lives in um, the highlands in Queensland um, was evacuated by fire in September and that really scared me to hear that the rainforests were on fire. Um, so I was already at a heightened sense of awareness and because I'd been, um, you know, the regional fire duty officer and the parks duty officer through my role as a ranger, I was constantly checking the CFS website, the Bureau of Meteorology's um, sites for the forecast and so it was just, it became an obsession to be quite honest and I wasn't feeling very comfortable about driving on those, on the catastrophic days in particular and I was in communications with my employer to actually help them to write a um, a response plan for uh, days of heightened fire danger, which we didn't get to do because <laughs> it all started um, on the 20th of December and I was driving on that day as well. That was a catastrophic day. Um, and then on the, on the 3rd, I was driving. So from the 20th of December, my partner and I set up our farm fire unit. Uh, we burnt out two pumps in the first week and um, so then we got a slip-on unit and got our old um, ute going and put that on. 
um, he was out for about three weeks, um, fighting fires day and night, helping um, friends and strangers, you know, previously with, with no experience. On Christmas Day... I'm just, I'm just going to um, interrupt for a moment there because I understand that he was a farm fire unit, unit mm-hmm. in, in one. Can you describe that for us? Yeah, so particularly local farmers and land owners have their own unit. Usually it's a four-wheel drive with a, um, you know, four to six hundred litre tank on the back or it could have a, you know, a clear cube on a trailer with a thousand litres of water on it. Uh, Basically, they're set up to, you know, defend their pasture, their stock. Um, they can get into some places where big trucks can't get and they're not bound by the constraints of government and bureaucracy so they can hit the ground and go. Um, On Christmas Day, which we spent the morning until 7.30 opening presents with my daughter and then the phone rang and they, someone said, you need to go and defend your property, it's on your boundary. Um, and so my daughter and I ended up there that day as well. But that evening, I remember um, a phone call to the CFS hotline um, that I made saying, we need to get a bomber to Middle River because there was a fire roaring up the gully, but of course there was a fire also in the um, Cudley Creek vicinity on the mainland, so the resources were stretched. The houses um, that the fire in the valley across the road from us, the houses that were in the line of that fire were only saved because of those farm fire units. There were 30 of them, 30 30 blokes, um, protecting those assets and they did save them. um, And the CFS didn't come at all. And I'm not criticising the CFS because as I said, we had going fires across Australia and multiple big fires in South Australia. Um, But, yeah, the benefit of those farm fire units shouldn't be underestimated. Coming from a parks background, I'm also aware that there are issues with um, them not being trained under the CFS banner. Um, They don't have the same GRN communication that the CFS have, Government Radio Network communication. Um, There are some issues with um, safety, uh, personal protective equipment, um, and there's also a little bit of, or in some cases, there are things that are done probably illegally, which is such as clearing scrub and backburning. But I will say, some of the backburning actually resulted in properties being saved. Others probably resolved in more environmental assets definitely being lost. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it just, it was the fire that just kept on giving. Um, there were There were landowners who had that fire come back through burnt forestry land um, three times and managed to save their house the first time, the second time, and then on the third time they lost their house. They'd moved, um, they lost a heap of sheep, but they'd moved a, a herd over to the east of Pandana. The fire, the ravine fire, wiped out half that flock. It was just a horrendous fire. The, the loss to this community. Um, the, um, I've had conversations with people who have said to me, oh, we weren't directly impacted, or at, at least we didn't lose our house, but they've lost everything else. They've lost their income, they've lost their pasture, their tools, their vehicles, their machinery, their house, and their, the contents of their house in some cases. Everyone feels like they're doing better than everybody else, whereas really it's impacted the whole community, small businesses, everybody knows someone who's been directly impacted. Um, You know, half of the families at the Pandana School, those children have been directly impacted. Um, The Western Districts Football Club, the club in the scrub, was lost in the fire. 
um, yeah, set little shack, shack settlements down at Hanson Bay. Um, yeah, tough stuff. Do you have a view on whether the the firefighting resources that were available were sufficient when you take into account the farm units as well as the additional um, resources that were brought onto the island? That, that's really difficult to answer because you need to recognise um, that with so many going fires, um, incident management would be very, very difficult. Um, I don't think there's enough resources actually on Kangaroo Island and because of the just the sheer numbers of um, residents on the mainland compared to over here, obviously when you do a risk assessment, there's a risk for higher loss of life um, in some of the larger localities on the mainland. So I don't think the resources are good enough and I don't think they're based on the island. So I know from um, the Parks Brigade, the numbers of fit, active members has been declining over the years. Um, and we relied over here on the resources from around to the state to deliver prescribed burns or come and support us with fire suppression. Um, the people in the CFS and in, including the Juna Brigade, which is a highly skilled brigade, um, do a great job at first response. There is no doubt, and they know the land. So that is really, really important. Um, and the support we get from the mainland is amazing. But really, I think the first response is potentially the most important if there are fires that are that are threatening or if there's forecast weather conditions that look like turning it into an inferno which is what happened like you know we had multiple burnovers with the ravine fire um, including on the south coast road where where a cfs truck was actually overtaken from behind by the fire now that's not normal fire behaviour. It's um, it's just a holocaust, and it's not stoppable. It doesn't matter how many how many fire breaks you've got, or or how much you knock down native vegetation. That things, you know, ember attack can be happening like <laughs> kilometres and kilometres ahead, setting a light to anything. Like these asbestos houses that have burnt have exploded now i thought asbestos was supposed to be sort of a bit of a bit of a fire a bit of a firewall um that's not my experience and and you know you can refer to the photograph that i've got of our house um and what was left of our house which was just a pile of smashed to pieces asbestos um do you, do you want to take a moment to look at that? Yeah, sure. Yep. Take a moment. So, house remains with asbestos debris. Yeah, so... Um, I've actually had a had a um, house burn down before, not in this type of event, but um, I was really hoping to salvage something out of that. And I I had firearms in a, a locked standard safe in there, um, which I was not able to access for months until April um, because of the presence of asbestos and, and the fact that I don't own the property um, and that I know about the danger of asbestos. So um, 
I was hoping when I went to the cleanup that we may have been able to find some small things, but and I did, but most of them were just totally destroyed, as you can see. Um, even crystal caverns that I had are actually that fragile that they're crumbling. So, yeah. Thank you. As part of the um, as part of the assistance, the resources that came onto the island, either during or possibly shortly after, I, I think the the Australian Defence Force came. Yes. Did you have any involvement? Would you like to describe that assistance? What you thought of it? Yeah. Um, look, I guess it, the the ADF were quite remarkable. Um, they did so much for the community. We didn't have them assist us per se because we didn't own the home that was lost and we had very minimal damage to our actual land. So we sort of let the people who really needed the assistance get the assistance and, and they put on concerts for the community. Um, they sang for us. Um, you know, they were really quite amazing. Everyone was amazing. Like the community, the local community was incredible. Um, the South Australian community was incredible. The Australian community was incredible. And even people from overseas, everybody loves Kangaroo Island. And every, they seem to love Australia, but Kangaroo Island really seemed to resonate with people from around the world. And I think it's largely to do with the connection with our beautiful wildlife and our wild places. Um, but it wasn't just the ADF, like there were so many local businesses, organisations, um, churches. We're still getting things arrive. Like last night I had delivered um, from the community down um, in the Limestone Coast, or the Narracore area, sorry, um, dunas for people who had lost their homes. Like. They've done this fundraiser, Dollars for Dunas, and they've bought everyone's who's, who's lost their homes, dunas and pillows. There's been so much kindness and support. People coming over doing free massages for people, you know, local beauticians doing pedicures. Like, it's just, I've never felt more like part of a community than what I do now. And I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, and... Honestly, the, the support has been overwhelming, like the Salvation Army, uh, Red Cross, you, you start naming them and you know you're going to upset someone, but there was so much support. There were issues, though. Um, do you want me to talk about yeah, that, some yes, of those now? Yeah, so um, one of the things I found quite stressful in the days that followed the, the Ravine fire um, it was great to have the community meetings, but we were really running on adrenaline and we were just at a, such a high level of stress and trauma. And when we went to the recovery centres or the relief centres, each time we went there, we had a different person meet us. They were all trying to help, but to have to relive that trauma every time you go in there, you can't remember which form you've filled out, what grant you've applied for, you're freaking out that you're gonna have to pay the money back if you duplicate the effort. It would be awesome to have like a database with everybody's name and details on it that whoever you talk to can access and a case manager straight away. I found out who my case manager is yesterday. I'm so excited, but I had phone calls that weren't returned from the, the recovery team. And then I had different people ringing me trying to touch base and I was out of range. And when I rang, it was someone else. And so just to have a case manager assigned to each family in need would really help navigate through those avenues of what you're entitled for, what you're not entitled for, um, where are you going to live. Just, I know it's a big, a big ask, but it would really help. Yeah. In terms of um, the effect on the community, are you able to talk at all about um, physical and mental health, the support that was offered, what the issues are? Yeah, so I guess um, 
I have been getting um, some help from um, a psychologist, which has been absolutely invaluable. But also um, we had Dr. Rob Gordon come over um, and present to a small group um, on how children respond to fire. And he also, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by a restless fly catcher that just flew to the window. <laughs> um, he came to talk to us about how we can support our children after fire trauma and he's had significant experience interstate with that. Um, and also he went into detail about the differences between men and women, I guess, and how they respond. We want to really worry about the kids, the kids who may um, have experienced the fire at its worst, the kids who in some cases their families have lost multiple homes and multiple properties, pets, like we had a fire plan, our pets, all but stick insects got rescued and Toby the turtle, turtle got left in his tank because he didn't like travelling in the car but Nigel did an emergency dash and managed to get him out because it was Jessica's Christmas present, which changed the series of events in a, in a good way. It put him out of a more dangerous situation and into a location where the wind changed early and the, the house he was trying to protect was saved. But then it took out our house, so there's a lot of hardened locals, you know, fifth generation islanders, um, crusty old farmers and, and crusty old tradesmen who don't need any help. We've got this. Um, and you just hope that they take the time to actually be good to themselves and, and to nurture their families and don't end up losing more. Um, Dr. Gordon said something which really stuck in my head and he compared the activities of a lot of men who have been fighting fires as the activities afterwards as being like epicormic activities. Now the epicormic growth is what a eucalypts and other native species do after a burn and they sprout out all these new leaves but unfortunately that doesn't mean the tree is going to survive. A lot of those branches will die and, and often the tree itself will die and that's what can happen to the family, I guess, of, of the men who don't take the time to actually slow down and, and you know, um, grieve, I guess, for what they've lost and face the trauma. Yeah. Would you mind talking for a bit about the long-term effect of the fires as you understand it to be on the natural environment? Yes. Do you want to go to any of your photos? Let, let's do that so you can show yep, us what sure. it looks like. Okay. Um, we're going to go to a photo that I took on a bus trip with the Friends of Parks, Kangaroo Island, uh, through Flinders Chase. And this is what was once um, our iconic national park. What you can see is that there are basically dunes of moonscape. So there's very little, little standing material. There's no seeds left on the charred sticks. Um, there's no seed that's fallen into the sand that's covered in ash. And it's likely due to the intensity of that fire that there has been burnt soil and seed stock in the soil for, for quite a depth. Now, even our local fungi expert um, is concerned that the colonising species of fungi, which help with regeneration, need to have plant matter to attach themselves in, in the soil. And there is very places where there is very, very little of that left. There are also places, more so in the Duncan fire footprint, where 
there are still lots of um, seeds that have cracked open um, and it was beautiful to see in those places the yellowtail black cockatoos feasting on the toasted hakeas and, and banksias and seeds that had been opened as nature intended by the fire dropped into the fertile ash bed and with the rains they will they will you know regenerate but in these very heavily burnt areas yes there is some recovery of eucalypts and yakas mostly but it's the loss of biodiversity that is the big concern it's those complex systems that support all of our lives the services that they provide um, you know from pollination through to clean air soil water you know keeping the moisture in the soil our pharmaceuticals all go back to these these things from nature i can't emphasize the importance of healthy functioning ecosystems enough um, we don't even know some of the species that could have been lost in this intense fire. We don't know how small populations have become, which will mean that they're not genetically viable to reproduce. I suspect we will lose species. There's a high level of endemism or things that are only found on Kangaroo Island, and it's highly likely that a lot of species will no longer have either the population size or the habitat to survive. Now, I may be being pessimistic, but um, I think I'm actually just being a realist from what I know about the importance of habitat. Thank you. Um, you spoke to the forum in some couple of months ago, early March, and we're now in May. Yep. How are you going since then? How's the community going since then? Is it What's changed? What's changed? really is the the big change is that it feels like because of the global pandemic that perhaps the fire um, and the climate change issue has been a little bit swept to the side and I understand the magnitude of um, COVID-19 um, and it really scares it scares everybody but I'm really concerned that um, a lot of the people who need assistance may be forgotten um, with the global pandemic. Uh, and it's also made it harder to engage with your social networks, obviously. You know, all the sports shut down, the very thing that holds our remoter communities together. They've lost their sports club. They were still out there training and then COVID-19 came. The support from the other clubs on the island has been amazing. They were letting us train at their facilities and now we don't have that. Hopefully we might get a season this year, but I think, you know, that isolation as well from others. So a lot of us were hermits anyway. That's why we want to live in the West End of Kangaroo Island because we actually prefer the natural environment to being in town. But you still value, you know, your support networks and the community when you do get together. And so that's been taken away. I worry that perhaps some of the promises that have been made um, by the overwhelming um, generosity of Australians may not come through. Things that, you know, have been promised to our children and, and that hopefully they're just on the back burner, but um, that's a really bad pun, sorry, but... Um, what, what kinds of things in particular are you thinking of? Oh, well, look, people have been incredibly generous with, with donating things. Um, and, and one of the things that our kids were promised were bikes. We got trampolines, which is incredible. Like, what a positive thing to give to a family, you know, a trampoline, the kids can burn off energy, it's healthy, it's fun. Um, yeah, a fantastic thing. Country kids and bikes, same deal. Um, but, you know, some of us haven't replaced bikes because they'd, they'd been said that they were going to be donated, which is amazing, and we didn't expect that. But it's just like, 
I understand if it can't happen, but maybe just let us know so we can go and try and prioritise getting bikes because getting these kids back into their normal routines is really important. Thank you. Um, we've covered a lot of things and your thoughts have been great to hear. Is there anything else that you'd like people know, to know about what could have been done better, either in a preparation sense or during the fires or afterwards? Um, yeah, look, one thing um, that really affected me personally was the fact that I um, couldn't I didn't know if I was going to be able to go through my house um, and as I said earlier I knew that there was a chance that there would be things that were salvageable and in fact um, I had a motorbike in the shed which was the shed was not asbestos um, it was an old triumph I've been hoarding it for years um, and it had sentimental value and it would have been great just to get the badge off it if it was still intact or at least to see that it wasn't so I'd been in liaison with um, SAPOL and forestry about negotiating to be at the house site when the cleanup occurred. That happened. I was advised and given a date, I had to change my work shift to be able to make it. When we got out there, the shed had already been removed. And so, you know, there was no chance to look for my late dad's tools. You know, Nigel didn't get to, to salvage anything from there. I didn't get my badge off my Triumph. Or we just didn't get to see because I think as hard as it was going through the asbestos debris and finding hardly anything, at least I know now what I haven't got. And when you haven't got very much, Having the opportunity just to see that for yourself, I think, is really important. That may not be important to everybody, but it was important to me. Um, <clears throat> I think that the housing pods that are being provided are really important, particularly for farmers to be able to be on their land, to be able to start cleaning up, repairing it's really hard and I know this from having a property that I don't live in for five years how hard it is to do stuff on your property when you don't live there and so much of the housing that is being kindly offered by the community often at no cost has been a long way away so those pods are really important I know a um, couple who had a conservation block, or they still do have a conservation block, right in the hottest part of the burn, who actually had accommodation at the east end of the island, but chose to go and live in tents and caravans on their property so that they could start to get their life back together. Now they've got a pod a week ago, and that's fantastic because it provides them with shelter from you know the big winds there's no shelter from vegetation anymore so the wind the rain the cold the hail um, 70 year old people really important to actually make sure that people have adequate housing um, so there's that I think taking advantage of the fact that um, we can manage pest plant and animals while there's so much um, open space. So um, when you open up areas to disturbance, weeds will get in. Um, very important to manage those. Feral animals are attracting now pigs and cats around the unburnt areas where the remnant populations, particularly threatened species, are sheltering. Very important that they are focused on. There's a big push in the community to review and overhaul the Native Vegetation Act. This is a huge concern. There is going to be so much competition for natural resources on our island in the future. The apiarists are going to want to put their honeybees on every last patch of native veg that produces flour. But these flowers also provide nectar for threatened species, pygmy possums, um, woodland birds, honey eaters. Um, you know, 
We need to make sure that there is a balance. We're going to have pressure to reduce the numbers of macropods because they're going to be competing with livestock for both pastures that are planted and feed as it comes back. Um, and so pushing down native vegetation is really a huge concern. There were areas during the fires of seven kilometres of roadside veg that was knocked down and just left laying. Next year that's going to be a, a fire hazard. Um, it's laying down now, it's at least providing some shelter and a corridor perhaps for ground-based species to move through. But um, yeah, I've got big concerns about how we balance the apiary industry with conservation goals. Um, also the tourism market, there's going to be the expectation by, by commercial operators to be able to access areas that are not burnt so then then opening up more wild places which is a big concern um, it's been a priority of um, the government for several years now to access all areas and to develop and put infrastructure into remote areas which is just fragmenting habitat so it's just this ongoing fragmentation of habitat that's happening so we need to actually use science based decision making to tackle climate change and to prepare Kangaroo Island and Australia for the future fires that will come along with climate change. Planning and development um, of building standards needs to be revised to ensure that settlements with only one way in and one way out are discouraged in the future rather than setting up housing in native vegetation, maybe we set up the house, housing in areas that actually already have a break around them. Um, yeah, um, we need to work together with the community to prepare for the future balancing environmental integrity, tourism, agriculture, social needs and the economy. Um, yeah. The Royal Commission has adjourned and will resume shortly.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr. Tokley, are we ready to proceed? We are uh, indeed, Chair. Um, Chair, the next special focus study is the Wollamai Pines in New South Wales, and Ms. Spees of Council will take the conduct of the next stage of evidence, which focuses on the Wollamai Pines. Ms. Spees. Commissioners, the next witness will be Mr. David Crust, who is the Park Operations Director for the Blue Mountains within the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. Mr. Crust was responsible for the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area during the 2019-2020 bushfires and the operation to protect the Wollamai Pines during those fires. The Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area was significantly impacted by the fires and we saw in the response to the notice to give by the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment, which was tendered this morning, that 82% of that World Heritage Area was burnt. The focus of Mr Crust's evidence today will be on the planning and operation in relation to the Wollamai Pines, rather than the fire management strategies and the impact on the area more generally. Mr Crust's evidence was tendered this morning and is behind tab F of the Commissioner's bundle. It is document, th document 3.5.1 to 3.5.1.16 of the exhibit list. I call Mr Crust. Mr. Crust will take an affirmation. Thank you. Mr. Crust, welcome. Mr. Crust, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Uh, I do. Thank you. Mr. Crust, uh, have you provided a witness statement to the Commission dated 25 May? 2020 under a notice issued by the Commission? Uh, yes, I have. And do you adopt that statement as true and correct? Uh, yes, I do. And uh, you are currently the Park Operations Director for the Blue Mountains within the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service? Uh, that's correct. And how long have you held that position for? Uh, I've been in that role since December 2016. And what was your position before that? Uh, prior to that, I was an area manager uh, as part of Blue Mountains region of the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service. And I was responsible for the management of Wollamai National Park and the Wollamai Pine populations. And how long did you manage um, that area for? <clears throat> um, for nearly 19 years, so a considerable period of time. Yes. And um, what's the conservation status of the Wollamai Pine? Uh, the Wollamai Pine's critically endangered, so it's uh, it's listed under the uh, the, the uh, Commonwealth and the state legislation as a critically endangered species, um, and it's it's obviously a highly significant species um, with uh, with less than less than a hundred mature plants um, um, surviving in the wild. Mm. And why is that species so significant? Um, it's significant because, um, A, um, there's very few of them left, um, but uh, I think probably most importantly, it was a species that was uh, known from fossil records and it was, um, it was known from the Jurassic period and thought to be well and truly extinct. Um, so its, it's rediscovery in 1994 was uh, an incredibly significant botanical find um, that's, um, that's drawn worldwide attention and uh, I, I guess it's given I, it iconic, iconic status in the, the, the eyes of the community. Mm. I understand that the location of the Wollamai Pines is confidential, so if any questions that I ask um, in the course of today would require you to disclose information about the location, uh, please just let me know and I'll, I'll see if I can re-ask the question in another way. I'll, uh, I'll certainly let you know. <laughs> um, so prior to the 2019-2020 uh, bushfire season, what long-term plans were in place uh, in relation to the protection of the Wollamai Pines? Um, there's a series of recovery plans that um, that have been developed to support the conservation of the species. So um, the first uh, recovery plan was completed in 2007. Um, there was a, oh, sorry, the first recovery plan was completed in 
1998, um, and then a revised plan was developed in 2007. Um, we're currently in the process of drafting a new recovery plan, and that should be available later this, uh, this calendar year. And who was involved in the development of the original recovery plan and in the, um, the further updates of that plan? Um, so we've uh, we've got a recovery team that's uh, responsible for providing expert advice on the management of the species, but also on developing recovery plans. So that recovery team includes um, scientists, ecologists, and botanists um, from uh, the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Service and the Science Division of um, the Department of Planning, Industry, and Environment. Um, it also includes field managers, so obviously myself um, and the area manager that's um, responsible for managing um, the population within Wollamai National Park. And have you been involved in the development of those recovery plans? Yeah, I have been. You know, I've, I've been involved in, uh, in managing the pines um, from 1997, um, including um, the development of the first recovery plan. And, um, you know, I'm still involved in that recovery team. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in your statement that the plan was adopted by New South Wales and the Commonwealth. Uh, where, where is the responsibility for the implementation of the plan? Uh, the implementation of the plan sits with the recovery team and the New South Wales National Parks and Wildlife Services, the manager of the, uh, the Wollamai Pine populations. And the, I understand, um, sorry, I withdraw that, in relation to the threats um, to the Wollamai Pines listed in the recovery plan, is fire listed in, in there as a threat? Uh, absolutely, yes. So fire's uh, always been considered one of the most significant threats to the, to the survival of the, the wild populations. Mm -hmm. And is it known whether, the, whether there have been any fires previously? Um, there's certainly evidence of fire impacts on the populations previously. So most of the mature trees um, in the wild populations have, uh, have got evidence of fire scars uh, on their bark. Um, it's, it's not completely clear how long since they've been impacted by fire or the intensity of that fire, but certainly um, work that's been done since their discoveries indicated that they have been impacted by, by fire in the past. So what actions were put in place to manage the threat um, of the fires to the Wollamai Pines? Um, so we have uh, uh, a couple of levels of um, fire planning uh, across all reserves uh, in, in New South Wales, um, but specifically for Wollamai National Park. Um, there's a detailed fire management strategy and then there's a series of more tactical operational fire planning documents um, that provide, uh, for, uh, provide for fire management across the whole park, but also in terms of protecting the Wollamai Pine populations. Um, as well as that, um, that detailed fire planning, um, there's a number of on-ground actions that have been implemented to help protect the Wollamai Pines. Um, so there's been a, uh, a regular program of prescribed burning in the vicinity of the Wollamai Pine populations to reduce fuels and to provide um, advantages for managing fires that might impact on those populations. And we also have a, 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 um, a rapid aerial response program uh, which we operate across many of our reserves, but, um, but targeting Wollamai uh, in particular, uh, where we have uh, very experienced remote area firefighters that are available to respond to remote area fire ignitions by helicopter. Mm -hmm. If I could uh, take you back to that highest level, which I think you mentioned was the, um, the Wollamai National Park Fire Management Strategy. Yep. Uh, who uh, developed that document? Uh, so the documents prepared by uh, by the National Parks branch. So we have a fire management team within the Blue Mountains branch that um, that's responsible for developing fire manage management strategies for all of our reserves, um, and they um, they've developed that strategy in consultation with the staff that are directly responsible for managing Wollamai National Park and the Wollamai Pines. Mm -hmm. Are any external agencies involved in developing that strategy or is it only um, the parks? Uh, no, absolutely. Um, so the, the strategies are, uh, 
uh, are shared with the district bushfire management committees and the rural fire service. Um, so they uh, they form part of the risk management plan um, for, for for fire districts um, as, as as they would for reserves across New South Wales. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you mentioned that there were um, some more tactical operational plans. If you could just tell me a little bit about them. Sorry, tell the Commission a little um, bit. So there's a detailed, certainly, yeah. So there's a, there's a series of detailed uh, operational strategies which are based on maps um, that are available for all of the reserve and, and all of the reserves across New South Wales. Um, those... Um, those detailed um, plans are, are reviewed regularly. Um, they include information on uh, assets at risk, both ecological and built assets. Uh, they include detail on fire history, uh, where prescribed burns have occurred. Um, they provide um, detail around the fire management advantages that are available to help suppress fire. So things like fire trails, um, rainforest gorges, um, asset protection zones and that sort of thing. Um, and some detailed guidelines that guide um, suppression operations across the whole reserve. I might ask for one of those maps to be brought up on the screen that you've provided to us. It's document PIN 5010012224. And Mr Crust, that's yep. um, referred to as document 1.4 in your statement and commissioners, it's tab F3. Now, I don't think anyone is going to be able to read that on the screen, given it's, I assume, intended to be blown up very large. But if you could just speak to generally uh, what are the different aspects that are covered by these maps? I can't, I, I can't see the map <laughs> particularly well, but I can... I can You're I not can Robinson Caruso there. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thanks, Commissioner. Um, so these, these, um, these operational plans are a standard template format that we use in South Wales. So I think there's, there's over, over 800 of these, uh, of these plans available. And then depending on the size of the reserve, they could be broken down into smaller chunks. Um, in the case of Wallamai National Park, because it's a very large national park, it's almost 500,000 hectares. From memory, I think there are 12 of these maps that cover the entire park. Um, so what it does do it, it, it provides um, it provides a map uh, which uh, which details the vegetation communities across the park. Um, it provides uh, some detail around fire history, and I think on the big map in the middle, I can see a hatched area, and that would indicate an area that had been burnt previously and from memory I suspect it was probably a fire that occurred in the park in 2009. Um, it provides detail on the fire trails across the reserve and the classification of those fire trails, whether they're dormant, strategic, important or essential fire trails and what sort of vehicles or firefighting appliances that they're, uh, they're suitable for. Um, it would provide some information around the fire status and the thresholds of those vegetation communities across the park. So it would indicate how frequently um, those vegetation communities had been burned and whether they were within or outside of uh, the acceptable parameters um, for fire threshold for those communities. Mm. It's got some more detailed operational information. So it's got things like contact numbers for uh, other fire agencies, for the Rural Fire Service, for the fire control centres. It's probably got contact details for key neighbours. Um, it would typically show um, the location of, of some threatened species, but certainly not the Wallamai pines. Um, it, it would show the location of uh, historic heritage uh, items that could potentially be threatened by fire and would show the location of um, Aboriginal cultural heritage items that could potentially be impacted by fire or fire suppression operations. Um, so that's, um, and, I, and I guess the other thing that we go to is the fire management to, to, uh, to fire management across all of the reserves in New South Wales. Mr Crass, um, I might just stop you there. Um, we lost half of your sentence. If you wouldn't mind just repeating um, what you said there. 
Um, so it would also provide information on the fire management zones across the reserve. Um, so it's got things like contact numbers for uh, other fire. Thank you. Um, so, so it appears you phoned uh, a friend there, uh, Mr. Cross. Was that what it was? <laughs> yep. Um, so um, all of our reserves are broken down into fire management zones, either asset protection zones, strategic fire advantage zones or land management zones that all have different management objectives and different management prescriptions um, from a fire management perspective and the, um, the, uh, the fire management strategies would detail that. Thank you. And so does this help you to assist, um, does this assist you to determine uh, what priorities to give for protection, for example, to threatened species? To fire management across all of the reserves in New South Wales. If I I'm might ask you to stop there just for a moment, Mr Cross, we're having a little bit of te technical difficulty. It, it sounds like sure. you might be having a 60 second delay uh, of the of what you're saying to us. Is there, if there's someone in the room or if you've got it playing, it sounds like that's what's what's coming through. If not, we will check it. No, look, I'm uh, I'm all by myself, but um, <laughs> I think I think um, I think the New South Wales Council's in another room. I think they are. They've popped up a couple of times on the bottom of the screen, so uh, it might be feedback through them. Not sure. We'll just chase it up for a second. Thank you. Mr. Crust, are you playing the webcast in your room where you are at the moment at all? Uh, no. No. Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. Mm. Mm. We, we might continue, and if the problem continues, we'll, we'll pause again. Um, sure. I'm going to now move to asking you about the 2019-2020 bushfire season. At what stage did you realise that there might be a threat to the Wollamai Pines? I think we were uh, we were aware quite early in the season that conditions were extraordinarily dry um, and that um, we were quite clearly facing uh, a serious fire season. Um, there were a number of ignitions across the park from late October onwards. And I think pretty well from that period onwards, we, uh, we knew that there was potentially a threat to the Wollamai Pines. And I guess we, uh, we started to make preparations based on that. So what were those first steps in preparation that you put in place at that stage? Um, well, look, obviously we had fire operations going through a number of incident management teams uh, right across the park and across across my operational branch. Um, you know, following following those initial ignitions, we start to, to think about um, options to uh, protect the site, including the installation of irrigation systems. Uh, we identified some key personnel that would be involved in those operations, and um, we organised an uh, inspection. We organised an inspection of the Wallamai Pines sites to do an assessment of just how dry the fuels were and also to try and get an idea of how much water was available on the site. And you mentioned you put together a team. Uh, who was that team comprised of? Uh, the team involved um, a number of people from our science division uh, who were also members of the recovery team and had been involved in uh, research and management operations at the Wallamai Pine site um, and some experienced local staff. So it was a, a mix of people from across um, DPI or the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. And how did that um, strategy that you put in place at the start build on previous plans um, in relation to fire management? Um, you know, look, there's, um, there's been fires in the park uh, that have uh, potentially threatened the pines um, over the 20 odd years that I've been involved. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, 
this season things were um, different in terms of dryness. Um, we'd been through an exercise of, um, of obviously thinking about and documenting how we would approach uh, managing fire as it approached the site. Um, you know, we'd organised equipment previously and we developed strategies to uh, to install irrigation systems on the site. Um, what was different this time is there was no running water on the site. Um, and there was uh, there was basically just a couple of small pools of water that were available for uh, for uh, for uh, for pumping through an irrigation system. I think the other constraint that we uh, that we had to consider too was that there were um, extensive areas of fire across the state. There were a number of significant fire op operations going on. Uh, uh, and we, the availability of resources was going to be constrained. So how were those uh, resources coordinated or prioritised between the different operations that were underway? Uh, so resourcing is um, coordinated pretty well at a statewide level. So, I mean, we obviously ended up in a situation where a large proportion of the state was involved in Section 44 fires, so state of emergency fires that were under the control of the Rural Fire Service Commissioner. Um, the, the relative prioritisation of those fire operations and, and, and the resources that are allocated to them uh, are undertaken by, by the State Operations Coordination Centre um, uh, with the RFS at, uh, at Homebush and we're obviously as an agency involved in that process. What I might do now is I propose to play an edited extract of footage that has been provided by the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment of the operation um, in relation to the Wollamai Pines. And that, uh, that footage is uh, at exhibit 3.5.3. Uh, Mr. Crust, um, what I might do is um, ask you to speak to a number of those different elements of the operation. Um, perhaps sure. first if you can, can explain um, why there was someone um, going up and down in a helicopter. 
Um, so the site's uh, located in an extremely remote and rugged area of the park, and basically the only um, reasonable access in a situation like that is via helicopter. So um, we, uh, all of the firefighting operations and most of the pre-fire impact irrigation operations involved uh, winching uh, national parks remote area firefighters um, into the site. Um, so uh, we uh, we uh, every every day we uh, while well, we could while visibility and conditions allowed uh, we winched a team of parks firefighters um, into the pine site um, to operate the irrigation equipment. So uh, like I said before, the water availability was really limited. We could run the pumps for about two two and a half hours before the water sources were depleted. Um, so the crews went in each day and and, and went through that operation. Operation and then were winched out uh, by helicopter at the end of the operation. And what was the purpose of the pumps? Uh, the pumps were uh, uh, about supplying water irrigation system. Um, the irrigation system was set up so that um, the majority of the mature trees at the main Wollamai Pine site uh, could be watered and the intent of that watering was to increase the moisture content of the fuels on the site so that it was less likely to burn effectively or if it did burn, um, to burn with a re reduced intensity so that the impact on the trees would be minimised. Mm -hmm. I might ask for a, a photograph that you supplied to be brought up. It's in document PIN 5010010211 and it's at page 0215. If you're able to describe to the commissioners what's in that photo. So that's a helicopter, that's a Black Hawk helicopter, um, water bucketing um, the fire as it approaches the gorge that the Wollamai Pines are in. Um, and the intent of that operation was to try and try and stop the fire as much as possible uh, penetrating into the rainforest gorge um, and impacting on the trees. Um, so, uh, you know, we had uh, we had two helicopters effectively that spent several days um, above the Wollamai Pine sites, um, strategically water bucketing fire as it um, as it approached the, the, the cliff edges um, to reduce the potential of the fire dropping into the gorge. And were any other aerial assets used in the operation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, there were there were sort of three helicopters that were pro primarily involved, um, and their roles were to uh, fly in equipment um, to winch in the national parks remote area firefighters um, to undertake strategic water bucketing that you can see from there, um, and obviously to provide um, intelligence and information on the fire progression. The other significant aerial assets that were used were the LATs and the VLATs, so the large aerial tankers and the very large aerial tankers, um, which were utilised to drop retardant um, uh, as the fire approached the Wollamai Pines in an attempt to either stop it or reduce its, its rate of progression and, and the intensity that it burned into the Wollamai Pine sites. And who was responsible for determining um, how the aerial assets were used and um, what operations were undertaken? Um, so in New South Wales, um, there's a, a state air desk, which again operates out of the Rural Fire Service State Operations Control Centre. Um, it's an interagency air desk, so it includes representatives from all of the firefighting authorities. Um, the state air desk is responsible for, I guess, prioritising and tasking aerial assets to fire operations across the state. Um, the actual on-ground management of those resources uh, is generally uh, the responsibility of the incident management team that's responsible for that particular fire. And within that structure of that incident management team, there would be an operations section, um, which would include an air operations manager and an air attack supervisor that, um, that coordinated and controlled um, the aerial operations over the fire ground. I might turn to the air attack supervisor who, from your statement, I understand was um, from the US, is that correct? 
Mike. Yes, Mike was from the US. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how did that come about that he was involved in the operation? Um, well, there was a large deployment of North America firefighters to uh, to Australia and to New South Wales. So I, I, from memory, I think there was well over 200. Um, a number of those um, firefighters were allocated to the incident management team that was responsible for fires in Wollamai National Park. Um, I think there was there was operations officers, there was planning officers, and there was air attack supervisors. They were all uh, very experienced staff. Um, I think the majority of them were from the US Forest Service. And, uh, and Mike, the American air attack supervisor, was, um, was one, of those, um, one of those people. And uh, was he familiarised with the Australian environment and uh, the Blue Mountains National Park? Uh, he was familiarised very quickly. Uh, Mike, Mike was a pretty experienced air attack supervisor. I, 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 I took him out personally, so I, uh, I put him in a helicopter. Um, and uh, took him out. I, I orientated him um, um, in terms of the, the broader fire operations, but more specifically, I showed him where the Wallamai Pines were. I, uh, I talked him through strategies that, that, that we had um, developed and were proposing to use and made sure that he was comfortable and familiar with those. Um, I, uh, I, I, I gave him a crash course um, in Australian fire suppression operations and gave him a crash course in, um, in fire behaviour in Australian vegetation communities and, um, and then I left him to it. So what were the main impediments to the operation to protect the Wollamai Pines? Uh, look, I think that the main impediments um, were, were, were largely environmental. So, you know, look, um, this incredible dryness. Um, so we, uh, we saw fire behaviour um, that we wouldn't normally see. We saw fire burn in areas where it wouldn't normally burn. Um, the Wollamai Pines are in a very deep rainforest gorge that, um, that normally wouldn't be penetrated by fire. You know, under, under normal circumstances, you know, we'd be using that gorge as a containment line to help to contain a larger fire. So I, I think that's probably the primary issue. Um, we, we, we obviously had um, difficult weather. We had very high temperatures. We had exceptionally low humidities. Um, and we had, uh, we had strong winds um, for the duration of the operation. Um, so, you know, as a result, the forest fire danger um, indexes for that period were exceptionally high and, and, and certainly higher than has been recorded in the last 50 odd years. Um, smoke was a major constraint for us. So, um, you know, obviously it was a highly uh, aviation dependent operation and relying on access by, by the fixed wing air tankers and also helicopters. And um, repeatedly um, the site was uh, smoked out and we couldn't get um, access due to poor visibility. We often had to wait, you know, all day and, and then when the winds picked up or changed and we had a, you know, a clearing of the smoke, we had a small window to get into the site and operate the irrigation gear or do suppression work or water bombing work. So that was a major constraint. Um, and, and obviously, you know, across New South Wales, and uh, uh, resources were constrained. You know, there was lots of there. competing demands. Um, yep. Um, the video is breaking up a little bit. Um, you, you said across New South Wales and then the rest of your sentence cut out. If you wouldn't mind just repeating that. Yep. So, I mean, across New South Wales, there was an incredible level of fire activity and there were obviously competing demands for, for firefighting resources. Um, so, you know, that was, um, that was, that was a constraint, obviously. Um, uh, then I might take you next back to the series of photographs, um, which sure. was document PIN 501. 10010211 and a photograph at page 0217. The photograph at the yep. top of the page there. If you could just tell me a little bit about what we're seeing here. 
Um, so this is a shot of um, the mature uh, Wallamai pines at, uh, at site one following the fire. So you can see there's a, a little bit of scorch um, in the lower canopies of the trees. Um, you know, pretty well all of the upper canopies of, uh, of the trees at all the sites uh, was, was not impacted by fire, but um, to a varying degree, some of the lower canopies were, were impacted. And you can, you can see the brown scorch quite clearly in that image. And in the footage that we saw earlier, uh, in the middle, middle of the footage, there, was there a, a video of the fire moving through the pines? Yeah, so um, the crews that were operating on the ground set up a monitoring camera. So um, they did that obviously prior to the fire impact. So it, it recorded the progression of fire through the site, uh, which was uh, which was interesting. That happened at night mainly. Um, so um, that um, that footage is a, an interesting record. Mm. If I might uh, then move to the photograph at the bottom, bottom of that page two one seven and ask you to describe to the commissioners what that photo shows. Um, so this is a, an aerial image of the, the, the gorge um, where the Wallamai pine um, populations uh, are mainly located. Um, so what you can see obviously is a fairly intensely burnt area either side of the gorge. So that's, um, that's obviously drier, more exposed vegetation. Um, but the most important thing here is the rainforest gorge that the pines are located in. The canopy is intact, so the canopy is green. Um, what, what, what the image doesn't show is most of the understory below the canopy did burn. Um, with uh, with varying degrees of intensity, but um, but the important thing here is the the actual canopy of the the populations is intact, and you know that's the most significant contribution towards the survival of the plants. If the um, if the canopy had burnt, uh, you know the results would have been catastrophic. And then on the next page of that document, page zero two one eight. Uh, I understand this is the post-fire assessment team. Uh, yep, I think so. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, that's a team on site post-fire doing assessments. Um, mm -hmm. So as as soon as we could, uh, following the fire impact, um, when it was safe to do so. Uh, the, um, we, we, we put a, a, a team of uh, scientists um, into the population to do an assessment of, uh, of the impacts in terms of uh, the areas that burnt, um, the intensity of those burns um, and the impacts on the, the plants. And um, that was the basis for uh, a rapid initial assessment of, uh, of, uh, of the impacts on the species. And are the impacts known or is it still too early to tell? Um, look, I, I, you know, this is obviously the first time that um, that fires impacted on the site since their discovery. So, yeah, this is new territory for us from a science point of view. Um, you know, the longer term impacts are going to take us a while to, uh, to, to get a handle on. Um, you know, I would have thought probably four or five years before we've got a really clear idea of what the what the longer term mortality is is going to is going to be of individual uh, trees within the population. But look, you know, in the short term, it looks like the sites are generally okay. Uh, most of the mature trees were impacted by fire, but appear uh, to have survived. Um, there's a couple of trees that were impacted by fire that was quite intense, but also impacted by rockfall um, from surrounding areas and from other trees falling over, uh, which had the had the effect of, of, of damaging, you know, branches and stripping bark, uh, which, um, which we'll have to see how they recover in the long term. But the most significant impact is, you know, most of the juvenile plants um, across all the sites around about 200 um, juvenile plants of sort of, you know, two to four or five metres uh, were impacted by fire. Um, it looks like that there's been um, quite a bit of mortality uh, amongst 
those juvenile plants, but many of them are actually re-sprouting now. So we're just going to have to wait and see what the long-term impacts are and, and if, those, if those individual plants do re-sprout and survive. <clears throat> Commissioners, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. Dr Cross, thank you for that. And uh, I think there's a lot that uh, can be taken out of it. And in fact, well done to your team. Uh, I think uh, in the in the conditions, from what we've seen, you've done a fantastic job. Um, the first question I had you answered was: this the first time you enacted the plan? And uh, this looks like the first time you have enacted the plan. Just confirm that for me, please. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I mean they've been, you know, there's been fires in the vicinity of the the populations previously. Yeah. But the first time we've actually had to enact the plan. All right, and so. With that, and going to uh, it's para 53 of your statement, which, and I'll read it, it's an imperative that further fires are excluded from the four sites for an extended period, brackets, decades, to enable post-fire recovery and re-establishment of the juvenile plants. The question for you is, do you have a plan? How do you have a plan to protect them for decades? Um, yeah, look, we've got the start of a plan. So, you know, obviously we're reviewing all of our fire management strategies for all of our fire impacted areas. Um, the Wallamai Pine is obviously going to have um, some very special attention, but, um, you know, in, in the immediate period, um, the, 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 the broader area is being burnt. So for the next four or five years, there won't be um, any any significant fire threat. Um, the challenge will be for us after that period, um, how we manage fire into the future. And we're gonna be highly reliant on our rapid initial attack remote area response teams um, in terms of suppressing um, remote area fire ignitions across across the national park. Um, but also at some point we would be looking to start to reintroduce prescribed burning across the landscape to help to protect the pine populations. Okay, and another question, the, the international participants in the response, is there a recognised cert certification standard for international air attack supervisors and fire controllers and the like, or do you give them a quick on the job training or how does that work? <laughs> Oh, look, interestingly, most of our training and accreditation matches up pretty well. I mean, there there isn't specifically an international standard, but um, but we we have a very similar approach. We have very similar systems, and you know, I have to say, it's remarkably it's remarkably easy the transition from fire management in Australia to North America. And um, you know, those guys certainly had a baptism of fire, but they um, they rose to the challenge, and they did they did fantastically well. Thanks. Thank you for that. One final question in para 8, uh, which is page 0234 of your statement in subpara A, sorry, subpara B, you talk about uh, rapid error response teams uh, providing a quick response to the ignitions uh, are cr critical to this. And we often hear comment about early attack of a fire is the best way to, to uh, contain a fire. Um, Oh, was that a lesson learned out of this on such a broad broad scale? Did that rapid attack work in areas in attempting to protect the Wallamai Pines? Oh, look, at a broader level, it absolutely worked. Um, you know, um, across the Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, there were 50-something ignitions this season. Um, 20 of those ignitions were contained to around about, well, an average of less than 1.2 hectares. Um, and that made a significant contribution to um, areas not burning within the World Heritage Area, but also in terms of slowing the progression of the development of the broader fires. So look, it was it was a successful strategy. Um, unfortunately, this year conditions were such that it was exceptionally dry and it was exceptionally hard to get fires out and, and resource availability was, compri was, was, was constrained, particularly the availability of helicopters. Yeah, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll just appreciate that because that's obviously a, that's often a discussion point about uh, that that rapid attack and whether it's effective or not. So I appreciate the the evidence you've given in specific cases here. What I'll do is I'll I'll go to Commissioner McIntosh first, and then I'll go to Commissioner Bennett for a couple of questions, and then we'll need to finish up. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Crust. Um, you just said then, in terms of reintroducing fire into the landscape, that. Um, 
that you wait sort of five years and you're introducing the landscape. When you say that, do you mean that you'll be concentrating those fuel management activities in the immediate proximity around the Wollamai Pines, or do you mean a broader strategy, strategy of introducing fire across the landscape um, away from the pines in order to give you some sort of tactical or strategic advantage during fire events? Uh, look, both of those approaches. So certainly, you know, we'll uh, we'll be looking to reintroduce prescribed burning um, for for asset protection right across our reserves, but also to protect particular ecological communities. Um, and um, and like I said, I would have thought in the next five to six years we'd be looking at um, looking at doing some burning in the vicinity of the Wallamai pine population specifically. Thanks very much. Um. Thanks. I just have one question. I mean, you referred to the fact, of course, that there are competing demands, and this yep. seemed to be quite a resource-intensive exercise, both in the lead-up and, you know, the management. I was just wondering, I mean, can you give me an idea of, of how many different sort of sites in New South Wales would have this pre-planned application of, of that sort of intensive plan and resource application um, uh, and, and did you find during the recent bushfires that you were able to apply those teams and those resources to such identified, all, all such identified um, uh, locations? Uh, look, you know, <laughs> obviously it was an incredibly challenging season. Oh, I know. You know prioritising, prioritising life and property um, asset protection over ecological protection is always a challenge and a balance. Um, you know, I think generally all of the IMTs um, took into consideration the importance of protecting those sort of natural values and cultural values. Um, and look, I mean, I, 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 there's no simple answer to that. I mean, it's a difficult prioritisation process. You know, obviously we were very focused on the Wollamai Pines because of their significance but also their iconic status. Um, but certainly there were other sites across New South Wales in our national parks where we had a focus on um, protecting threatened species, threatened communities and, 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 and cultural assets uh, wherever we possibly could. So just thinking about, say, ecological and cultural assets at the moment, um, does you, yeah. do you do have a series of such plans in place that you uh, bring to bear in, 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 that you're able to bring to bear then in a situation such as this? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, our fire management planning that, that we ran through before, you know, obviously considers natural and cultural values. And, and, and in some cases, like the Wallamai Pine, there are more detailed, specific plans in place for, uh, for fire protection for those sorts of assets. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Cross, that's that's the the questions. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And uh, it was a detailed uh, discussion. We appreciate you fitting in at the time that we uh, that we had. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you, commissioners. Yeah, Spies. Um If there are no further questions, <clears throat> might Mr. Cross be excused? Mr. Cross can be excused. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to the next topic, commissioners, I'd like to draw to your attention. Um, that the New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment provided a response to a notice to give issued by the Commission. That is document 3.5.2 and is at tab F18 of the Commissioner's Bundle. Uh, that response explains that the New South Wales um, Parks and Wildlife Service is undertaking a series of after action reviews uh, to improve land and conservation management in the aftermath of the fire season. Thank you for that. Just no noted that. It'd be interesting to see how they do that and also protect the location of the, the plants at the same time. Yeah. Mr. Tokley. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Chair. Uh, Chair, the next special focus study is the Eastern Bristle Bird. And for that purpose, we have two witnesses who will be giving their evidence concurrently. Uh, Dr. Rowan Clark, who is an ornithologist, and Miss Kylie White, who is from the department in Victoria. Uh, I would call uh, Dr. Rowan Clark and Miss Kylie White. Mr. Clark, Miss White, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate that. Uh, pleasure. Likewise. And, and the evidence will be taken by my, myself and also Miss Amber Parthi. 
Um, uh, Dr. Clark, I might start with you first of all. Uh, will you take an oath or affirmation? Uh, an affirmation. Dr. Clark, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Dr. Clark, you've provided a witness statement dated the 19th of May 2020 under a notice issued by the Commission. And do you adopt that statement as true and correct? I do. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, that statement is Exhibit 3.7.1, and it's behind tab H of your bundle. And Ms. White, will you take an oath or affirmation? Affirmation, thank you. Ms. White, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. White, I understand the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning has provided a response dated the 19th of May 2020 to a notice issued by the Commission and the response comprises a written response together with a bundle of photographs. That's correct. Yes. And the Commissioners, the response is at Exhibit 6.6.1 and the bundle of photographs is Exhibit 3.6.2 and those documents can be found behind tab G of your bundle. Mm. Uh, we might begin, if it's all right with you, Ms. White, with Dr. Clark. Uh, Dr. Clark, you're a senior lecturer and the head ornithology and conservation management research group at the School of Biological Science in Monash University, Victoria? Yes. Yes, that's correct. And uh, I would like to begin with you Dr. Clark, if you could just give or assist the commissioners to have an understanding of the eastern bristle bird, its characteristics and behaviour, um, and then we'll move on to its habitat. Mm. Yeah, sure. So um, the eastern bristle bird is a, a small bird. Um, it's a, a ground foraging bird, and it's about um, 20 centimetres long. Um, so it's not that large at all. Uh, it's brown and drab, um, so um, no striking sort of plumage features. And um, it's relatively cryptic, so it spends most of its time um, foraging on the ground or near the ground. Um, the, it, it's also quite a secretive species, so um, we tend not to see it that frequently. And, and most of um, our detections and observations are based on its call. So it has a, a very loud and distinctive uh, metallic call. So uh, when we're searching for it and when we're surveying it, um, we're typically listening for that call. And that, that can be really important in terms of detection, but also, as I'll talk about a little bit later, um, the, the survey technique and, and for capturing. Um, because it's uh, a ground forager, uh, it's also quite a, a weak flyer. Uh, so it's not a bird that you would ever expect to see flying overhead like you might a, a pigeon or a magpie. And, and rather, um, typically when you do see it, it's, it's flushing and flying ahead of you low to the ground and, and seeking cover. And because of those attributes, it means that it's particularly susceptible to fire because it's got um, you know, relatively few opportunities to flee. Uh, and in the event of a large fire, we would expect that, that most birds um, ahead of a fire front um, of this species would succumb to that. I might just ask for a photograph. Um, to be, I'm sorry, Dr. Clark, I interrupted you. I might just ask for no, a go on. photograph to be brought up so you can identify the bristle bird. If we could please have um, document number DELW500 stop 001 stop 0019. And commissioners, that's behind tab G number one. And Dr. Clark, I take that's a photograph of an eastern bristle bird. Mm. Uh, that's right. Um, that's actually my hands and my jacket in the background as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I, I, the, is the eastern bristle bird an endangered species? Uh, it is. So um, it's listed as um, both nationally endangered under the EPVC Act, um, but it's also considered uh, endangered in all three states in which it occurs. So uh, it occurs in uh, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, uh, fairly much hugging the eastern seaboard. 
uh, listed as endangered in New South Wales and Queensland and uh, considered threatened under the FFG Act, which is essentially the highest rating that exists in, in Victoria as well. And is it endangered because of its po low population numbers? Uh, so the the population is quite small. Um, it's estimated to be somewhere around uh, 2,000 to 2,400 for the, the global population. Um, and the population is divided into three subpopulations. So uh, there's a small population uh, on the Queensland, New South Wales border, uh, which we refer to as the northern population. There's about 30 birds there. There's a central population from about Wollongong um, south to about Jarvis Bay where the majority of birds persist and then there's a southern population which is um, Nadji Nature Reserve um, on the New South Wales border and then just on the south side of the New South Wales um, Victorian border um, there's Howe Flat and um, there's birds at Howe Flat as well. So the southern population is about 140 to 160 birds in Victoria and a similar number, perhaps slightly more, prior to the 2019-2020 fires on the New South Wales side of that. And could you describe its habitat, please? Mm. Yeah, so the um, habitat is uh, low, dense cover. Um, it seems to be a, a key requirement for the species that um, the, the vegetation between um, ground level and, say, waist height is, is dense. Uh, it can occupy anything from um, sedge lands and heath lands through to dense grass. Uh, and in some areas, particularly those on the Great Dividing Range, it has an overstory of eucalypts, but in most of the coastal sites, um, the vegetation is simply the low heath um, or sedge land structure that the bird occupies. Thank you. Um, now, you've mentioned already, I think, that the, the bird is regarded as an endangered species under both state and Commonwealth legislation. That's right. And we, we might now go to Kylie White, because I believe that Kylie will be able to speak about some plans uh, that are in existence to, for the protection of the bird and the like. Mm. Kylie? Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Ms White, are you able to speak to the plans and strategies uh, that were in place prior to the 2019 and 2020 bushfire season to manage or respond to fire that may threaten the eastern bristlebird population in Far East Gippsland? There are three key plans or strategies for the eastern bristlebird uh, that existed prior to uh, the fires of 1920. The Ecological Fire Management Plan for Eastern Bristlebird was completed in December 2019. And a National Recovery Plan for the Eastern Bristlebird uh, was prepared in 2012, in which Victoria participated in that. And there is an action statement under the Victorian legislation uh, for the Eastern Bristlebird completed in 1999. Now, I can see from your statement that you have identified that the National Recovery Plan, uh, which was developed under the EPBC Act, was prepared by the New South Wales Office of Environment and Heritage and the um, Victoria participated in that process. Could you tell me a little bit about why it was a joint um, effort and how that coordination um, came about? The recovery plan is uh, a requirement of the EPBC Act and as the uh, eastern bristlebird occurred across multiple jurisdictions, uh, there meant that Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland input uh, was put into that recovery plan together with the Commonwealth uh, Department of Environment. And, and was that coordinated by New South Wales or was it a jointly coordinated effort across the three states? New South Wales took on the responsibility of preparing uh, the document, so writing that, but it was, of course, coordinated with the other states and the Commonwealth and a variety of uh, experts uh, that could contribute to the recovery plan. So New South Wales took the lead. Okay. And in terms of the practical activities, were there any undertaken to mitigate bushfire risk to this particular population? of eastern bristle birds prior to the 2019-2020 bushfires? As I mentioned, the uh, ecological fire management plan was prepared in December, so just prior to the 2019. 
fires. So uh, it had not had a chance to be promulgated wi widely or uh, to have the actions contained within it um, uh, put in place. Uh, prior to that, there had been quite a lot of consideration from the department experts as well as others about uh, how it would be best to protect the eastern bristle bird, noting that it had been protected for some time due to its location. It's bordered by Mallacoota Inlet uh, to the west, uh, Lake Barracuda to the south uh, and east and uh, has rainforest uh, gullies to the north. So it had been largely protected uh, in that way for many decades. Uh, considerations around options about, uh, for fuel reduction burning or ecological burning had not been pursued given that the uh, environment was very fire prone and there was a very small habitat area and being able to ensure the fire didn't damage the habitat and therefore the small population had not been pursued. Thank you. Excuse me for one moment. So, Ms. White, if I can now take you, please, to the um, period leading into um, the 2019-2020 bushfires, in particular the fires in January, could you please um, explain to the commissioners that the, the process that your department went through in early January regarding assessment um, and prioritisation of um, threats to uh, biodiversity values in that area? Uh, early in January, it uh, became apparent that uh, the fire severity and extent of fires in Victoria, such that large areas of uh, forested areas had already been burnt, but were likely or could have the potential to be burnt with the summer and the prevailing weather conditions um, continue. And with fires Matt. both north and south of the New South Wales and South Australian um, border, uh, the New South Wales and Victorian border, uh, staff in uh, my department and in conjunction with our partner agencies, including Parks Victoria and Zoos Victoria, uh, commenced some analysis of what are the environmental values that may be impacted as the fires um, progressed, particularly as those fires progressed in East Gippsland, which is known for its high flora and fauna values. So early in January, some analysis was uh, undertaken utilising uh, some of the data that we hold in our department uh, using our expertise at Arthur Isler Institute, which is an environmental institute within the department. And we started to understand what were the likely impacts range of species uh, due to the fires. And in that analysis, in that early analysis, the eastern bristle bird, with the characteristics that Dr Clark has just outlined, became a focus of our attention. And could you explain uh, a little bit more as to why the bristle birds were identified as a, as a priority concern? The population of eastern bristle birds uh, at the Howe Flat is the only population that exists in Victoria. And that small area in the far east uh, is, is, if you like, the, if like our stronghold. And so noting that, um, as, Mr, as Dr Clark has outlined, that this is a bird that pre prefers low heathland areas and that it doesn't fly. Uh, it um, and because of its small numbers and only one occurrence in Victoria, with all of those features or characteristics, it came to um, our attention as being at very high risk of fire should the wildfires uh, continue into the far east of the state. Once that prioritisation exercise was done or assessment and prioritisation, what was the next step that took place? Following that initial prioritisation, and there were a range of both flora and fauna species identified as being at risk, but because of the characteristics of the eastern bristlebird in particular, 
Uh, we then commenced uh, a more in-depth planning uh, phase. So by the, about the middle of January, we had brought together experts from Zoo Vic Zoos Victoria um, who had commenced conversations with other experts that exist in other zoos, such as and uh, Wildlife Sanctuary um, and experts such as Dr Clark were also contacted as we started to build the planning arrangements around how could we and at what stage would we consider an extraction of the eastern bristle birds based on fire risk. We started to build that plan out um, to better understand logistics, uh, how we would be able to keep the personnel safe, given that it was um, extremely dangerous and that there were fires still burning out of control in the region. And then we also need to understand the implications of a very small population of birds. And if we were going to extract those um, some birds, what number would that be and how would we go about it to ensure their safety as well? So I understand that a seven-day plan was created. Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, a seven-day plan uh, which identified a range of environmental uh, issues that had strategic importance was prepared. And this was updated on a daily basis. And in that seven-day plan, uh, it outlined um, the operational details of what extraction would look like, including things such as um, being able to get the crews into a very remote part of uh, Victoria to be able to undertake uh, the extraction work. Um, we need to think about the numbers of people we'd need to move, the kind of expertise, uh, the kinds of uh, vehicles that would be able to get into such a remote place. And so considerations along those lines started to progress at pace uh, during those weeks leading to the end of January. And was it at that point that you identified um, the various uh, vehicles that and modes of transport that were going to be needed to be engaged to be able to undertake this operation? Uh, yes, and that was uh, a critical part of being able to um, successfully extract the eastern bristle birds from their habitat on the on Howe Flat. It's more than 500 kilometres away from Melbourne. It, as I described its location earlier, it's bounded by Mallacoota Inlet and Lake Barracoota, and there are not a lot of um, tracks or roads into the area. So we had to think of a variety of ways uh, we had a team of experts, including Dr Clark, based in Melbourne, uh, which we needed to um, be able to get on site. Uh, and they had equipment and they needed to be prepared. Originally, we planned them to be prepared to be away for five or six days in order to do uh, the um, capture and then um, be able to uh, transport them back to Melbourne Zoo. So we had to think about the ways in which we would uh, be able to uh, get the equipment and the people on site. The State Control Centre was approached in order to um, uh, I'd, uh, or to uh, seek the appropriate uh, aircraft, which was decided that that was the best way to be able to transport people down and to also transport the birds back to Melbourne Zoo, where they would then be released and uh, kept in, in captivity uh, up post their capture. We also had to consider how we'd move people on site and so four-wheel drive vehicles, all-terrain vehicles were considered and it also became apparent very quickly that the quickest way back um, or the quickest way to bring the birds back to um, Mallacoota and then fly them from Mallacoota Airport was to go by boat. So we engaged with uh, Victorian Fisheries Authority around boat access as well. So if I could just ask you to explain to the commissioners each each step of the logistics so they can, the commissioners can get an understanding of the different modes of transport vehicles and coordination that needed to take place to get, um, number one, the people from um, Melbourne, and number two, I understand that there were also people embedded in the Orbost I incident management team uh, or Instant Management Centre that was located there that was um, managing the fire risk around that area. If you could please explain, just in a very um, uh, overview in terms of 
each of the step the logistics that needed to be managed and needed to be coordinated to get the bird to get people and bird people in birds and people out so a detailed operational plan was um, uh, prepared by the planning team in the incident management team and as you've just mentioned a number of those um, had expertise and then um, assisted uh, with the extraction program on the ground as the days evolved. In that operational plan, uh, all of the logistics and all of the considerations around safety, transport, uh, health and wellbeing, as well as bird welfare were all considered. And in doing that, it, in preparing that plan, uh, it became logical and these requests were made uh, through the incident management team through to the state control centre resources such as an aircraft, a suitable aircraft to be able to transport the people from Melbourne to uh, the location where um, uh, all of the team grouped together to commence the extraction exercise at Marshmead just on uh, the far side of Mallacoota Inlet. A request for a suitable aircraft was made that um, there were requests made for suitable vehicle on ground uh, vehicles, uh, four wheel drives, all wheel drive um, types and uh, all terrain vehicles. Uh, there was a consideration of, uh, as I mentioned, a boat through Fisher Victorian Fisheries Authority to be able to transport both the team and the birds back to Mallacoota. And then there was also the consideration of how to uh, have the birds uh, return safely to Melbourne Zoo. Uh, so in each case, there was considerations along those lines. Um, in the case of being able to transport people from Melbourne, uh, the State Control Centre uh, liaised with the Australian Defence Force, and who were also um, located at the State Control Centre at the time, and uh, a Chinook helicopter was provided. Uh, it was a Singaporean uh, Chinook helicopter that was provided and it transported people to Mallacoota where the people in that transport then met others on the ground and then commenced the operation. Okay, this might be... The return... Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Ms White. I was just going to say, the, the return journey though then um, uh, particularly for the birds and the keepers and the experts who, who returned with the birds uh, became um, you know, uh, something that Dr Clark may be able to speak to given he was on the ground, but there was a really um, efficient and uh, really coordinated uh, effort by all the parties involved, Zoos Victoria in particular, the Victorian Fisheries Authority, Parks Victoria and our experts um, in the field to then be able to capture the birds rapidly, be able to assess them, be able to put them in purpose-built um, uh, boxes, uh, then uh, travel them to a jetty where they were met by uh, the boat of the Victorian Fisheries Authority. It was transported across, the birds and the keepers were transported across the lake where they were met on the other side of the lake at Mallacoota and put into a fixed wing aircraft, which had been um, uh, uh, been uh, made available uh, by the incident management team. And then the birds were then transported by fixed wing aircraft to Essendon Airport and then to Melbourne Zoo. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clark. Hello. Dr. Clark, um, I might? Yes. I understand that you were on the ground in the opera during the operation. Yes, that's right. And you actually had to go uh, into the area and capture the birds? That's right. Yes, I led one of those teams. Yes. Could you tell the commissioners what that was like? Yeah, so um, as Miss White um, talked about, there was considerable planning in place um, to get us there and to get us um, on the ground safely with the necessary equipment. Uh, and so... Uh, once we were in at Marshmead um, on the first day, uh, the Monday that we arrived, uh, we had a fairly substantial planning meeting um, at Marshmead at the facilities there, and then we drove via four-wheel drive down to the site, which is a distance of about seven or so kilometres, um, the site where the bristle birds occur. Um, and then uh, over that afternoon, uh, several hours, we basically did a reconnaissance trip um, so being on the ground, uh, seeking out bristle birds by their call uh, and locating where the birds were at the time so that we were really well prepared to start catching them the next morning. 
Um, and uh, once we sort of concluded that, we were back at Marshmead for more planning and um, you know, essentially allocation to teams um, to optimise the outcomes. And we were back out at the site um, in the half light the following morning, um, so back at Howe Flat um, on dawn, and um, a team of 11 of us were working at that stage together um, across uh, the various agencies that have been mentioned. Uh, and once you're on the ground, uh, essentially we had teams of uh, two to three people uh, and those sort of really like little strike teams to catch birds were focused on finding birds by their call, um, rapidly setting mist nets, which are a, a very fine black cotton net that's uh, stretched between two vertical poles, uh, typically sort of metal or bamboo poles. Um, we set those where we think we can hear the birds calling and then we use call playback. So we use Bluetooth speakers to attract the bird into the location where the net is. Um, and there's lots of little tricks and nuances. So uh, we typically use two or more speakers and uh, we play the call of the bristle bird through one speaker until we're confident that the bird is close to the speaker. And then we turn that speaker off and switch to the other speaker remotely um, and start playing calls on the different speaker at a different location. And if we get the positioning of the speakers right, that has the effect of drawing the bird across the net. So essentially we attract the bird into the net using speakers um, and the bird's call. Um, and yeah, I guess that, that arises from sort of years of experience. And so there was uh, at least half a dozen people in the team that were very experienced in the mist netting um, requirements and, and that sort of core to catching the bird successfully. Um, as soon as we caught a bird, uh, it was placed in a cloth bag and then uh, moved to a processing tent. Um, so if the bird was captured um, or inadvertently released uh, while it was being processed, it could be recaptured because it was um, within a sealed tent um, with the, the handlers, the um, zoos, Victoria staff that were handling it. Um, the birds got a vet check. Um, they were measured and they were fitted with a numbered band, which is particularly important to be able to track individuals um, through the process of captivity. And then they were placed in um, purpose-built um, carry boxes, which had been built quite literally in the days, um, the evening even before um, we travelled down um, by Zoos Victoria. Did you have um, on the first day? Sorry, yep. I'm sorry, Dr. Clark. I meant to ask: Was there a certain target number you were, of birds you were aiming for? Yeah. So the the target was 15 to to 20 birds. Um, for the program, uh, and as Miss White said, uh, the original plan um, gave us five days on the site uh, in terms of the logistics and um, the, the structure um, for support um, for those activities. Um, on the first day, we managed to catch uh, nine birds, which is uh, right at the upper limit of what Zoos Victoria um, could manage. Uh, and indeed, they were um, preparing the aviaries as the birds were um, being flown back. Um, sort of such is the logistics that was was going on to keep it all organised. Um, we we needed to finish all of the catching on any given day by 11 a.m. Uh, so we start at dawn, but we're done by 11 um, because the logistics that Miss White referred to, um, four-wheel drive vehicle to the jetty, um, the fisheries officers providing support for the the vessel across Malacca Inlet, another vehicle to the airport, and then the charter flight waiting to go to Essendon Airport. Um, all of those things had to take place with enough time to get the birds to Melbourne Zoo in daylight um, so that we could release them into the aviaries or, or Zoo's Victoria staff could release them into the aviaries. Um, it's critical that you put them in with enough time to, to settle down in the evening. So do I understand that the, day, the birds you caught on the first day were transported to Melbourne Zoo that day and then birds you caught That's subsequently correct. were transported on subsequent days? That's right. So the, the logistics structure was um, all of those operational considerations were in place for every day that we caught birds. Um, and so I think on the first day by 5pm we had a text message back to the team on the ground to tell us that the birds were already safely in the aviaries uh, following a vet check at the other end as well. Um, on the second day, um, the process was pretty much the same um, ex uh, and we managed to catch six birds. So um, by 11am on the second day, we had 15 um, and so we'd achieved the lower end of the target. Um, the one difference with the second day was that uh, the winds had increased noticeably uh, and fire activity was substantially higher. 
uh, there was a, a, a good tower of smoke in the sky uh, and um, you know you could smell the smoke all the time in fact you could see um, on the nearby ranges visible um, flame and at the site we were working there was um, ash falling so so not embers um, rather um, you know burnt and extinguished leaves um, were falling at the site where we were catching birds um, and so that really changed things in terms of how we um, behaved on that second day. What was the decision made at some time on the second day or at the end of the second day that you had to leave the area? That's right. So um, we were essentially embedded um, within um, the, the operations for the fire and so the incident management um, uh, team or the um, based at Orbos had um, sort of oversight in terms of when and, and what we would do. Uh, and so uh, our role was to continue planning to um, extract birds uh, whilst we had that approval. Uh, and we were actually in a planning meeting in the afternoon recognising conditions were getting worse that we may be able to extract a couple more birds that afternoon uh, when we got word that we would be um, evacuated and moved back to Malakuta, um, which is what happened on that day, the second day. And uh, on the third day, did, we, did you then travel back to Melbourne or did you remain in Malakuta? Hmm. No, that's right. On the third day, um, we, we simply overnighted in Malakuta. Um, the birds were already gone by that stage on a, a charter flight. Uh, and we overnighted in Malakuta and uh, we ourselves uh, flew back to Melbourne um, on that third day. Mm. And did you then participate, once you were back in Melbourne, with the, the, the birds going to the Melbourne zoos or being looked after in the Melbourne zoos, or did that complete your involvement at that stage? Uh, so the, the bulk of the um, task for the, the captive management uh, fell to the expert keepers at Zoos Victoria. Um, but we continued to be involved uh, with a role in terms of planning for release um, and future actions um, after the captive program had ended. Uh, so we were involved in uh, weekly um, teleconferences uh, for a full update on progress, uh, but we were also involved in um, a half-day debrief uh, around the program that we'd achieved in the field uh, and um, substantial forward planning for release in terms of um, a monitoring program. Um, should the birds go back to the site um, from where they were taken. Thank you, Dr Clark. I understand that some of the birds were eventually returned. And it may That's be a, correct. It may, may be appropriate for Ms White to speak about the return of the birds at this stage. So, Ms White, if I can just take you through, um, once the birds were um, arrived at Essendon Airport, what, what was the process that occurred after that? Uh, the birds were transported from Essendon Airport to Melbourne Zoo. Uh, with them, they had um, uh, expert keeper staff that had travelled with them from Malakuta. Uh, they were met at Melbourne Zoo and the birds uh, received uh, veterinary uh, checks, as Dr Clarks mentioned, and they were released into aviaries um, at uh, Melbourne Zoo that had been paired for Eastern Bristlebird particular and then they were monitored um, from then on by Melbourne Zoo staff in association for a couple of weeks with um, some expert uh, Eastern Bristle bird um, uh, keepers from Currumbin Wildlife Sanctuary who joined the crew for two weeks in order to assist with, um, if you like, um, settling the birds and being able to bring some of their knowledge uh, to Victoria. And when were the birds ultimately taken back to how flat and released? Uh, a number of the birds were released on the 1st of April uh, and uh, they were returned back to how flat from where they were originally captured uh, and released there and uh, and, uh, and also there are still uh, are two birds that still uh, are, um, are still at Melbourne Zoo at the moment uh, that have not yet been released so and it's uh, it's likely that one of those will also go back um, uh, to uh, the site. What was the total number of birds that were extracted from how flat? Uh, there were 15 that um, were extracted. And how many were returned? Uh, we have seven that were uh, returned, two that uh, have been retained at Melbourne Zoo and six uh, died uh, while in captivity. What was the cause of that death? 
for those deaths? Uh, the uh, cause of death, at least to uh, at least four of the six, and perhaps all six, um, related to a fungal infection that can be exacerbated uh, by stresses such as uh, the capture stresses that these birds may have experienced. Okay. It might be helpful, um, I think there's some photos in your statement that show the birds being released and um, will inform the commissioners of some of the visual um, aspects of it in terms of the, um, I understand, purpose-built boxes were made um, and some of the logistics that were, um, were engaged in to actually return the birds. So if I could go to document DELW 500-001-0020. Ms White, are you able to, or, or Dr Clark, just describe for the commissioners some of the different elements of the purpose-built box for the bristlebirds? This might be one for Dr. Clark. Sure. Um, so these are a heavy um, plywood boxes, um, are heavy in that they're robust. Um, they have um, solid sliding doors on them so that the doors can be readily removed. And at one end, they have a sliding door with um, a baffle um, that's made of rubber. So you can push your hand through that when you're putting a bird in without the chance of it escaping. And at the other end, as you can see in this uh, photograph, when you remove the slide from the far end, um, there's um, complete access for the birds to be able to exit. Um, so these are the, the two birds, presumably a pair, um, that have been um, returned and um, the door's been lifted off and, and they're flying out. So um, when they're being released, they don't need to be handled again. Um, you can simply remove the door and uh, they can exit uh, as they're doing. And is my understanding correct that there's some soundproofing that's built into that box? Uh, that's right. That, so, um, yeah, making the, the boxes solid um, improves the um, or reduces the noise um, that can access them. Um, they also have um, soft material on the, the roof of the box, which um, both soundproofs, but it also um, provides a buffer if the birds leap um, while they're in the boxes. So they, um, they hit something soft rather than the hard roof of the box. Could we please, uh, operator, go to document DELW 501-001-0001. And Ms White, I might ask you to describe these photos. Uh, this is uh, the team uh, that uh, was involved with the capture and, re and then re subsequent return. Um, uh, and they're uh, holding those purpose-built boxes uh, as they're walking along uh, the, if you like, through that uh, environment that is the um, power flat habitat area. And operator, if you could please go to DELW 5010001002. Ms White, if I could ask you to describe what we're seeing there too. Uh, once again, uh, this shows uh, that the um, birds are um, being transferred um, from, uh, the, from the fixed wing aircraft that, um, uh, that was taking them um, from uh, Melbourne uh, back to uh, the site at How Flat. And what was the reason that they couldn't be transported in a helicopter and it had to be a fixed wing aeroplane? Uh, the uh, experts who advised us around um, the use of aircraft to be able to transport, uh, transport the birds advised that something, uh, an aircraft that could be as quiet as relatively possible and also as smooth as relatively possible would be preferable for transporting the birds. And so uh, it, uh, with that advice, a fixed wing was uh, considered to be the most appropriate way of being able to transport these birds safely. And Dr. Clark might have something to add. Yes, I agree. And there was on-ground discussion after we'd arrived in the Chinook that um, it wasn't suitable um, 
for transport, and that included um, a, a couple of zoos, Victoria staff that had travelled on that aircraft and, and made the, you know, the decision that it wasn't a suitable aircraft given extreme noise and um, shudder from the rotor uh, movement. And operator, if we could please go to DELW 5010100006. And Ms. White or Dr. Clark, if you can describe what we're seeing here. Um, once again, uh, these purpose-built um, boxes um, transporting the birds um, and now um, uh, being um, um, you know, prepared for the birds' release. And, and whereabouts is that photo taken? Uh, I don't have the exacts um, of where that is, but it is on Mallacoota Inlet. Dr. Clark, you may have been at this point. Yeah, so this is um, what's called Brokewell's Hut, which is um, Parks Victoria managed um, land, as I understand it. Um, and it's the jetty that's um, on the uh, eastern side of Mallacoota, um, um, so nearest to Marshmead and the Howe Flat side. Uh, and Mallacoota is on the far side of this inlet from here. Thank you. And Ms. White, has there been a, a review of this particular operation um, since the um, birds have been released back into how flat? Uh, yes, uh, there has been a debrief um, that has commenced, of which is not yet completed, but a debrief commenced uh, on 14th of February, uh, and we will continue to um, uh, build out that, if you like, the experience and the knowledge that we've gained um, over coming weeks in order to um, complete that analysis of, of the uh, extraction and what we can build into the learnings for the future. And are there any particular learnings that have been identified at this stage? I think uh, there's a couple of things that uh, were new in, uh, in the 1920 bushfire uh, situation that uh, at the time posed uh, not insurmountable issues because, of course, this was a terrific collaboration of a lot of agencies and experts and they delivered a really professional and efficient uh, bird extraction, uh, which was remarkably successful. But a couple of things uh, stood out. Um, one was uh, it was the first time that we've done a bird extraction in, uh, in a situation such as this in advance of fire. So there was some of that learning about how we would do it and how we would do it better, including how we would engage um, with um, um, uh, people who were involved in it who did not have fire training and we had to arrange for them to have fire training and so on and so forth. And Dr Clark was part of that. Uh, and we also, um, uh, if you like, had to work very quickly. And Dr. Clark also mentioned that some of these boxes were really being fi uh, being finalised the day before um, the um, the extraction um, party left Melbourne. Is it was just about the speed in which we had to do it, um, and uh, and we've learnt from some of that along the lines of what could we prepare for differently in the future. Yes, I do. Uh, Dr. Clark, um, from an ornithologist's point of view, um, the operation was successful in the capture of the birds, given the constraints under which you were working. Uh, but unfortunately, um, some of the birds having died, from the ornithologist's point of view, that's an unfortunate uh, outcome. But um, in terms of the balancing acts, uh, or ba ba the balancing that takes place for the ornithologist. On the one hand, you have the risk of almost complete destruction of a bird population. Um, on the other hand, there are risks associated with their extraction. From, from your point of view, was the operation a success? Uh, yes, I'd, I'd consider it a success. Um, these types of emergency interventions are, are really hard. Um, and so, um, we know that uh, you know before we started, they come with um, some risk, um, and as it transpires, you know there's risk to individual birds, 
um, but that's also traded off against the threat of um, a fire that had a, a very high prospect of burning um, the entire site that supported um, bristlebirds in both um, the Victorian side of the border and the New South Wales side of the border. Um, and as it transpired, um, whilst the fire on the Victorian side of the border um, just burnt into the edge of the eastern bristlebird habitat, um, the very same fire, um, sub uh, several days after we'd left, burnt out the vast majority of Nadji Nature Reserve and effectively the other half of this southern population of eastern bristlebirds. Uh, we don't know uh, yet how many of those birds in the Nadji um, uh, side of the border uh, survived the fire because um, the monitoring hasn't occurred yet. Um, but we do know that a, a very substantial portion of their habitat um, has uh, been burnt and, and is rendered unsuitable for um, the short to medium term um, in those sites. Um, so when you appreciate that, um, you know, the threat that was um, imminently um, sort of posed by this fire was realised for half of the site that we were concerned about, um, half of the southern population, um, it really does demonstrate that, you know, actions like this um, are, are important to take when there's those opportunities. Um, and then, you know, the, the trade-off is um, the very real risk um, when you're dealing with um, secretive and, and shy and perhaps fragile um, species like this and, and the risks associated with captivity. Uh, some of that is, is factored in directly in terms of the estimates of numbers that you would need to be able to develop an insurance population. Um, and so, you know, you do need to go a little higher than um, you might need ideally because you need to recognise that there's risk with this and um, some birds may uh, be lost as a consequence of your actions. Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. I have no further questions for Dr. Clark or Ms. White. Um, I was wondering if the commissioners have so any questions. A couple of questions, and, and uh, I appreciate both Dr. Clark and Ms. White briefing us today and, and what was a highly complex logistical exercise and international, Commonwealth, state, and contracted uh, assets there. That, and so We've had a lot on the, the seven-day plan that was developed in January. I just want to get step back before that, get an understanding of a couple of things. So, Ms White, from your statement you talked about before, I understand there's three key plans and strategies in place for the eastern bristlebird. Uh, it started with an action statement in 1995, and then over the course of 25 years, we had two additional plans, which was then the fire management plan in December 19. So is that a natural progression for planning or did people look at what was about to occur with fires and decide that that really needs to drive a, a, a fire management plan or am I missing something there? Uh, an action statement had been prepared in 1999 with uh, Victorian legislation as was the recovery plan prepared according to the Commonwealth legislation. Um, it had been recognised for uh, many years that, uh, that aspects uh, relating to the habitat of the eastern bristle bird needed to be considered really carefully given the small number of birds and that it's in only really one location and a very small location in uh, Far East Gippsland. And so consideration of what might be a suitable way of being able to, if you like, manage the habitat or the ongoing survival of the bird while also trying to protect it from the impacts of bushfire had been under consideration for a long, a long time. The timing of the, uh, of the preparation of the ecological fire management plan uh, really, um, and its completion in 2019, did not um, uh, that preceded uh, the bushfires of 19, but it had come about because uh, a, a biodiversity strategy, Biodiversity 2037, had been uh, released in Victoria in 2017, and it identified uh, a number of biodiversity response planning activities needed to occur, and one of those that was identified was the eastern bristle bird, and funding was made available for that fire management plan. So it wasn't related to the bushfires, but it had been prepared um, knowing that there was a need to consider um, fire in the landscape and how the habitat could be best protected. Okay, I appreciate it, especially considering it looks like the bird lives in an area of high fuel loading anyway as its natural habitat. That, 
yeah, make that yes. yeah, make that difficult. Um, funding of the plans is it that a state responsibility or is it a Commonwealth responsibility, or, or funding of the actions that come out of that 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 plan? Uh, the Victorian government um, uh, funded the work for the um, for the ecological fire management plan. So that was Victorian uh, funding uh, that went towards that. Um, under or circumstances, um, there can be situations where the Commonwealth can contribute funding or contribute um, resources. But in this case, it was Victorian. Okay, thank you. Now, if I just call up uh, your statement which is para 35 of your statement. I just want to clarify something in that, and that's 0012 page on document DLW. There we go. 0012. And it's para 35. So I just want to explore this one just briefly. So on the 7th of January, which I gather was leading into the, uh, the seven-day plan, Following upgrade the bushfire in the vicinity of the National Park, there was a desktop analysis led by uh, your team, I'm assuming, and inform yes. informed by experts from a variety of organisations that recognised how flat and how range areas as places of high significance for biodiversity and critical refuge. Surely that's not the first time that that was, um, that area was recognised for that, but if I get that right, or if it was, even if it wasn't, is there a database where you can access that actually has all the the areas that are of significance for biodiversity and critical refuge for other uh, species that need to be protected? Is there a standard plan that comes off a shelf, it's on a database somewhere where people can go and have a look at it and go, here's what's there and, uh, and why that area is particularly important? Uh, we have uh, databases um, that describes uh, the location of many uh, of the known uh, rare and threatened species in Victoria, um, right across Victoria, and so including this area in East Gippsland. Um, often um, it's then supplemented by what's known as habitat mapping and habitat modelling, where you can then be able to not only um, be able to locate where the records of where these species are, but where are the likely occurrences of it. Um, the uh, the actual, um, if you like, documentation uh, that supports what do you do for each one of these species uh, varies uh, for each species, um, largely uh, because um, they're off, they often have key attributes that are different. However, a number of species may occur in a similar area. So in this case, we know that there are other uh, um, rare species that occur within the vicinity of eastern bristlebirds so that when you're thinking about eastern bristlebird management you'd also be thinking about maybe diamond python or long-nosed potteroo or other species that are in the in the area does that answer your question yeah, it does so so there is a database or there is a, a document or database that has all the uh, the endangered species listed where they are the, and so that as a fire is starting to to, as a fire starts and you're looking at a response, then uh, your CFA or the emergency responders have the ability to access that and see what's there, or one of your team provides advice on what's there that what need what may need to be managed as they respond to the fire. Is that the way, is that the correct That's interpretation? Correct. Okay. Thank thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Bennett. Any questions, Commissioner McIntosh? Yes, quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you both for your evidence. Um, just a quick question to either one of you, probably Dr Clark. I just want to clar clarify what happened in terms of the fire. You just said, Dr Clark, that the how flat area on the Victorian side wasn't that badly affected by fire, but on it sounds like on the New South Wales side of the border that there was decent fire activity and as a consequence they've lost heath and the other habitat that's needed for the species. And as a consequence of that, that it, that might affect the population on the Victorian side of the border. Is that? Yeah, that's correct. So um, the day that we were evacuated as fire activity picked up, um, in the following uh, two to four days, um, the fire continued to, to move uh, and it actually burnt across the access track that we were using from Marshmead to Howflat. 
um, and it burnt into the very northern edge of a, a small known population um, on the access track. Um, so, so possibly as little as tens of metres of suitable habitat were lost um, if we take the aerial images as the guide for where the, um, the area was burnt. Um, the fire activity then settled a little bit as the next front um, or system moved through, um, but then it picked up yet again um, a few days later and made a substantial run to the north. Um, and, and that fire activity is uh, when it burnt into Nadji. So it, it essentially became very active and burnt back into New South Wales. Um, and um, it's that fire event that, that sort of, you know, maybe a week or two after we'd been there uh, when most of Nadji um, was raised by fire. Um, so it's reasonable to expect, based primarily on the fire mapping rather than the on-ground survey, um, that about half of the area that supported bristlebirds in the southern population has now been burnt. And just again for the for the dummy, um, it sounds like with this species you don't actually need crown scorching fires. Just a, even a moderate fire will change the the understory habitat enough in order to make it unsuited for this species. Um, I, I suspect if it's a very slow moving fire, um, so low intensity, and it's leaving pockets of suitable habitat. Um, then that will provide sufficient refuge that um, some birds will get through and um, as the habitat comes online um, through the years, as it grows back, um, then it would be um, suitable again for them. Uh, if the fire moves through as a high intensity fire, recognising that um, the areas in Nadji and in um, How Flat don't have canopy, um, so there's no sort of opportunity for crown scorch. It's simply a fast moving fire in Heath. Um, if it's a fast moving wide front in Heath, um, then you know effectively the birds are gone um, would be the, the consequence of that fire. Thanks very much. Um, Ms White, the, one of the things you said in the previous statement about the bristle bird was there, but there are other animals uh, as well. Question for you. Why all this for the bristle bird and not the other animals? Or is it this a first time attempt and uh, you, you kept it to one species or what? Uh, no, we had also extracted um, a number of fish from small uh, streams uh, where they were vulnerable. Well, not so much from fire, from the subsequent um, known as blackwater events when it rains in uh, very badly burnt catchments and a whole lot of dirt and rubbish um, ends, ends up in the stream. So we have also um, uh, have salvaged uh, fish uh, and a couple of crayfish species and uh, freshwater mussel species. So um, we have done it for other species. The focus on this particular one really came down to, uh, for the eastern bristle bird in Victoria, it was our only population, it was a small number of birds um, and that it was very vulnerable to fire. Some of the other species I mentioned, their occurrences are more widespread or there are other populations of them, Victoria or across a broader range of habitats interstate. So that's that's why the eastern bristle bird, if you like, came to the, um, to the fore. Okay, and then my final question is, noting it's right on the, the, the border, there, do you work closely with your counterparts in New South Wales around this population? And were, did you talk to them about what you were doing with this plant and did they provide any advice? And now the habitat on that side may well have been destroyed. Are you working with them to, to bring this uh, colony, if that's the correct term, uh, back to a, to a suitable level of sustainment? Uh, yes, we do um, uh, liaise with our colleagues in New South Wales and during the fires um, there were a number of uh, conversations and uh, exchange of information across the border. Um, through the incident management team and the arrangements around fire suppression of which this operation was embedded within, there is a very close uh, a, a relationship and a close exchange of information, uh, not only about um, the actions that each state is doing, but where they can work together um, in order to be able to uh, achieve mutual outcomes. Since the birds have been returned, uh, we have visited the site again. Uh, we haven't gone out there deliberately to uh, try to capture the bird, uh, ca 
capture birds to see if the returned birds are okay, but we have been there to check and we know that in uh, how flat there are um, the, the presence of the eastern bristle birds still occurring. So that's very positive. I'm not aware of any work that we've currently done though with New South Wales with their parks program or other institutions um, about uh, determining uh, the fate of the population at Nadji. Yeah, thank, thank you. Commissioner Bennett? I was just only going to ask if Dr Clark has any more information on the other parts of the population. Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? I, I just that um, Ms White said that uh, she's not aware of, um, you know, what was happening in New South Wales and, and what happened to the other parts of the population of the bristle bird. I just thought perhaps you might, you might have more information on that. There was actually a, a planning meeting this morning for the southern population and for an expert elicitation process to um, identify ways forward. Um, so there is uh, action underway. Uh, I am not sure what level of involvement there was from the New South Wales agency, but um, I would expect there was, and I'm certainly aware that um, representatives from University of Wollongong who have expertise in the New South Wales population were involved in that discussion today. Thank you very much. And Dr Clark and Ms White, thank you very much for taking the time this afternoon to talk to the, the Commission. We re really appreciate it. It was a very complex operation uh, in very trying times. We appreciate uh, uh, you sharing that with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much. Chair, if the, if the witnesses could be excused from further attendance. The witnesses can be excused. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Commissioners, that concludes um, the oral evidence that will be presented this afternoon from witnesses. But we do have one final piece of evidence. Um, there is a video of evidence given by Mr Dennis Rose of the Gunditch Mara people. He will give evidence of his personal perspective and impressions of the impact of the 2019-2020 bushfires on some of the traditional land of the Gunditch Mara people. His evidence was filmed on country in Victoria on the sites that form part of the Budge Bim cultural landscape. By way of introduction to the video, I would mention that the Budge Bim cultural landscape is a UNESCO World Heritage listed site of approximately 40 square kilometres, and it includes the Budge Bim National Park in Western Victoria. As a World Heritage listed site, it is a thus a matter of national environmental significance under the EPBC Act, the Commonwealth Act. The site was listed in 2019. Butch Beam is protected under that Act and also the Aboriginal Heritage Act of 2006 in Victoria. The cultural landscape is unique because it contains stone fish traps and eel traps, an aquaculture system that, are, that is considered by archaeologists to be over 6,600 years old as well as the stone remains of houses. The video goes for approximately 40 minutes, at the end of which our evidence will be concluded for today. If we could now play the video. OK, and on, on completion of that video, we will look to adjourn today. Yes, Chair. Um, and we will resume at 10 a.m. on Friday. C correct, Chair. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Can you tell me a little bit more about the Gunditch Mirroring Traditional Owners Corporation? We're a, we're a PBC, a prescribed body corporate. Uh, we received a native title determination in 2007 uh, and also uh, we have a shared determination with our uh, the Eastern Mar Aboriginal Corporation uh, a little bit further east. Um, which is part what we call Part B, uh, and that was a determination uh, sorted out in 2011. So uh, we we essentially manage the native title rights of our of our members of our organisation. I take it that you are Gunditch Mara. Yes, I'm a Gunditch Mara person. I'm a Gunditch Mara traditional owner. Uh, I have uh, um, ancestors who uh, who I can demonstrate links with and recognised native title holder. Do you know for how long the Gunditch Mara have been in the area, the location where you are at the moment? 
uh, look, m many thousands of years. I, it, as as always, it's uh, as technology improves, dates tend to get uh, uh, pushed back. Uh, we just found that out with some uh, um, volcanic activity just recently. Uh, but many thousands of years, we'll be looking at a fish trap today that's six and a half thousand years. Certainly, people were around well and truly before that, but uh, this is a geological uh, lava flow um, which didn't settle, it, it erupted around about 37,000 years ago and settled in its current shape and form around about 8,000 years ago. So um, uh, Gunditjmara people quite clearly lived here for, for, for many thousands of years. We have uh, midden sites and on, on other parts of our country, uh, down on, on the coastal area uh, where uh, again there's a scientifically accepted date of at least 12,000 years uh, and that was uh, was after the sea levels were uh, a lot lower so um, a lot of the evidence for, for antiquity of uh, probably out under the water there somewhere. Did you grow up in the area where you now find yourself or did you grow up somewhere else? A, a bit of a mixture I sometimes uh, with my family we shifted to Melbourne I think um, from when I was about five, I started school in, in Melbourne uh, in 1960 um, and uh, then shifted back home uh, in 1965. I lived here until uh, I lived here and worked on country until uh, 1984. I was a National Parks Ranger and then I went up to the Mallee for a couple of years and then I spent uh, around about eight or nine years in uh, in Gurrywood or the Grampians National Park and uh, uh, subsequent to that I uh, uh, shifted to Canberra for nine years um, and worked with Australian what was Australian National Parks and Wildlife Service um, and back home since 2002 so uh, you had about 18 years away and a, a couple of times in Melbourne prior to that. I live in Portland but I work my office is in Hayward it's only 25 kilometres away. From where you live to where you are at the moment how far would that be approximately? Uh, around about 35 kilometres. Could you give me a brief description of how large is the area that we're talking about or will be talking about involving the Kutchnitz National Park? Yeah, the, uh, the, the total, the total uh, area for the uh, uh, World Heritage Boundaries, which has, incorporates the National Park plus the Aboriginal owned properties, is uh, nearly 9,000 hectares. Uh, around about 6,000 of that is the National Park, the Budge Bim National Park, and 3,000 hectares are uh, primarily freehold. Aboriginal freehold title. There's a couple of exceptions. We have a little bit of land uh, at the Lake Condor Mission uh, that's um, under the Aboriginal, the, the Commonwealth Aboriginal Land Rights Act. This is the Curtin Niche property. Um, we've acquired this over over a number of years. I think the first part of the property was uh, purchased uh, through the Indigenous Land Corporation uh, in, a, in around about 2006. We then acquired a little bit more of the property around about 2008 and in 2014 the third part of this property. So this is uh, Kirtnich um, which means water crossing um, and uh, we've we managed this as a as the sign says it's an Indigenous protected area so management for the protection of its natural and cultural values. Roughly how far are you from Melbourne? Uh, around about 360 kilometres to the west, pretty well due west. Are there any significant townships? First of all, any significant large townships nearby? The largest town nearby is, or largest city nearby is uh, Warrnambool, uh, which is about 90 k's to the east of here. Um, Mount Gambier, which is over in the South Australia, uh, is about 80 kilometres to the west. Are there any smaller townships nearby? Lots of small towns nearby in Hayward, and Hayward certainly one of them. Um, uh, Hayward's a town of about, around about 1,300 uh, people population-wise. Um, Portland is around about 8,000. Uh, it, it's nearby as well, and we're also not far from Hamilton, which is around about 9,000 people, so uh, we're, we're south of Hamilton. Is it fair to say, Dennis, that apart from the 18 years, I think you mentioned that you spent away from 
where you are now that for most of your life you lived in the area? That's correct, yeah, yeah, most of my life. Um, 18 years, uh, around about five years in my early days in Melbourne and, and a couple of years in Melbourne as a, after leaving school. Uh, I've worked as a National Park Ranger uh, down, in, uh, down, down this way in the Discovery Bay Coastal Park and also Lower Glenelg National Park. I was an uh, acting ranger in charge at Budge Bim National Park when it was known as Mount Eccles National Park, again back in the, uh, the, the early 80s. Um, so I have worked out here uh, yeah, quite regularly over the years and worked on country as well, which is always important. Thank you very much, Dennis. Now, looking behind you, looking south from what I can see, it looks relatively flat. Yes, it is. Most of the most of the uh, lava flow is is relatively flat. There's some you know, geological formations within there, and there's some, but there's no uh, no hills or uh, uh, such other than Budge Beam itself, which is uh, which was a which is a collapsed or an extinct. It's not extinct. It's a, it's a volcano that's still active apparently, but um, but other than that, yeah, it's fairly fairly flat country. I can see you're standing in front of a background there. Where are we in terms of the National Park? Is that on the edge of the National Park? Uh, we're near, we're, we're a few kilometres from the National Park. Uh, um, and, and where the fires were, yeah, probably about uh, four kilometres. We we're actually further south, south than where we were at the, uh, the, the top of the Curtinage property. We're uh, down a little bit lower. Has there been some burning carried out in the background there? Yes, uh, last Friday we did a cultural burn. Um, this is a, a wetland uh, that, that's behind me and uh, um, we, uh, we, we burn for a number of reasons. One for, for fire protection, uh, fuel reduction. Uh, we, we also do cultural burn. So this particular fire we wanted to burn around wetlands to see if we could uncover uh, other fish trap systems that, that uh, we may not have recorded before. Uh, and also uh, there's an environmental uh, component of it as well that we want to uh, uh, you know, get the health of country back and, and cultural burning uh, is certainly an important part. Do you undertake cultural burning? Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a partnership arrangement with uh, the forest fire management section of DELP. Uh, they certainly uh, assist us. Uh, we, so we do uh, all, the, all the, the, the planning that's required. We have a, a good neighbour policy. We don't want to burn uh, any of our neighbours out or ourselves for that matter. Um, so we do a, a lot of burning. This fire which was conducted last Friday was postponed from the week before because of uh, predicted high winds. High winds so uh, we have some flexibility there, but we work very closely in partnership with both the Country Fire Authority and the Forest Fire Management uh, sections to, to ensure that our burns, uh, whilst they're culturally important and, and also environmentally important, uh, to, just to make sure that we, uh, we don't uh, uh, cause undue damage. You mentioned DELWP, now that's obviously a department. Could you give me its full name? Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Does the cultural burning take place as part of an overall fire management plan? Yes, it is. We've developed, uh, uh, it's still in its draft uh, stage at, this, at, at the moment, but uh, what we call the Ween Yarkeen, which essentially means fire dreaming. Um, so again, that's a, a partnership arrangement between the uh, CFA, between DELP, uh, ourselves and uh, the Windermar Aboriginal Corporation, or uh, another landowner on the within the uh, Budge Bim World Heritage Area. Does it take place throughout the year? Primarily in the autumn and, and into the winter, um, because of the nature of the of the lava flow, uh, it's not advisable to do much burning in the spring. Um, you need to be sure that there's going to be some good rains after you burn. The fires uh, can get in underground under the rocks and, and in cracks and, and and pop up you know a week or two later. So. Primarily we burn uh, during the autumn and, and, and into the winter. I think last year, uh, 
last year we burnt uh, either it was either late June or early July um, was one of our burns uh, but we are looking at wanting to uh, uh, expand our, our burning season the window of opportunity so we are we will start to work on maybe some spring burning uh, in, in the next couple of years. In terms of identification of the areas where the cultural burning takes place, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, look, we, we have a, uh, as part of our Indigenous Protected Areas Plan of Management, fire management is an important part. So this being our keen uh, plan, uh, we'll identify uh, potential burn areas for the next three years uh, to, again, ensure that we, we you know, we have a, a coordinated approach to, uh, to burning. We're not burning the same areas necessarily. I understand that in 2019 to 2020 that some fires occurred in and around the Gunditch Mara National Park. Yeah, that's correct, Andrew. The uh, fires uh, first ignited on the uh, 20th of, of December. Uh, I'm standing at uh, on the Muldoon's property, uh, and the fire uh, was caused by a lightning strike, approximately about a kilometre uh, to the left of me or to the south, um, and it burnt for uh, approximately. Uh, till about the 30th of, uh, of uh, December. Can I see in the background some trees that were affected by that fire? You certainly can. You can see the, the, the impact of the fire. Uh, this is the, the northern edge of the fire line. Uh, to my right is the uh, Darlitz Creek, which is a, uh, approximately five or six metres wide and, and had a reasonable amount of water in it. Um, the fire never uh, escaped to the north. Uh, the uh, trees that you see uh, to my left and, and behind me uh, there's quite a few trees in there, tall uh, eucalypts, particularly managums um, that weren't fire impacted or very had minor impact uh, and there are a few trees that, that uh, the canopies have been burnt out. It was, it was a fire that sort of got hot in spots but not, not completely hot. Did it burn close to a significant area from your point of view? The, the first fire burnt just over 800 hectares uh, and that was under control by uh, uh, the, the 31st of, of uh, December uh, but on the, the evening of the 30th uh, uh, directly behind me and probably about uh, uh, three or four kilometres into the National Park uh, there was another uh, lightning strike that uh, ignited the second fire. It burnt uh, approximately 5,000 hectares, a little bit over uh, over a, a few days, uh, over, a, over a, a week or more, yeah. Did the fire reach where you're standing now or was it the clump of trees behind you? The, the clump of trees behind me and in front of me there's some, some trees that uh, uh, are about 40 metres away from me. So it did burn up and around here but it didn't burn uh, where I'm standing. I understand from here that we're going to be going to a site that is of particular significance to the Gunditch Mara? That's correct, yes. We're going to what we call the Muldoon's fish trap. Uh, it has a scientifically accepted date of 6,600 years when it was first constructed. Um, as I tell people that uh, there aren't many things left on this planet that uh, were constructed uh, that, are, that are older than, than that. Do the fish traps form part of the Gunditch Mara cultural landscape? That's correct. The, the, uh, the, the World Heritage Listing, uh, to get World Heritage Listing you have to have uh, demonstrate outstanding universal value. You have to have a world value. Our value essentially is uh, that we have one of the world's oldest aquaculture systems uh, in, uh, out here. Um, we have, as I said, a scientifically accepted date of 6,600 years. Um, there are quite a lot of fish traps around the world. Uh, you know, there's lots in Australia. Australia, uh, probably some that may be older, but we're actually talking about aquaculture here. We're talking about farming fish, a complex system um, of diverting and manipulating the uh, natural system uh, to to enhance and increase the uh, uh, the food resource over many many thousands of years. When was the Gunditch Mara cultural landscape listed with UNESCO? July the 6th 2019 it was uh, officially announced at a meeting of the uh, World Heritage Committee in uh, Baku in Azerbaijan. 
how extensive is the cultural landscape? Well, it's a, it's a, it covers an area of about uh, 40 kilometres as the, as the creek flows uh, and the lava flow flows. Um, and it, it, it's, it, 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 it varies in width and depth. Um, where we're standing at the moment is a, is a very wide area. It's probably about five kilometres uh, across and uh, uh, other parts of the lava flow, it's, it's sometimes only three or four hundred metres uh, in, in, uh, in, in width. So uh, it, it varies a bit. What sort of impact did the fires have on country? Oh, look, particularly the first fire it was you know we, we were certainly much more fortunate than than uh, other parts of the of the country um, we had a few hot days but we also had some relatively mild conditions uh, for for you know out of that first week I, I, I guess that we had uh, you know five days of, of mild uh, temperatures and, and and not too much wind speed uh, with two or three days were were, were uh, uh, fairly uh, fairly concerning, um, and uh, um, yeah. So we, you know, the, the fire, as you can see here behind me, the fire up this end of it uh, just trickled trickled through. It didn't uh, roar through the bush. Uh, it trickled through, and we were in a fortunate position that uh, you know we we could control it reasonably okay. What sort of people were involved in fighting the fires? Uh, again, to, to the right of me is, is the creek. Over the other side of the creek, I think on, uh, on, on Monday the 30th, which was Monday the 30th of December, was a, uh, an ex uh, extremely hot day. It was predicted for 41 degrees, at which it reached. Um, it was seven, up to 70 kilometre an hour winds, which also occurred. We had, uh, I think, five or six uh, CFA tankers over the other side of the uh, the creek into the, the, the sort of the more conventional farmland, waiting for the fire to jump. Uh, which uh, fortunately it didn't but uh, um, so we had CFA crews uh, behind me we had a hose line uh, from the from the lake from the from the, the creek uh, a hose line of around about two kilometers that was uh, ran down beside the fire retardant line that was our eastern edge um, and we had quite a number of DELP and CFA crews and also some of our rangers uh, out on that, that fire line uh, you know, with, with hoses at the ready and uh, the good news was that the, uh, uh, that the fire line held. Can you just describe the area for me where you are at the moment? Okay, we're in the, uh, the, the right into the uh, Muldoon's uh, aquaculture system, the Muldoon's fish trap. Um, I'm standing at the entrance to, to where the water actually uh, ran into the, into the system. Um, to the left of me uh, is, a, is a, a system that's about 300 metres in, in length. Uh, there are two channels uh, that uh, interconnect and then uh, they uh, run around the back um, and it was a place where uh, fish were farmed, uh, fish were ponded. Um, it was an intensive uh, aquaculture system that, uh, that, that we have here and uh, it's a very uh, complex system. Uh, to the right of me we're on the uh, uh, southeastern edge of, uh, of, of Tayrak or Lake Conda. Um, to the right of me uh, on, the, on the edge, around the edge of the lake, uh, they operated at various levels but there are in excess of 70 individual fish trap systems uh, around the lake to my right. Uh, in front of me, over the, over the back a little bit, are some stone house sites uh, where people were, people were living. Um, and uh, there are about 10 house sites here that, I, that I'm aware of. I think there's probably more, uh, but uh, certainly a, at least 10 uh, here. And, and again, around the edge of the lake, there's quite a number. Is this all part of the Butch Bim cultural landscape? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. This is this was a, a really important part of the, the World Heritage process, uh, in that we this is the place where we got uh, the, the six thousand six hundred year old date for for the uh, for the system, and so that shaped our thinking and our uh, our uh, World Heritage nomination. Uh, because of what we found here, or what the archaeologists had found here. Did the fire come through this area? It looks like it did. 
It certainly did. Uh, again, it, it, it burnt through uh, some of the trees behind me, uh, have, have some fairly serious uh, fire damage to them. Uh, some have only been burnt uh, at, at the base um, and uh, uh, quite a few of them are untouched or, or very, very, very little damage by fire. Um, so yeah, this, again we're in the northern boundary of, 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 of the Muldoons fire. I think they called it the Lake Conda fire actually. There was the official title um, and uh, so we were at the northern edge of it and this is where it trickled through. It didn't come roaring through. Did this fire burn itself out naturally or was it extinguished? By the firefighting crews? Oh, the firefighting crews spent uh, I, th I think around about 10 days here. Um, there was no follow-up rains or anything so uh, it it uh, it was really I think after uh, Monday the 30th of, uh, of December uh, once the once the fire, the, the fire was under control essentially and uh, it was more about uh, keeping an eye on things after that rather than uh, uh, actively uh, fighting the fire. In fighting the fire, what sort of equipment was used? Was there any aerial fire fighting? Certainly was. There was quite a lot of, uh, uh, I don't really know the technical terms, but uh, certainly there was quite a few uh, fixed wing uh, smaller planes that were uh, bom bombing the fire. Um, but they also uh, got the, uh, the Boeing 737 in. It uh, dropped uh, retardant on the on the eastern edge on the eastern line um, we aren't we we don't want and we don't encourage uh, heavy earth moving machinery in on the lava flow we wouldn't want a, a bulldozer to uh, accidentally knock over a 6,600 year old uh, fish trap <coughs> so uh, we the uh, DELP and, and the CFA and they should be congratulated uh, come up with a, an alternative method that uh, actually demonstrated that you can uh, use other techniques for fire suppression other than a than a D8 or, or something like that uh, the fire retardant the retardant line held we also had uh, hose lines hose lays that ran for about two kilometers down the line as well there's quite a few uh, DELP and CFA crew and our rangers that were on the on the hoses along that 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 uh, hose line, um, and on Monday the 30th, the 41 degree day, uh, se up to 70 kilometer an hour winds, no mineral earth line. This this fire retardant and hose lines, it actually held, um, and uh, so that was a it was a win all around. I, I reckon it was it was a really good news story uh, that we. Uh, as I said, uh, the, the agencies should be congratulated for, for holding their nerve. I know that they are under pressure, um, you know, but there were fires across the state and interstate, um, probably more, certainly more severe than here, but nevertheless, uh, the, the, the local agencies were under a bit of pressure trying this new technique and, and thank goodness it worked. Was there an incident control room managing all of the response to the fire? Yeah, there certainly was. I was called in as a sort of a cultural heritage advisor. I was called in, I'm pretty sure it was Sunday the, the 22nd. Uh, the fire, uh, this, this fire uh, behind me, really only, it, it was a lightning strike on Friday evening, the, the, the 20th, but uh, it really got going the, the next day. Um, so I was in at the Incident Control Centre as a cultural heritage advisor uh, pretty much every day for about uh, uh, 10 or 12 days. I also uh, I was extremely impressed by what seemed to be, from, a, from an outsider's point of view, a, a well-coordinated, well-planned. People knew their roles and uh, they just got on with their job um, and uh, I think that uh, again they, they, they do a, a wonderful job uh, in, in, in coordinating these responses. Um, the other role I had was to attend community meetings. We had four community meetings. Uh, this is the broader community uh, throughout, the, throughout the region um, and on that Sunday, Sunday the uh, the 19th, which was which was the day before the danger day, we were at the uh, the Bessie Bell um, the, the Bessie Bell Community Hall, and and, and uh, 
probably expecting a, a bit of a bit of uh, a bit of a grilling about uh, uh, you know what 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 uh, what we're putting into place for for fire suppression. Um, that's when we talked about the the fire line and. Uh, um, we again got a got a good response, I reckon. I think the community, the broader community, understood what we're trying to do out here. I think the other point uh, is that, um, from what we can see, that to, to put a bulldozer in uh, within the lava flow is is not a very efficient way of fighting a fire either. Um, you know, one of the local bulldozer operators reckon the hardest work that he and his machine have ever done was on parts of the lava flow uh, you know uh, 10 or 12 years ago and that was work that wasn't just you know clearing clearing uh, uh, rock that day it was on an existing track they were just widening it up so it's hard work uh, it's well and truly after the event so these other techniques are not only are they culturally important but they uh, also uh, seem to be uh, a much more efficient way of doing it on the on lava flow country. Does it appear to you that the lower vegetation is growing back okay? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. We've uh, just uh, they're, they're not here now. They've just left. But our Budgebeam Rangers have been out here um, <clears throat> doing some work. We uh, because this is a place that we take a, a lot of visitors. Uh, we do uh, do tours out here. Um, now that we've got the vegetation down, we really want to to keep it down. So they've been out doing some work on on bracken and and some other uh, other plants out here to uh, to keep the uh, these aquaculture systems more visible. I un understand that an unexpected outcome of the fire was that the fire uncovered some new stone arrangements. Is that correct? It certainly is correct. Uh, where I'm standing, uh, this is the path that we walk into the Muldoon system. Uh, we walk into the left here. Behind me, uh, about 20 to 22 metres behind me, was a was a system. Now we've been out here for, for, for quite a few years. We've had this property since the uh, 1980s. It's been researched prior to that and, and subsequent to, to that, that time. Um, there was a, a, a fish trap that was recorded, but it was about 140 metres from where it is. The fire actually uncovered that. We hadn't, uh, as I said, we've been out here many a time working, taking tours, um, and the fire actually uncovered a system that we didn't realise was there. Yeah. And it was part of the, this, this broader, larger scale aquaculture system. Dennis, do you feel that there are some lessons that one has learnt from the most recent fires about looking after the land? Yeah, certainly. I think I think uh, the number one the number one lesson has been the great relationships we have as traditional owners. Uh, we have, and we've worked on these for a long time. It's not something that occurred just prior to the fires. It's you know we work with the uh, with the catchment management authority, with the CFA, with parks for you know since 2002 onwards. So we have these robust partnerships, um, and uh, we have uh, a lot of trust and, and confidence in, in each other that we can we can uh, you know sometimes make the hard decisions as I said the, uh, the, the the fire controllers they had to make a hard decision about what uh, fire suppression method they they, they could use uh, they did listen to our uh, our concerns and our uh, advice um, and, and it worked um, you know so look we have we have really good partnerships we we uh, train together, we work together, we, we uh, fight fires together um, and uh, we'll, we also, uh, the, the, this latest uh, virus thing has slowed us down a bit but we we're going to have a, a celebration, a thank you to all the firefighters out on country, uh, probably in March we'd planned to do that but uh, obviously it couldn't go ahead, we'll, we'll do it at some later stage. You mentioned earlier that it used to be called the Mount Eccles National Park, is that correct? That's correct, yes. As part of our uh, native title determination, we also decided to uh, restore uh, the traditional name, Budgebim. Um, and uh, we, as part of that native title determination, we, uh, as Gundich Mara, have a, uh, a, a co-management agreement with the state government to manage the park. We have a, a board of management that consists of a, a Gundich Mara majority, um, and uh, uh, we've, that's 
been uh, in place since 2007. What does Bujbim mean? What's the translation of Bujbim? Yeah, Bajbim uh, is, a, um, is where the vol is the volcano that erupted around about 37,000 years ago. And uh, Bajbim means big head. And if you're out on some of the flat country uh, around around the park and you look across it, it just looks like a, a large head uh, sticking up out of the landscape. Yeah, it's a relatively flat landscape, uh, pretty much right around it, but uh, Bajbim certainly stands out. I understand that not only did the fire uncover some of the stone arrangements that were not previously uncovered and now discovered, so to speak, but it has also given you or the corporation an opportunity to do some further work in relation to the fish trap stone arrangements. Yes, that's correct. We, uh, we've been working with uh, the spatial mapping uh, section of DELP, uh, based in Melbourne. Uh, prior to the fires, we were, they, they'd uh, received some funding to, uh, to do a project, to do a LIDAR uh, survey of, of the area. Essentially, LIDAR is about measuring uh, and identifying where the ground surface is. Um, and, uh, and it has the ability of the capacity to strip away uh, t uh, with the software to strip away uh, uh, the vegetation and uh, just leave images of, of the ground, so 3D, uh, 2D um, areas. So we we uh, are looking forward to, uh, to to using this 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 system. Uh, they did their aerial photography after the fires. Uh, again. Um, the fires uh, cleared a, a lot of the vegetation um, so we think we'll have some comparisons about burnt country and unburnt country we believe we'll be able to either identify uh, 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 undiscovered sites or at least have a predictive model about where uh, sites might be such as the fish traps um, and also other agencies will be able to use the technology as well the imagery um, you know, for firefighting purposes or fire planning purposes for water purposes where's the water running uh, biodiversity purposes so it's it's not just uh, about uh, cultural heritage but uh, certainly that was the uh, the focus of it. So we're looking forward to uh, using this technology. We've seen snippets of it. It certainly does work um, and uh, we, we hope to utilise that in a wide range of management practices and planning over, over the next few years. Am I right in thinking that some of the fires commenced in or burnt in the National Park? Yeah, the second fire uh, on, on that, that uh, was caused by lightning strikes on uh, on Monday the 30th in the, in the late evening. It was in right in the middle of the National Park pretty much um, and uh, it burnt it burnt uh, around not quite 5,000 hectares, about 4,600 hectares of National Park um, and we we uh, we we lost about 1,600 hectares of uh, well we had 1600 hectares, 1400 hectares, sorry, that was impacted by fire. We didn't lose any uh, or very little assets, um, a bit of fencing, uh, an old storage shed that was an old wool shed that burnt down. Um, but uh, yeah, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of assets that were lost uh, either on the park or uh, our properties nor other private property. I take it you could see the smoke from where you were? Yeah, certainly could. Um, it was, it was uh, fairly thick at times and I think the other thing I noticed that as I come out, particularly out here, uh, out to uh, Muldoon's and, and, and Tayrak or Lake Conda, um, that you could see, uh, you know, where trees were smouldering. So, you know, the, over the back behind me, about two kilometres, about a kilometre and a half, was a, was what we call Murphy's Hut, and there's quite a few old elm trees and pine trees there. And, uh, you know, I remember coming out pretty much after the fire was under control um, and, and seeing the, uh, you know, a fair bit of smoke coming up from the pines that were burning there, for example. Is there anything else you would like to mention? No, I, I just like, again, I just like to reiterate that I think that this was, this was really a, you know, a partnership arrangement.
Um, as I said, we work closely with these agencies prior to this. Um, I think it's reinforced that we all have a valuable role to play in looking after country and improving country. Um, and uh, we look forward to uh, even better uh, cooperation and, and consideration in, into the future with but I think the the agencies uh, the, the staff on the ground the staff the incident control centre uh, must be congratulated uh, because they they held out in a, in a pretty tough call really. I understand that behind you is one of the fish traps Yes, that's correct, Andrew. Right behind me, uh, you can see uh, the, op the opening of the, of the channel. Um, there's a, a V-shape here that uh, directs the water in, uh, and it runs in the, in the channel uh, beyond, beyond there. Uh, it, it then curves, uh, there's another channel over around about 20 metres across this way. Uh, if they connect up, they go uh, back and around and they back through uh, over the back even further is a is a, a sort of a, a pond uh, that, that was used to to store the fish in eels in particular so this system actually goes for about 300 meters it's a very extensive system um, and right behind me is the what we call the Muldoon's fish trap uh, and that nice little green patch in the middle of it is where they did the excavation uh, that came up with the, the date of first construction of 6,600 years ago. Do the engineering works tell us something about the lifestyle of the people back then? Yeah, most, most certainly. The, uh, there are quite a number of lava flows in Western Victoria, but this is the only one that has uh, the, 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 the scale of, of, of fish traps of stone house sites. Uh, one of our properties, uh, the Alambi property, uh, has 146 recorded uh, stone house sites. So we're talking about a, a small village uh, out there on the, on the edge of the wetland. Um, and uh, we, we have a uh, quite a, a you know a, a really great water supply that's why Gundish Mara people were able to invest time effort and resources into these more permanent structures it was because there was a, a, a never reliable uh, water supply in fact the, the creek which is just behind me and, and to my left uh, its uh, European name is Dalits Creek its traditional name is Kalara and Kalara means always there and it's very appropriately named creek uh, that this uh, creek never runs dry it does get a little bit sluggish uh, but it has such, such a large catchment area uh, that uh, Gundishmara people as I said were able to invest time effort and resource into these permanent structures uh, over to my left here uh, there's about six stone house sites on the ridge beside me uh, um, and uh, uh, other, other parts around here as well. So people lived uh, a sedentary lifestyle, uh, a, 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 a very permanent lifestyle, uh, had a, a access to uh, a very good food resource, not just the fish, but certainly the animals and uh, you know, ducks and swans and um, eggs and all sorts of things, uh, lot, lots of, lots of uh, fruit and vegetables that, that, uh, in, in the bush tucker out here. So uh, a very well-balanced lifestyle and they're able to devote more time to the other uh, practices such as uh, you know, their spiritual side of life, children, education uh, and social life. So uh, it was very good. It's a very important part of our heritage. Yeah, it certainly is, and I think that you know we want to we want to share it with with uh, the, the broader Australian uh, public and community, and and internationally as well. Uh, we do run tours here. We have, have budge bim tours, um, and uh, we we're always proud to show what we have out here on country. It uh, it is a, a robust uh, bit of country. It's a lot lot of stone, so uh, um, you know it can stand the impact of of tourism. Uh, but uh, you know we we certainly want to want to educate people it's not so much a bit there's certainly a commercial aspect to it but it's also about letting people know that not every aboriginal community in in the country was was nomadic and uh, and that and i think here and other places uh, certainly shows that uh, people uh, where they had the good resource uh, they had the ingenuity to uh, uh, to uh, 
to manipulate a, a natural system, but not to the point that it's, it was uh, not reversible, the damage. And thankfully fire resilient as well. And, and very much fire resilient as well, yes, certainly in parts. Thank you very much, Dennis. I think we can finish on that note. Yep. The Royal Commission has adjourned and will resume at 10am on Friday.